All right, folks, it's uh, 8.01, so if we'll find our seats, we'll get started. We have a full day of ground fish ahead of us. And uh, before we get started, I'll turn to Executive Director uh, Merrick Burden to see if there are any announcements. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman and Council Members. Um, just to keep you all uh, up to speed on COVID, I think that's just a question on uh, everyone's minds. And just to let you know, we have not heard of any new cases as of this morning. Um, so that is some good news. Um, other than that, we do have a um, couple of agenda items today that should take quite a bit of time. And um, um, that's the end of my announcements. Happy to take questions though. Any questions of Merrick? All right, we'll get started. Um, we're gonna get started with Sablefish gear switching this morning, agenda item F5. And we actually have two staff officers working on this agenda item, uh, Jim and Jesse. So uh, I will let them uh, take it from here with an overview. And I know there's a staff presentation. So please get started. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and council members. My first time with our new technology here. And we'll get the presentation up. There it is for you. So this is the uh, staff agenda item uh, F5 overview and presentation. Um, under this agenda item, the council is considering a limitation on gear switching in response to the concern that Sablefish quota pound used in gear switching is either limiting trawl allocation attainment or might limit it in the future. And there we go. Sorry. So I'll be providing a agenda item overview. Uh, and then after the agenda item overview, I will give a over a uh, overview of the alternatives and then an analysis outline. Uh, and then we'll um, go through the 15 questions on which we're uh, looking for some guidance uh, with respect to the these alternatives. First, a quick orientation on where we are in the process. During the first trawl catch share program review, uh, as the importance of this issue became apparent, the council adopted a control date. Then in the spring of 2018, the council formed the Sablefish Management and Trawl Allocation Attainment Committee which began development of the alternatives. They worked with over 23 different alternatives that were proposed by SAMTAC members and members of the public and narrowed them down to three in their final report that was provided to you in June of 2020. At a September 2020 meeting, the council committed to following the process through to a final decision, whether that be no action or one of the action alternatives and adopted a purpose and need statement. In April 2021, the council decided that we would develop draft alternatives with the intent that the alternatives would not allow more than 29% gear switching. At a September 2021 meeting, working from the SAMTAC alternatives but making substantial modifications, the council adopted a range of alternatives for analysis. Because of the substantial changes, a check-in was scheduled to give staff time to review the motions and identify any issues that needed resolution prior, prior to moving forward uh, with the analysis. So the council action for this meeting is to receive an update on the alternatives and address issues needed to allow completion of the analysis. And this also provides you an opportunity to review and provide guidance on plans for the analysis. Then at present, selection of preliminary preferred alternative is scheduled for November 2022. And at that time, the council will also have an opportunity to review the preliminary analysis and provide further guidance on information it would like to see when it selects a final preferred alternative in April 2023. At this point, I want to emphasize that in order to meet this schedule, we need firm answers to the questions we have po we posed uh, with one exception that I'll identify as we go through. Additionally, meaning the schedule is based on the current suite of alternatives. If this suite changes, we'll need to make an assessment of what's required to complete the analysis. 
The main challenges we're looking at is completing the bulk of this project before we get into heavy workload, the heavy workload part of the next trawl cat share review, which will be coming up soon. So uh, your briefing items for this, uh, for this agenda item include a schematic of the alternatives in attachment one. Attachment two has the range of gear switching alternatives, including discussion of the issues that need to be addressed before moving forward. This is the document that we posted in February uh, and in it you'll find, also find the September 2021 motions. Then um, you have a summary of the issue on, on which issues on which guidance is needed is in attachment three and our plans for analysis in the form of an annotated outline in attachment four. You'll be receiving agency and advisory body reports uh, supplementally from WDFW, SSC, GMT, GAP, and you have some public comments. Council actions refine the alternatives adopted for analysis at the September 2021 meeting and provide guidance on analysis both as needed. Let me step into a, uh, maybe I'll stop there and see if there's any questions on process before going to the next part here. Any questions? All right, please proceed. Thank you. Next, we have a high le higher level overview of the alternatives. As always, we have the no action alternative under which gear switching would continue, unlimited in regulation, but limited by markets and so forth. Then there are two action alternatives, each of which is intended in one way or another to restrict northern sablefish gear switching to no more than 29%. I want to note that both of the action alternatives at their core are, are pretty straightforward. Um, the complicated parts and the parts but which will have the most questions today relate to initial allocations that would be relevant only uh, in the first implementation step. In relation to the no action alternatives, I want to take a moment to review the key provisions of the catch share program that relate to gear switching, the gear switching issue and design of the action alternatives. The opportunity to gear switch is created by the fact that a trawl permit is required to participate in the IFQ fishery, but vessels with trawl permits can use any gear to fish against the trawl quota. Then any person, including non-fishermen, can open a quota share account and acquire a quota share. But a quota share account itself is not transferable, just the quota share within it. Each year, the annually issued quota pounds are deposited to quota share accounts, and they must be transferred to a vessel account in order to be used. And finally, for the Northern State Fugable Fish, there is a vessel quota pound use limit of 4.5% and a quota share control limit of 3%. The first action alternative is gear specific quota shares. Under this alternative, all the Northern Sablefish quota share would be redesignated as trawl only in any gear, the any gear being like status quo in most respects. Then each year, the trawl only in any gear quota pounds would be issued to the holders of the respective quota shares. The second alternative is gear switching endorsements. Under this alternative, gear switching endorsed trawl limited entry permits would have individualized permit specific annual gear switching limits that would be generally larger than those for vessels fishing under non-endorsed permits. Vessels fishing with non-endorsed permits would all have standardized relatively small gear switching limits. As I mentioned, the alternatives the council selected for analysis were patterned after, but not the same as the SAMTAC alternatives. There's been some confusion about the connections and differences between what the council adopted and what the SAMTAC had recommended. So in this slide, I wanna go over that relationship. On top, we'll have the council range of alternatives and on the bottom, the SAMTAC alternatives. First, the council adopted gear, a gear specific quota share alternative. 
Council Alternative 1 was a change from SAMTAC Alternative 1, which would have been based on gear-specific quota pounds rather than quota shares. SAMTAC 1 did not redesignate the quota shares. Second, the Council adopted Alternative 2, gear switching endorsements, qualifications for which required, at a minimum, the ownership of a qualifying permit or vessel at the time of implementation. Quota share limits for the permits would be based on permit or vessel history and or quota share ownership as of the control date. Alternative two brought together into a single alternative elements of SAMTAC two and three. SAMTAC two would have issued endorsements to owners of qualifying permits and established limits based on permit history. SAMTAC three would have prioritized gear switching for active trawlers and provided some transition opportunity for current owners of qualifying vessels and gear switching limits based on quota share ownership. As you can see from the underlying text, many of the elements of SAMTAC alternatives two and three were incorporated in alternative two in the, of the council's range. We'll now go through the uh, plans for the analysis. For each SAMTAC meeting and council agenda item up to now, we've been bringing forward the analysis relevant to the question before you at the time. So now is the time when we start to bring all of that previously produced material together into a single place and then develop additional materials relevant to contrasting and comparison of the performance of what was selected for your range of alternatives. As a first step in doing that, we developed an annotated outline provided in attachment four. That attachment includes a draft document structure, links to related analyses that have been conducted in the past, and a few comments on some of the analyses that we have planned. The comments there aren't a complete list of what we're likely to develop, just a few ideas that we've, we've uh, identified so far. A few caveats in reviewing the outline. A determination has not yet been made on the type of NEPA document that will need to be produced. Elements may be added to cover specific analytical requirements or will be added to cover specific analytical requirements specified in legislation, executive orders, your standard things you see, Regulatory Flexibility Act, you know, taking into account marine mammals or whatever, whatever that might be, turn out to be. And uh, we do, we may do some reorganization of the outline as needed for effective communication, but the outline illustrates the, el the elements that we plan to include in the analysis. Now we have the outline. The introduction will include uh, the purpose and need, public process, and many of the, other, of the other elements you would usually see in introductory materials. Then we have the section on the alternatives, including alternatives considered but rejected early on. Next is a section that we don't usually include, analysis of the problem. This is often part of, we don't include it as a separate section. This is often part of the introduction, uh, but because it will be more extensive than is typical, we wanted to break it out into its own section. It'll include evaluation of causes of trawl entertainment and factors influencing, likely to influence future gear switching. Then we have description of the affected gr groups. This material may eventually get rolled into the description of the impacts of the alternatives, which is the next section. Oops. So we'll look at impacts to affected resources, sectors, and communities. And I want to know that sectors include consideration of impact to quota share owners and their related revenues. And we'll look at some breakouts of those groups in relation to comparing quota share owners that are vessel owners and possibly different categories of vessel owners. Additionally, fishery management bodies are included among the impact group, impacted groups, in particular in relation to costs and regulatory complexity. Then we have cumulative effects, which would, is required if this is a uh, one of the more formal NEPA documents, or you know, one of the, uh, the yeah, 
but we might also include other analyses in these sections as needed, or we would include other analyses as needed to respond to re other regulatory requirements. And then finally, we have an appendix in which we'll discuss overarching design issues, such as the control date, the 29% decision, and then get into more detailed analysis of individual elements of each of the alternatives. For example, explaining the process and rationale uh, by which we got to the specific gear switching qualification levels uh, for each alternatives that were developed. Next, there are some challenges identified in attachment four, uh, the attachment four annotated outline, and I'm only gonna go over two of those. A key part of the analysis is characterizing no action and that usually starts with specifying some baseline years, um, often the most recent years, uh, but in our current circumstances, that might not be best. Uh, 2016 to 2019 was a period of relative stability with respect to the uh, gear switching vessel activity. But then, as we know, 21, or 20 and 21 were impacted by COVID, and then 21 was also impacted by increasing ACLs. Um, so we're, we were looking at, you know, how do we how do we handle this situation? Uh, and we asked the SSC for some comments on that. And you'll be getting an SSC report on their suggestion, and uh, GMT will be commenting on that as well. Um, as we consider what years to use as a baseline, <clears throat> one thing to keep in mind is, is that this is a long-term policy that may be in place over decades with variable conditions. It might render to overfishing of sable fish or non stable fish species or changing market conditions and ocean conditions could result in a range from situations where you have a surplus of quota pounds available to those where the uh, stable fish quota pounds are in short supply. So whatever baseline we select, there may be substantial variations from it in the future. And on that basis, our current plan that we came to the meeting with, and as I said, you'll be receiving some other reports, was to use 2016 to 19 as the baseline but then we're most appropriate and provide guidance as a qualitative discussion as to how results might vary with uh, changes in some of these other conditions that I just mentioned. That's the current approach there. Relatedly, another challenge we have to deal with is uncertainty about the current fishery market constraints and investment dynamics. Questions such as, is gear switching constraining catch by trawl vessels in the short term by making quota pounds difficult to acquire? Is gear switching constraining in the long term with uncertainty about the possibility that gear switching might expand in the future, inhibiting investment in processing and marketing? We'll not be able to answer these questions with certainty, but we will emphasize data and analysis expected to help you evaluate and articulate a rationale on the degree of need and for your final action. Additionally, we'll use scenarios to include possible outcomes, like in a sort of an alternative states of nature approach in which we assess outcomes using the scenarios in which gear switching is current straining and those in which it is not. Mr. Chairman, that, cut, that goes through the um, broad level overview of the issues. I now have slides that go through each of the 15 questions uh, that we've asked, we're going to be asking the council to provide us guidance on, but I think this might be a good place to, uh, to stop for just a minute to see if there are any questions on what I've covered so far. Uh, after we do that, then I will go start, we'll start going through those 15 questions individually. All right, fair enough. Corey Niles. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jimmy. Yeah, thanks for the, the clarity of the presentation so far. And this is maybe just a, um, this could be a question for later, but, uh, uh, you know, see, uh, reading the GMT and SSC statements and on your, your statements about, ch about challenges here where you're trying to find a, um, a time period that may be reflective of what happens in the future. I just, I guess my only, in this, I could hold off on this, but I'm assuming that that would just be your, whatever you pick here would be your starting point, And then you could qualitatively talk about scenarios in the future as well. This, this isn't what you, you wouldn't only look at these one sets of the years, you would use those at a starting point to then discuss what might happen if no action were to continue in the future. 
that might be as clear as I can articulate it right now, and we, and we can take it up later. Just trying to understand what you're what you're thinking there in terms of um, what you need to hear back from yeah. us at this point. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Niles. Uh, yes, you know we we wanted to come to this meeting with a an approach for people to respond to, uh, and uh, then so we you know kind of put out this 2016 to 2016 to 19 and discuss uh, variations qualitatively. Um, I think the SSC and GMT have some excellent ideas on a different approach using a different uh, kind of a range of years that you'll be hearing about that. Um, and, you know, regardless of what, what we do, we will, um, whatever specific year, we will have discussions, qualitative discussions about how things might vary if it's not quite like that. All right. Anything further? Uh, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Good morning, Jim. I appreciate the update so far. Um, I think it's slide nine action alternative overview. Uh, alternative one, gear specific quota sharing. You, when you spoke, it didn't, it, it was not the same as what is represented here. You, you'd said that the existing northern sablefish quota share would be converted to trawl only quota pounds oh. and any gear quota pounds. And it's, it indicates quota share here. So I was curious which one is true. Quota share is correct, and I misspoke. Thank you. Any further questions at this stage? All right, Jim, uh, please proceed. Okay, so now we'll get down to the provisions needing clarification. Just want to make a few notes as we move into this section. Um, in identifying these, the, these issues that need to be addressed and, and how the list was developed. So in places where the language of the motions from last September were open uh, to interpretation, but we could make an interpretation that was within the language of the motion and the rationale that was provided, we did so. And these, these interpretations where we did this are documented in attachment two for your review. Where we had uncertainty, we erred on the side of identifying, uh, uncertainty about a provision, we erred on the side of identifying it as one needing clarification. I do wanna note that as we continue to work with some of the provisions about which we had questions initially and developed a better understanding of sort of how all the pieces of the alternatives fit together, there are some provisions on the clarification list, which in retrospect, we probably could have given a correct interpretation to. And when I hit those provisions, you'll notice me saying something like, we think this is probably how you want to do it. Finally, I just also want to note that the, the kind of cleanup we're returning today to today uh, is uh, typical for these kinds of actions. As has generally occurred with past limited entry actions, allocations options are often more complicated because of larger number of factors you're trying to bring into balance, including equity issues. The details of the allocation options though, they need to be well specified in order to complete the analysis and for members of our fishing communities to understand how they will be impacted and be able to provide meaningful comment to the council. Usually in your limited entry actions of the past, you've considered one qualifier a permit or a vessel. So I want to talk now about why the alternatives seem more complex. So usually in the past, you've seen, um, you've, you've, had, you've considered one qualifier, usually a permit or a vessel, and who owns the permit or vessel at the time of implementation. Here, we're considering multiple qualifying elements, which creates a need to determine the commonality of ownership between these different elements. And we're considering them at, sorry, a little bit behind there. And we're considering them at different points in time, including a future time for some options, the future time at which for some options, we cannot be sure of the ownership structure that will be in place. Often the kinds of details we're asking you to look at get worked through in committee before making it to the council floor. I think you'll see in the gap report that they've made, they may have served you well in that regard. We hope to provide a path forward that will allow you to work through the issues 
And once these questions are answered, we're confident that the analysis can continue and the alternatives themselves will become easier to understand. So that said, as we move into the questions related to each of the alternatives, I'm going to go into enough more detail about the provisions to provide the context that's needed uh, to understand the questions. Most of our questions focus on details of implementations and more specifically allocation. So let's look at that for alternative one. We start with this one-time conversion process in which all the existing northern quota uh, northern staple fish quota share would be designated as either any gear or trawl only quota share with respect to with uh, um, with any gear quota share being pretty much like status quo then each year the annually issued northern staple fish quota pounds would be issued as trawl only and any gear quota pounds and given to the corresponding quota share owners. The entire implementation process is spelled out in the presentation we posted on the website, but the first step and the step central to allocation is to classify the participants, the, uh, those who classify the quota share owners as into different participant classes. The classification steps would be to first identify those entities that, as of the control date, own quota share, and prior to the control date, owned a vessel and used it to gear switch. So those would be our gear switching participants. Any quota share owner that is not classified as a gear switching participant would be evaluated to determine if they are an IFQ participant. Now, that name IFQ participant can be a little bit confusing uh, because the gear switching participants are also IFQ participants. So please kind of look past the name a bit and think of these just as quota share owners of quota share accounts associated with trawl vessels or not associated with any vessels, uh, but those that are not classified. In other words, those are not that are not classified as gear switching participants. So there are two options for IFQ participation status to get IFQ participation status. Under the first option, it's simply anyone that's not a gear switching participant. The second option, it would additionally require ownership of a vessel while it made a bottom trawl landing of sable fish. And the qualifying landing would have to occur in the two years prior to the time of implementation. So this would be a landing that would have to occur at some point in the future. If the second option is selected, then anyone that did not qualify as a gear switching or IFQ participant would be classified as an other participant. Once the particip participants, once the quota share owners are all classified for gear switching participants, up to the amount of quota share they held on the control date would all be converted to any gear quota share. For IFQ participants, up to the amount of the quota share they held on the control date would all be converted mostly to trawl only, but some to any gear quota share. For other participants, all of their quota share would be converted to trawl only. Now let's take a look at the amount that look now let's now let's look at what would determine the amount of trawl only in any gear quota share received by IFQ participants. If we assume the target is to have 29% of the quota share as any gear quota share and 71% as trawl only, as shown here on the right, then to get there. We start with the quota share owned by the three different classes of participants. As I said, all of the quota share owned by gear switching participants will be converted to any gear quota share in amounts up to what was held on the control date. Then that goes towards the any gear pool. 
and all of the quota share held by those classified as other participants and the amounts held by anyone in excess of what they owned on the control date will be converted to trawl only and go to the trawl only pool. After those amounts are determined, then we can determine the ratios of any gear to trawl only quota share that will be issued to achieve the desired outcome. So I'm going through this slide now and, you'll, and we'll be popping the slide up again in, in just a little bit and relate it back to the first question. So this slide here as a brief version of the six main questions related to alternative one that are found in attachment three. And I'm going to go through these in, in groups. The first three questions have to do with classification of quota share owners as gear switching participants. The first issue highlighted in green is framed in terms of a question about degree of linkage in order to qualify as a gear switching participant, what degree of linkage or ownership overlap is required between the quota share account owning group and a vessel ownership group that gear switched a vessel prior to the control date? Where such overlap, and then where such overlap is partial, it also asks whether all or only part of the quota share would be converted on the basis of that partial linkage. This probably comes down to a choice between an individual approach or a collective approach, and we'll look at what that means on the next slide. So this slide will have a timeline on it. It starts at the top here with January 2011, the start of our program. Then this bar represents the control date and the bar at the bottom, the implementation date. For the period between 2011 and the control date, we're interested in who owned vessels while they met the gear switching requirements. For the control date, we're interested in the quota share ownership groups and the amounts of quota share they owned. And for the implementation dates, we're interested in quota share ownership groups, the amount of quota share owned, and their relationships to earlier groups, the, the ownerships of earlier groups and the degrees of overlap. Let's start with a scenario where we have individual A represented by the circle at the top here. And that person owns a vessel that they use to gear switch. And so we've got this green GS uh, by the, uh, on that individual there. Then on the control date, we find that person is in a quota share owning partnership with two other individuals. And they continue to be in that partnership at the time of implementation. To look at an individual approach, we'll look at a diagram with the exact same ownership structures, but break out the individuals with circles representing the individuals and boxes around them to indicate their connection and partnerships. Under the individual approach, only individual A has the history of owning a vessel while it gear switched. So only it is considered a gear switching entity. And only the, oops, excuse me. And only the quota share attributed to its ownership here 0.25% would be converted based on its gear switching uh, status. Essentially, all of the 0.25% would be converted to any gear. Next, looking at a collective approach, we have the exact same diagram as on the far left. Under this approach, because individual A would qualify, the ownership group that includes A the partnership as a whole would qualify as a gear switching participant and all the quota share owned by the group would be converted on that basis. Because of this, the implication is that with the collective approach overall, more quota share would be covered by owners that received the gear switching status 
and so under that approach, more quota share would be converted to any gear quota share, but not in excess of the 29%. So while choice between the individual and collective approach will have implications for individual situations, it also has implications for the groups as a whole, the different participant classifications as a whole, which we'll look at on the next slide. So this is the di diagram I mentioned I was gonna be bringing back. Uh, and when this, earlier we noted that percentages uh, converted for gear switchers and other participants will determine the ratios of any gear and trawl only quota share that IFQ participants receive. You resolve those question marks that are in the arrows in the center. The means, this means that relative to the individual approach, the collective approach, which results in more quota share held by, by entities being, more quota share held by entities classified as gear switchers will be converted to the any gear quota share, sort of filling up the 29% bucket more than the individual approach would. And that then would reduce the amount of any gear quota share that would be going to IFQ participants. So again, for alternative one, we think this choice comes down to, uh, res responding to this question comes down to this choice between the individual approach and the collective approach. And I wanted to note that this is a, a significant choice uh, in particular, because if you choose the individual approach, that probably resolves the next five questions because they are primarily questions in the context of the collective approach. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to stop there and see if there are any questions about what I've just covered. All right, let's see if there are any questions. I don't see any hands. Oh, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, thanks, Jim. Um, so the, in, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't keep track of the numbers of the slide, but the one that is just prior to this one um, one more back, please. Uh, let's see what we're here. Or if that's just the one. It was the one that had the the bubbles with the different percentages. Well, there you go. Okay. So um, on the individual approach. Um, the if that were let's say that were a corporation um, um, if a if a corporation owns a quota share account uh, is that considered an individual approach or conversely uh, does this suggest that we would break down the different components of a corporation, move it over to the collective approach, or either either break it down and and determine what who brought quota share into the corporation um, that ultimately owns the quota share account? Uh, or w would we just consider that an individual entity? And I know there's some legal definitions here that come into play about individual versus persons. Um, and I'm trying to ask the question in a way that's notwithstanding um, the legal definition of an individual if that's possible. But I think part of what's confusing me is, or that in the, in the, in this approach in these two different uh, ways to approach this individual versus collective is that it is suggesting that if there is a single entity that owns the quota share account, that we're going to dive into 
the what what makes that corporation up and who brought what into it. Um, and I think, or at least I, it was um, conveyed to me that there was a discussion around this topic at, in the gap as well, trying to gain clarity on the differences between the individual and the collective approach. So I don't know if that okay. question is clear or not. But. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> Mr. Anderson. Yes, uh, so the individual approach, uh, we're looking at, uh, when we say individual, we're, we're thinking of individual human beings uh, and not the corporations. Um, and National Fisheries Service does have uh, the ownership interest forms uh, that are required by the holders of quota share accounts, as well as uh, vessel accounts and so forth, uh, that pr do provide us the information on who all of the individual owners are and their shares of corporations and so forth. Uh, so in this example here, where I have partnership, you could replace that by the word uh, corporation, and we would be looking at, okay, who are the owners of the corporation? And this individual A was a member of the corporation, and so only it only if the individual A owned 20, 25%, uh, then only it's only that portion of the quota share held by the corporation would be uh, converted to gear switching quota share. Now, one of the things that came up in the gap and one of the concerns was you know, kind of sometimes the way this is phrased, it sounds like individual A has its own quota share that NIMS would then give and convert. What, it, what the idea is that the corporation has the quota share. In this case, the you know one quarter of the quarter the, the quota share of the corporation would be converted based on individual A's status, but it would still be the corporation's quota share and the whatever the rules are of the corporation for how it distributes the quota share among its members or handles the quota share, that's all within the corporate structures and rules. We don't get into that. So that was one of the points of uh, discussion in the gap, which after we clarified that, that seemed to help progress the discussion there. So I'm not sure if that's maybe is getting to what you're asking. Yeah, that, that helps, Jim. I may have some other questions later about all that, but that helps, thanks. Any other questions? Am I missing a hand in somewhere? All right, you want to continue, Jim? Okay. So, as I mentioned, the next questions relate to if you've decided to go down the route of using the collective approach. Question two, now highlighted in green, is the date on which we would evaluate the commonality or these linkages between the quota share ownership groups and the owners that are classified as gear switching participants based on their, their ownership of a vessel. Here we think you're going to want to use the control date and the next, let's see, do I, yeah, the control date as the date on which you establish that linkage and the next slide explains why. Here's our timeline again, keeping in mind that under the collective approach, to qualify as a gear switching participant, only one member of a quota share owning group has to have had gear switch history of being an owner of a vessel used to gear switch prior to the control date. So it has to have that gear, gear switching vessel history. If this person joins other groups any time prior to implementation, then under the basic rule, it could qualify each of those other groups it joins as a gear switching participant. For that reason, you'll think you want to evaluate the groups for the gear switching status on a date prior to implementation, and the control date seems like a good candidate. I think I'm gonna stop with each of the questions as we go forward at this point and just check in to see if there's any uh, questions that we have, so. I think your presentation has been pretty excellent so far. I think you're answering a lot of questions as you go. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next, we'll talk about question three. What happens if you take the collective approach and to decide to do the participant valuation on the control date, but there is an ownership change between the control date and time of implementation? The question here might be reframed as, since the participant evaluation was based on the control date, ownership groups, what happens if there is a split? Oops. Do all members of the group retain status as gear switching entities or only those that remain in a group in which at least one member has gear switching history? So diagrammatically or schematically, it would look like this. We have a single owner qualifying as gear switching at the top. There you go. The group being classified as a gear switching group based on the control date associations and the group having split in, <clears throat> by the time of implementation. If all the group members retain the gear switching status based on the evaluation as of the control date, it would expand the amount of quota share classified as any gear and as discussed above, reduce the amount of IFQ participant quota share that could be designated as any gear. And of course, there are implications for the individual business operations. On the other hand, with the in individual approach, you could just have the individual A would retain the status would be a, the other approach. And these are, excuse me, that would be, we're under the collective approach but you would be looking at the individual uh, when there is a split, kind of reverting back to that um, lens of the individual if the, uh, the group, if there's a split in the group. And I'll just look around very quickly to see if there's any, any questions. Next, we switch from consideration of gear switching participant classification to IFQ participant classification and what the implications might be with respect to application of the individual or collective approach for IFQ participants. Recall that under one IFQ participant option, everyone that is not a gear switching participant would be an IFQ participant. But under the other option, option two, a quota share owner would have to make a bottom trawl landing in the two years prior to implementation in order to qualify as an IFQ participant. So here, with respect to implementing option two, we're looking at activity that is probably occurring at some time in the future. As with gear switching participants, the choice here seems to be between the individual and collective approaches. And to limit complexity, Whatever you decide for gear switching participants, you might also want to apply here. The next question has to do with conversion caps. And under the collective approach, what happens to those caps if groups split prior to implementation? This question applies for classification of both gear switching and IFQ participants under the collective approach evaluated on the control date. This figure was used to explain conversion caps and other materials we've provided. I'm popping up here as a memory jog. Recall that at the time of implementation, the maximum amount that can be converted based on a quota share owner's participant status is the amount that that quota share owner had as of the control date. And we're, we've been terming that the cap. Excuse, ignore those blue, blue bullets there, we'll come back to that. Here's what the question looks like schematically. Using the gear switching participant as an example, we have that individual is classified as a gear switching participant on the control date. We have the individual at the top there and then the partnership that's classified as the gear switching participant on the control date. The group owns 1% and therefore that's the most the group is able to convert based on its gear switching status. 
when the if the group then splits up the question is does the cap split among the individual members or are individual members that are continuing business on their own able to restore their quota share up to the control date levels and have it convert based on whatever their individual participant status is. We think this is not what you are going to want to do since it could potentially and substantially expand the amount of quota share that is classified as any gear in, in this example. Because essentially what you'd be doing is you have 1% partnership on the control date and you would be giving each of those individuals 1% uh, as the maximum they could convert, convert based on their uh, participant classification status. While you probably won't want to give <clears throat> all of the split groups their original caps, most simply, it could be specified that the cap be split in proportion to their ownership interest of each of the subgroups, ownership interest in the original group. But the council might want to consider providing the involved party a choice on how to split the cap if they can come to agreement among them. You stop there, just questions. Questions for Jim. Corey Niles. Thank, thanks, Mr. Chair. And I should also say, I'll probably be holding questions until maybe uh, later, and hope you'll, I'm assuming you'll be available during discussion to answer. But I guess on this one, and not to get so I don't understand why a choice would be necessary. Like in this example, if after the control date, this entity broke up and its individual started new quota share accounts, why would we need to offer them a choice if we limited it to limit the, excuse me, limit? It limited them to what they own proportionally on the control date. That's so. If we knew like there were three people that they each owned, well, thirty-three point three percent of the of the of three 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 three, but <laughs> you know, one third of the of the of the quota share on the control date. Why couldn't they just be capped at one third of the quota share they owned on the control date? I'm not, what would the choice be above and beyond that is my question. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mr. Niles, thank you. Yeah, um, certainly it's not necessary. Uh, the, the question, in terms of the, uh, the, the reason you might want to consider it um, would be that, uh, you know, maybe two of the individuals retired or one of the individuals retires and they have a good relationship and, and it was a gear switching vessel uh, operation. And uh, it's like, yeah, you, you know, convert all of yours to any gear. You know, we don't need that. You know, you need it for your vessel, so let you restore your business, get back up to your one percent that you had when we were all working together, and then you can have it all as any gear. And that said, the other approach would be if they all have that good of a relation, just keep it at the proportions that you suggested, the one third example, and then after it happens, they could all, on a friendly basis, do the exchanges necessary to get to that same endpoint. Any other questions at this stage? Please continue. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next question has to do with situations where an ownership group member owns quota share that is held outside of the ownership group and the possible application of the group status for uh, conversion of that quota share. In this diagram below, <coughs> that would be the, the quota share that's held outside the group would be that that is, is held by individual A and B on their own. And then they're in this partnership uh, that's a gear switching partnership that has the 1%. Our thought is the council does not want to, probably won't want to apply the group status for conversion held outside the quota, outside the group. But since this comes up under the collective approach, and because in the past, there has been concern about disruption of, ex, of ex, the exchanges by which gear switchers attain their quota pounds and quota pounds from a quota share partner that a quota share partner holds outside of a group may well flow to the vessel, a vessel that's owned by the partnership. We're presenting that question for, for your consideration and confirmation.
Let's see if there's any questions and we're ready. I don't see any hands, so. Okay. So here's the list of the first six questions. We worked our way through them with respect to alternative one and the initial allocations. Uh, these are the more difficult questions, but we do have three others for you to consider that we think are a little more straightforward. Uh, the first issue is whether there should be different rules for trusts, NGOs, and governments that own quota share as compared to other quota share owners. And uh, we expect that there wouldn't be any difference, but uh, we did want to check in on that. Uh, the second is how to apply the rules when shares of an ownership group don't add to 100%. So if you know, some here we've talked a few times about prorating among some different groups. Um, the easiest way to handle this is simply to, to calculate uh, based on the reported percentage of ownership. In some situations, for example, we have joint tenancy with right of survivorship and both members are in the NIMS databases having 100%. So we would just say, well, you know, 100% is half of, of the 200% that you have as a total. So we still go 50-50 on that. This is a little bit of a technical thing. and. Uh, um, I don't think there's too much to, I think we have a handle on that. But again, just uh, checking in and advising you on it. Uh, the third issue has to do with the potential need to modify the accumulation limits. Uh, this is the one that I mentioned that wouldn't necessarily need to be resolved at this meeting, but I do think you have some reports from your advisors and they have reached a, a common position on what they think should be done here. Um, and so for example, if a gear switcher, you recall these limits are 3% for the quota share control limit and 4.5% for uh, the quota pounds usage limit. Um, if a gear switcher held 3% of all the Northern Sablefish quota share um, before this provision was implemented, all of, and, all of, and if all of that 3% were to be converted to any gear, then their share of the new category of any gear quota share would be 10.3%. So we just need to, to uh, address this, uh, this issue and talk a little bit about whether you plan to have accumulation caps for the gear specific quota share or just maintain the overall accumulation caps or uh, some, other, some other approach that you might come up with. Mr. Chairman, that uh, completes uh, alternative one. And see if there are any questions on these last three uh, here before we, we move on. But also, you know, we've been going for an hour. You know, some of this stuff is takes some time to digest. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit, go into alternative two. So uh, if you'd like, this might be a good time to, to take a break uh, and then we'll come back. And I think there's probably 10 to 15 minutes, maybe a little bit more to go uh, to get through alternative two. All right. Well, switching gears on the topic is on a topic about switching <laughs> gears is probably an appropriate thing to do. Um, why don't we come back at 9.10 and at that point, see if there are any questions on the material you've just presented, and then we'll continue on with the balance of your presentation. Thank you.
where I hope everyone enjoyed that intermission in our feature presentation of the day. But why don't we come back to our seats and um, we'll receive the balance of the presentation. First, we'll see if there are any questions uh, on the first part on alternative one issues. And uh, once we've dealt with those, we'll continue on with the presentation. So let's see, is almost everyone's back. We'll give this another minute. All right. Um, are there any questions on the presentation so far that um, you'd like to have answered at this point? All right, Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we'll now move into alternative two. Recall that under alternative two, some permits will receive <clears throat> endorsements for gear switching, and they would generally have larger gear switching limits than vessels under non-endorsed permits. And then also the limits for the endorsed permits would be individualized. So as part of implementation, there's both a need to identify which permits receive the gear switching endorsements, so the qualifying requirements, and then the size endorsement limits that will be given for each of those permits. As we did before this slide for alternative one, this slide has a brief version of the three main questions we're looking for some guidance on in relation to alternative two. And again, we'll go through each of these questions, provide some context and identify some approaches for answering the questions. We'll take up the qualification circumvention issue first and move to a schematic to review the qualification options and the nature of this issue. First, we'll focus on the qualification options. The qualifier under all the qualifier under these options is 30,000 pounds in three years. And then there are three options that would require that of a permit and three options that would require those amounts as of a vessel. In this slide, I'm going to focus on the permit, but the pattern we look at would be the same for a vessel. For option one, the only thing required is ownership of a qualifying permit at the time of implementation. For option two, in addition to ownership of the permit, ownership of a vessel as of the control date would be required. Thus the endorsement recipients, in this diagram, the endorsement recipients would be in the area of the intersection between these two circles for option two. However, <clears throat> those who, let's see, those who own quota share on the control date would be able to move into and expand that area of intersection by joining with those who have a qualifying permit, perhaps just taking a token ownership in the partnership, owning a qualifying permit. So between now and the time of implementation, the folks that, that did have quota share on the control date could find a permit to get and, and expand that circle or the owner of a qualifying permit now who's looking at option two and saying, well, I'm not gonna qualify, could find a owner of some quota share and say, hey, let's, uh, let me give you a small share of my permit here so that uh, I can get the uh, endorsement and we'll make a deal uh, to, to make that happen. So that is where the circumvention issue comes with respect to option two. For option three, in addition to the qualifying permit and quota share, ownership of a vessel as of the control date would also be required. So those receiving the endorsement would be at the intersection of all three of these circles. However, again, individuals who on the control date both own a vessel and a quota share as indicated by the uh, X here, that, that, that intersection of those two circles, 
would be able to move into that three-way intersection of all of these requirements by joining with someone that has a qualifying permit. So these are the opportunities for, for circumvention of the intent of these options two and three that are currently, we currently see uh, in the alternative. So with respect to question 10 and on how, uh, and, uh, on how to uh, prevent this kind of circumvention, the council may want to consider some kind of a method, and there are probably several ways this could be achieved. Uh, for example, uh, thinking about option three, requiring the applicant to own the qualifying permit, the quota share, and the vessel as of and since the control date, or require the control date owners to own at least 50% ownership in the qualifying permit or vessel. And that wouldn't eliminate that uh, circumvention uh, possibility, but requiring a 50% common ownership would be a much larger, uh, a much larger barrier. Uh, and uh, I would expect would reduce the number of people willing to try to circumvent in that fashion. So let me stop and see if there's any, any questions about that question, Tim. Jessica Watson, welcome and go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Dr. Seeger. Can you please um, describe for um, this idea of requiring ownership as of and since the control date, what that would mean under the two different options with regards to vessels being upgraded or um, permit status or quota share account um, that expires before the implementation? So pretty much that idea of vessel and quota share. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Watson, yes, um, you know, this is something if you look at some of the older SAMTAC alternatives that they, they uh, dealt with uh, by having some special provisions for uh, situations, you have a total loss of a vessel uh, upgrade. Uh, these would be additional uh, enhancements that you might consider uh, to the options. Um, you know, I imagine resolution of some of these questions could bring up additional questions. Um, I don't think those working those provisions out and, and figuring out what those might be. Um, that's, these are all kinds of things that would happen in the future. They wouldn't slow down or, or affect the analysis, but they're things that we could develop uh, some discussion on and bring back in November. And you could see if there are provisions that you would want to add to uh, address those kinds of, uh, of situations. Thank you. Any other questions at this stage? All right, please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh. So the next question has to do with endorsement limits. And before we look at that, we'll, we'll review uh, the endorsement limit options. As with the endorsement qualification options, there are two sets of three options for the limits. Each set of three is similar, but there are differences depending on whether the qualifier is a permit or a vessel. Option one would base the limit on the gear switching history of the qualifying permit or vessel. Skipping to option three, the limits would be the percentage of quota share owned as of and continuously since the control date. Then option two is a combination of both. The question we'll look at next involve only situations where a limit is going to be based on, based at least in part on the quota share owned. So these questions pertain to options two and three. Questions in 11 and 12, oops, yeah. Address situations where there are many to one and many to many relationships between the qualifying permits or vessels and quota share accounts. I'm going to address these questions together and we'll step through some of the situations briefly. In this example, you have a individual in the center here that owns a single qualifying permit or vessel. Then on the left, it, let's see, it, that's shown on the left. And then two quota share accounts that are shown there on the right. 
The question that we have about the resulting endorsement limit, what that is, is represented that by that bluish box in the lower uh, left-hand corner. This one is relatively easy. You're just summing across the quota share accounts to get the those quota share accounts contribution to the endorsement limit would make sense in the context of the alternatives so that the individual gets full credit. But relative to this question is what to do if one of the accounts is owned by a partnership such that individual A is only a part owner of the quota share account. Let's say that in there here, uh, account X in the upper right hand corner there that they only own half of that account, that they're in a partnership with another individual not shown in this diagram. Would you take a more collective approach that we like what we talked about under alternative one, where all the quota share in that account would count towards the limit or go more individually so that only what is represented by individuals a share of that account uh, would count towards the um, towards the limit for individual A's uh, qualifying permit or vessel. So with respect to that section, <clears throat> with one qualifier, so one permit or vessel to many quota share accounts, we think you're probably going to want to sum across the quota share accounts just to give the individual full credit. It just makes sense within the context of the alternative. But we're looking for guidance on this issue of whether to provide full or partial credit where quota share accounts are only partially owned. The next we have here, uh, let's see, the dis distributing credit for a single quota share account across many qualifiers, many qualifying assets, if you will, qualifying vessels. So we have the one individual in the center here that has one quota share account and they own two, uh, either two permits or two vessels, uh, which will result in the issuance of two endorsements, one for each qualifier. First, just a, a note that we do need to adjust the language of the alternative to clarify that what is in the single quota share account can't be counted twice. So if, if, uh, if the limit's based on quota share ownership and one per, there's 1% in the quota share account, both of those permits don't get 1%. Um, and so you uh, probably want to eliminate sort of that kind of double counting. And that's, that's easy enough to do. Uh, then the question is how to distribute the credit for the quota share account across the limits for the two endorsements. A formula might be developed or you could leave that to the owner. So we've covered one to many and many to one situations, leaving the many to many situations such as that illustrated here. I'm not going to go through this diagram. I just wanna note that we can't tell the nature and or number of such situations that we might have to deal with because qualifying permits and vessels can be traded between now and implementation and at least the alternatives is currently structured. And we don't know what the ownership structures will ultimately look like. We could try to develop some rules or formulas to cover these situations or see if we could leave or leave it to the, in, the involved owners to work out the distributions with the provision that there simply not be any double counting. So back to our previous slide, we're going to add the other situations we've now added, clarify there's no double credit and either allow owners to decide how to distribute credit for quota share accounts or develop rules or formulas. So we've now covered the three main questions related to alternative two. I've got three others for you to consider. They're kind of of the lighter nature that we saw at the end of alternative one. Let me stop here and see if there's any questions on what I just covered before moving to those. Looking, oh, Keely Kent, please. Thank you. Um, I think this is an easy question. Um, just, Jim, could you remind us, the council has decided what has hap what would happen um, when that limit was hit under alternative two? You mean, uh, we established the endorsements and then we establish a, uh, a limit, a gear switching limit, and then the vessel is out fishing and they go over that limit? Yes. 
Oh, let's see. Yes, that has been addressed in the alternatives. Let me kind of try to upload my memory on that. I haven't thought. Uh, if it's I in think the there document, are some I can take that. On, what's that? That's if enough. it's in the document, just tell me that. And okay, yes, and there are options in that regard, a couple of different approaches for handling it. Any other questions at this stage? All right, please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So these are the other, uh, some other questions to consider. Uh, the first two that I'll present here relate to determination of the size of those endorsement limits. The first question, 13, addresses the potential need for an adjustment in relation to the adaptive management quota pound distributions if the endorsement limit is based on quota share owned. So if it's based on quota share owned, and the idea is to allow the qualifying gear switchers to gear switch all of the quota pounds that they would receive based on the quota share they own, the, including the AMP quota, then an adjustment to the current options may be needed so that uh, the limits based on the quota share owned would be large enough to cover that, a that additional AMP quota pounds that they're issued. So if they have 1% of the quota share uh, and you base the limit on that, then they're gonna actually receive, when the AMP is distributed, they'll be receiving 1.11% and that AMP distribution wouldn't be covered. So it would be relatively simple then to just say that the actual limits will be you know, 1.11 times the, the quota share. And then the second question here relates to options that would determine a permits gear switching limit based on the average annual gear switching history of the qualifying permitter vessel. The period used for determination would run from 2011 through September 15, 2017. But in 2017, about half of the gear switching occurred after September 15th. Looking at the data for a few qualifiers, including a partial year, uh, year will drop their average. So including 2017 would drop their average. Um, and for others, including, uh, excluding 2017, excuse me, including 2017 will increase it. So should some sort of an adjustment be made uh, to take into account that partial year? And if so, what might that look like? Finally, the last question, 15, relates to the limits for vessels with endorsed permits. The non, excuse, excuse me, with this relates to vessels with non-endorsed permits. The non-endorsed permit gear switching limit is specified right now as 10,000 pounds per year. If, for example, sablefish becomes overfished and the trawl allocation declines substantially, that 10,000 pound limit could end up being above the amounts provided for some gear switching endorsements, which are based on a percentage. On that basis, instead of the instead the limit might be based set as a percent to address that possibility. Then, just to wrap up here, uh, again, the council's uh, actions. Uh, and uh, the related attachments are displayed here on the slide. Uh, these attachments have been developed to support your deliberations. So we have attachments one and two on the issue of refining the alternatives and the key questions in attachment three. And then we're looking for guidance on the analysis and that uh, information related to that is covered in attachment four. And that completes the... Uh, presentation, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I realized that we didn't stop for that last set of questions, so we can go back to those last, uh, that last set of three questions on that slide, if anyone likes as well. Uh, thanks, Jim, and I think at this point, uh, any questions on the presentation, um, whether it was about option one or two. So let me see if there are any questions on this presentation. Obviously, we'll be able to come back to you during the course of this agenda item. And I am not seeing any hands at this moment, but I know that there will be some questions later. So uh, thank you very much for that. And with that staff presentation completed, uh, we'll go to our reports and we will start with the report of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, Corey Niles. 
Uh, yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, not going to read the report. I will uh, try to maybe spend a few minutes summarizing it. I know, and first I'll start with the, the intent of, of the report. And it, it, we submitted it early Wednesday morning. Um, again, we, we just saw the, the presentation from council staff and how, how, how much thought they put into interpreting it. And uh, we weren't sure whether, whether addressing the questions ahead of time would, would, um, would benefit uh, discussions here or not. You know, after hearing some our, our pre-meetings, um, we, we decided to take a shot to, to, to give our perspective of um, the thoughts in mind when we proposed alternative one back in September. Um, yeah, so these are these were thoughts to get discussion going. Our answers to the to the questions we provided here would you know subject to change based on what we hear today. So that was the intent to uh, to just provide a little more context and background on on the thought process. And so um, just walking through really quickly the the, the discuss the sections of this. The first the first section here, which called the key policy decisions. Um, what we heard today, that these are some important questions to consider, but just uh, we, we start off by keeping in mind that alternative one, um, well, back in September, the council's, the aim back then was to take what we learned from the, from the SAMTAC alternatives and kind of strip them down to the essentials. So the, the point back then, it, it was to simplify is a theme I'll, 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 I'll maybe mention a couple of times. And so to simplify, we really, the alternative one, the, 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 main, the main questions it asks are, you know, basically um, what's needed to show meaningful gear switching participation in the fishery. And we have two options. So question number is one is, is it any kind of landing or is it this, should we require more in, in 30,000 pounds for three years? So that's question number one. Question number two is, you know, that, that step one is probably gonna result, we think between 10 to 12 percent of the quota share being uh, left as any gear quota. So the question number two is, what do you do with the rest? And, and this is what Jim went over nicely in his diagram. With the rest, do you give it just to the, everyone else in the, who owns quota share, or do you use the bottom trawl participation criteria to just direct it to the people who are actively bottom trawling? So those are the two main questions. The third part was we, we put a provision in there um, to help us look at around, you know, to compare and contrast the 29% number, um, not in a big way, but just, uh, I, th it's, I think it's still important that we understand how, how people will be affected by the 29% or something different. So that's a third question. But yeah, so that was the, the aim was to simplify the alternative. It's those two sets of questions. What are the right criteria to, to identify gear switching participation and, and what do you do the, with the rest of the any gear quota? So that's, that's that first section. Then we get into um, some general principles that were in mind. Um, and I'll, I'll spend a, a minute or so on this because they, they kind of um, still capture how, how um, I'm, viewing, I'm viewing the question here. Um, in, in the attempt to simplify, the idea was what are the fewest changes we could make to the IFQ program while uh, creating a, a definite, a solid, you know, hard cap, whatever you want to call it, on gear switching. So that was the aim, and this, the structure of this uh, does that. Let's let's just make the smallest changes we need to to meet the purpose and need kind of thing. You know, as Jim said, the, the a lot of the complexities you're seeing in the presentation are, are related to the initial conversion step. Um, again, we don't. We're really having. We have two or two questions about the conversion step uh, at, at the higher level. But those any complexity there is just designed to recognize the investment that that people made in this fishery, um, and, and to us they seem like pretty simple uh, sets of criteria. And we we have uh, with some good detailed questions that, that staff has raised about how certain businesses and people would be affected. Uh, the third bullet point there is you know it also strikes us that this like like Jim went over it, this is different than in the past. There's an extra layer to, to talk to think about here when you're when you're talking about investment independence participation that kind of thing the relationship between quota share ownership and fishing um, is more complicated than it used to be well there was you know fishing and fishing participation and fishing and participation is more complicated than it used to be and therefore we didn't have any established rules for what people should expect on how the council will um, 
would look to that in the future when, when thinking about fairness. And so, you know, that what you'll see in some of our answers is given the expectations were not clear, we should probably take a wide net here, a broad net, and, and give people the benefit of the doubt in terms of they if looking for signs of investment and participation, because again, the rules were not clear. And lastly, uh, that last point in this section was that, um, you know, all kinds of questions pop around in the, in the SAMTAC discussions and, and since then about should it be the vessel, should it be the permit? Um, but it strikes us that, you know, those, those I would say, a, a silly phrase comes to mind, like a permit itself is not a business, but so it's really the business that we should be focused on and the quarter share we should be focused on because that's, that was, that's the most valuable um, fishing privilege under this, under this program. We're talking about a million dollars per percentage point. And so we can focus, the point was to focus on the business and, and the most significant investment, the quota share. Um, permits can move around, vessels can change. It's really the business and the people that are making, making the uh, livelihoods in this fishery that should be the focus. So again, those were the, the general thoughts. I don't, I'm not gonna go one by one through these questions, um, uh, but I just kinda, just to quickly, go through the, the vision of how it would work in, our, in my mind when we proposed the alternative back in September. And it was, it was a simple, again, trying to give people the benefit of the doubt. We have a set of vessel accounts with owners. They meet the gear switching participation or not. We have a list, we have a table, a list of quota share owners over here. They can be joined together using ownership in common. And people use uh, different, for example, LL Limited Liability Corporation, the same people will use one for quota share and a different one for vessels just because vessel liability issues, other reasons. So again, giving benefit of the doubt, let's look at ownership in common. And so then that's the basic approach. You find the owners in common, that establishes the link to the quota share account. Um, and then the next layers down, as Jim said, there's, there's questions about the timing of when linkages happened and the control date and um, you know what happens to changes in businesses after between now and implementation kind of thing and those are those are the good questions to ask they're a little bit um, um, a, a down a level or two um, from the general principle but that was the approach keep it simple give people the benefit of the doubt if in terms of how we viewed and if it, investment participation and dependence and it's good to see the ideas coming out uh, we will hear today on on how we give guidance um, tomorrow on 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 these questions. But yeah, I'm going to skip skip answering the questions, um, and then just the the second to last section, which we called evaluating the council's choice, is just again trying to make um, more transparent the way we've been, or at least I've been thinking about how what alternatives to include um, at that step of simplifying. And uh, we, we state here, our, you know, the council has a purpose and need, which we're of course looking to, but, you know, connected to that purpose and need is, is national standard four primarily, which requires allocations to be fair and equitable. And uh, we're, yeah, we're expecting, hoping um, the advice on that to come at the next stages of analysis, just putting our, just again, to be more transparent about how we think we've been thinking through this. Um, those guidelines say basically when you're, when you're making allocations, changing allocations of fishing privileges, you know, the council has a lot of policy leeway, but you, you can't just create winners and losers for no reason, you know, to, to take fishing privileges from one group and give it to another without, without cause is the definition of arbitrary and capricious. But so they, they, the guidelines, um, say to avoid that, weigh the benefits and costs. We, you know, if the benefits to the winners outweigh uh, the disadvantages and the hardships to the losers, that is considered fair and equitable if we have the rationale. So that's just, it's kind of a weighing of the, the benefits and the costs. And so alternative one was proposed as a way to keep the cost, the cost side of the equation as low as possible while, while um, giving, you know, increasing the benefits as much as possible. And so the more you, the more you uh, raise the disadvantages and costs, the more benefits you need. So that's just the weighing, the general weighing of, um, again, how we were approaching the question of how should we really try to simplify this back down in September. And that last section there, um, 
you know, just briefly uh, explains why we did not include uh, some of the elements um, from the SAMTAC alternative one and some of those have been proposed in public comment. And again, this is just articulating our views for feedback. Um, at that time and, and, and possibly still now, we saw that benefits and costs of having a approach where everybody's quota share is equally split, regardless of, of why they invested in quota share. Um, but then the disadvantage of that would be reduced by the conversion date where at some point in the year, quota would become any gear quota. Um, and so we saw a, a couple issues with that and having much lower prospects of, of meeting that benefit cost test because on the fairness side, um, well, I'll start with the, with the, uh, the benefit side of trying to create a uh, limit on gear switching. Um, anywhere from, I believe, I'm not going to get these numbers exact and, and would request staff at some point to clarify if I'm way off, but um, as much as 70% of the gear switching or at least is, is more than half happens in September, October, um, in November, and December. So if, if we split everyone's quota equally and gave 29% gear switching, there's still a big opportunity for increases in gear switching to, to happen in the fall. So that really questions or would undermine, reduce whatever you wanna say, the benefits of, of, of limiting gear switching. On the cost side of it, yeah, let's say let's say half of half of the uh, gear switching happened in the fall when the conversion date would be apply and, um, and and gear would become any gear. Well, if it's half, then that means some people who bought quota share to, to fish it before then in the summer. Um, and so why why would it be necessary to uh, you know to disadvantage them by by um, making their quota only eligible to fish in the fall instead of when they want to fish it? And then I'll end by saying, yeah, that, that goes back to why keeping, keeping it simple and, and changing the IFQ program as little as possible would be to allow people to, you know, the, there are benefits, a lot of benefits to the IFQ fishery. People get to fish their quota when the markets allow, when they want. And so this, the, the aim would be to, again, create a, uh, to create a, a limit on gear switching while still maintaining a lot of flexibility. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, being that just, that was there, putting thoughts out for feedback and, um, and again, open to, to, to looking forward to hearing that feedback and expecting to um, provide more different guidance possibly from our perspective tomorrow during council um, action. All right, thank you for the report, Corey. Let's see if there are any questions on the WDFW report. We'll probably have council discussion uh, tomorrow on this agenda item. So Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Niles. I have one question. I thought I heard in your summary of your report that you were using the terms quota share and business entities synonymously, um, but in the report, it says you state, you know, business entities should receive as much, if not more focus than a permit or vessel or even quota share. Can you please clarify that for me? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jessica. <laughs> yeah, hopefully I can. Well, also, I think um, before I go there, one one thing I would like to highlight, and I, this will be a more for a council discussion, um, I forgot to say that among the questions, that what, what's most consistent with the original intent uh, is the collective approach that Jim and Jesse describe here, and giving the benefit of the doubt to the entity. Um, so our, our suggestion here would be start with that general rule um to to use the collective approach and then we're probably we're not talking about a lot of entities here maybe 15 20 you 30 i would be surprised if it's above 20 but then use that general rule to to respect the entities businesses have their own reasons for existing and, and um forming use that own general rule and then if there's exceptions of the type jim um is pointing out to us then we could look at those creating those exceptions. But that's kind of what I meant by respecting the, um, the business. The, the business does need to acquire the quota share to, to participate in the fishery and, and the quota share, like I, I meant to say, if I didn't, is where all the, where the value has been accumulating, I would say, and it's a million dollars per percentage point on average, according to Jefferson State Trading. So maybe that doesn't answer your question, but I hope it gets at it and happy to try, try, try again. 
that answers it. Thank you. Right. Any further questions on the WDF, WDFW report? Thank you, Corey. Uh, we'll now move uh, into our management and advisory bodies. Um, Dan Holland, are you there for the SSC? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the council. Uh, I'm Dan Holland, chair of the SSC. I'd like to read into the record agenda item F5A, supplemental SSC report one, scientific and statistical committee report on sable fish gear switching. The scientific and statistical committee received a report from Dr. Jim Seeger and Ms. Jesse Dorpinghaus on an annotated outline for the analytical document that will be used to evaluate alternatives under consideration by the council on limiting the use of fixed gear in the trawl individual fishing quota IFQ fishery uh, in gear switching. Agenda item F5, attachment four. <clears throat> the SSC provided feedback to the analysts. The SSC was asked to provide feedback on a baseline scenario that describes conditions under the no action alternative, i.e. no changes to current rules regarding gear switching. The effects of each alternative will then be analyzed relative to the conditions under the no action baseline. The analysis, analysts are proposing a historical baseline, an average of 2016 to 2019, as a representative of gear switching that would be expected in the future under a no action alternative. Multiple factors, including changes in sable fish recruitment patterns, changes in annual catch limits uh, and production, market disruptions due to the global pandemic, and changes in export markets and conditions make it unlikely that recent years will be an accurate estimate of future conditions. Rather than using an average of recent years, for example, the 26 to 19 period, as a baseline, it may be useful to use several individual years as baselines of comparison. Each historical year evaluated would represent the no action alternative under different assumptions regarding future conditions and the amount of gear switching that would occur. <clears throat> These comparisons might include recent years that were considered unusual. The SSC also had several recommendations for the analysts in the development of the analytical document. The SSC recommends that the analysts choose appropriate metrics to evaluate the effects of each alternative. The annotated outline uses attainment for multiple groundfish species and gross revenues, among other metrics. The analyst should evaluate effects on net revenue as well. While there is evidence that reducing gear switching may increase gross revenues, the different cost structures for the different gear types suggest that reducing gear switching may not necessarily increase net revenue. The economic data collection program at the Northwest Fishery Science Center has cost and revenue data for trawlers and gear switchers that can be used to estimate net revenue and how it may be affected by changes in prices, costs, and species composition in trawl fisheries. The SSC also notes it is important that the, ana that the analysis evaluate trade-offs for each alternative. While limiting gear switching may increase attainment of some species, it may have negative in income effects on participants that would prefer to gear switch and on the value of quota shares. Finally, the, anal the analysis should address whether and why the current market-driven allocation of sable fish quota pounds is undesirable and what problems the proposed alternatives are trying to correct by constraining the market. This context is important for evaluating whether the alternatives under consideration are meeting their desired obje objectives or may result in unintended consequences. That concludes the SSC report. I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you very much, Dan. Are there questions of Dan on the SSC report? Corey Niles. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and, and thanks, Dan. Um, I guess I'm seeing a connection between your last paragraphs or maybe all the paragraphs and, and and, and well, all the paragraphs, I guess, but on this question of the, of the baseline, um, as you all are acknowledging the, the, um, the extent to which gear switching is contributing to, to the, the lack of attainment in the, um, in the AFQ program is, is, is somewhat, is, is debatable among stakeholders, stakeholders is how I'll phrase it. But in terms of, uh, you know, a baseline, which I, I, I think is um, we we heard is intended to really be a forecast of what would happen if the no action if the council were to choose a no action alternative. So, 
there is, for example, a scenario as you can envision, and people have been arguing, you know, we have a positively ground fish group who's uh, working to, to tell the story of, of, of sustainability and success of West Coast ground fish and, and, and build, um, build back markets for, uh, for, for, um, for ground fish. Let's say that scenario succeeds and more and more people are able to, as you say, maybe earn more net revenues per pound of sable fish than they do now. And so we would see the IFQ program, we would see less leasing to fixed gear uh, vessels, you know, you would expect in the future. But um, yeah, I'll stop there and just say, am I, uh, am I kind of articulating somewhat your thoughts on, on the baseline and, and what kind of scenarios could we should be asking the staff to consider in, in the next rounds of analysis? Um, well, I mean, that's, that's one, um, you know, reason uh, that things could change in, in the future, for sure, um, markets uh, and, and demand for a particular species. But um, I think part of the, the issue that we were bringing up here was you know, that, that the, the analysts were um, kind of deciding that they were going, they, thinking that they would exclude the last couple of years as, base, as baseline um, because mainly because of COVID considerations, I guess. Um, but we were kind of noting that, that uh, for example, recruitment, uh, recruitment pulls may have been a, a major factor there as well. And those will happen again. And, and there are, you know, other, other factors that will change in the future, such that, that sort of con considering an average of four, this, the, of any four years really, um, is probably not going to be a good prediction of the future. And we're simply saying that um, rather it might be better to take, you know, a set of different years that are quite different from each other um, that maybe represent a, a range of, of different outcomes will provide more insight into, into, you know, how this program might work in the future um, with the, you know, under the, under the, the current regulations, as well as, as, you know, trying to compare that to, to what, you know, what might occur with, with more restrictions on gear switching. Does that answer your question? Further questions of the SSC. Corey. Uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. Chair. And yeah, Dan, knowing, knowing uh, you may be more comfortable answering these questions about economics than, um, than you were about our, the, the, the stock assessment issues yesterday. Um, on your last paragraph, and I know you're not the only economist on the SSC these days, but um, on your sentence where it says, where finally the analysis should address whether and why the current market-driven allocation of sable fish quota pounds is undesirable. So that, that sentence, you know, one issue we've, I think we've left to the, to the, the side at the moment is um, the effect that the control limits have had. It is a constraint on the market um, that, that might be making it, for example, less attractive or, or impossible for, for processors to vertically integrate, for example. Um, so I'm presuming you all didn't talk about those constraints and how they affect um, how stable fish quota pounds is, is, is distributing nowadays. It's, that's probably beyond the scope of what you, what you talked about. Um, well, it it did come up in discussion, and it, it, um, I think it, uh, Jim Seeger mentioned that that um, that was a consideration. We I think we brought up the question of you know why we had some discussion of why the market was was not um, allocating uh, you know effectively, I guess basically, and and um, and you know Jim did bring up the issue that that there are constraints on aggregation um, that limit the uh, 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 that limit the ability uh, uh, for vertical integration and so um, creating a situation I guess where um, processors might be uh, uh, reluctant to make large investments in increasing processing capacity developing markets um, if they're um, you know not assured of being able to get enough uh, uh, sable fish delivered uh, or sable fish available to support um, catch of other species uh, and the you know the idea is that, that, that the issue discussed was that they're you know they're un unable to assure that access to quota because they are un unable to to vertically integrate so it was discussed uh, and um, I, but it, we we didn't you know make any any uh, draw any conclusions necessarily. 
Thank you. Right. Thank you for that. Are there any further questions of the SSC? All right, thank you very much, Dan. You're welcome. We'll now go to the ground fish management team, Whitney Roberts, welcome. Good morning, Council. For the record, my name is Whitney Roberts from the ground fish management team, and I will be reading agenda item F5A, Supplemental GMT Report 1, ground fish management team report on stable fish gear switching. The ground fish management team reviewed the briefing book materials and public comments and received a presentation from Dr. Jim Seeger of Pacific Fishery Management Council staff, as well as guidance from Ms. Jesse Dorpinghouse of Council staff. The council action at this meeting is to refine alternatives adopted for analysis as needed and to provide guidance on analysis as needed. As the GMT has stated in the past, we recognize that action on this item is largely a policy call, but we do offer some comments based on our understanding of the council's goals and objectives for this overall action. The GMT provided other comments and recommendations on the gear switching issue at the November 2020 and September 2021 council meetings, some of which may no longer be applicable given recent changes to the range of alternatives. The council is currently scheduled to take preliminary preferred action on this item in the November 2022, oh, sorry, in November 2022, followed by final preferred action in April 2023. Recognizing that this meeting is an opportunity to refine the alternatives, the GMT is concerned that significant revisions to the ROA, such as the addition of new alternatives that had not been previously proposed, would result in further delays to selection of the PPA and FPA. Such delays are likely to impact other groundfish items the council will need to take up, such as program reviews and prioritize new management measures. The GMT discussed which years are most appropriate to use when considering the baseline and agrees with the Scientific and Statistical Committee on recommending an approach that includes multiple past years as a proxy for a range of possible future scenarios. Specifically for the baseline, the GMT recommends using 2013 to represent a year in which there were low stable fish ACLs and low participation, 2019 to represent a year with high ACLs and high participation, and 2021 to represent a year with high ACLs and low participation. Given the variability in future conditions, especially for stable fish, including years like 2021 in which markets were poor and allocations were high, in addition to better years like 2019, may provide a more balanced view of baseline conditions and account for natural fluctuations in markets and participation outside of this action. The GMT has commented in the past on how best to account for both, quote, normal and anomalous years, and continues to believe that a, br a broader discussion across FMPs and council bodies will need to take place to truly understand how historical data can inform predictions about the future. Regarding the range of alternatives, keeping in mind the potential impacts to other groundfish items if this action is delayed, the GMT is generally supportive of an ROA that attempts to maintain as much simplicity as, and flexibility as possible. For simplicity, the council should consider whether or not alternatives, options, or sub-options included, with the exception of no action, would accomplish the council's objective of keeping northern stable fish gear switching from impeding the attainment of northern individual fishing quota allocations with trawl gear while considering impacts of current operations and investments. If the council believes that limiting gear switching to 29% would at a minimum improve the opportunity for trawl vessels to attain their northern IFQ allocations, I should note of stable fish should be said there, the GMT note points out that both alternatives currently put forward would seem to accomplish this objective. Other options and sub-options within those alternatives appear to largely be policy decisions that may be unnecessarily complex to meet the purpose and need. Furthermore, given the variety of possible partnership and linkage scenarios presented by the analysts, it is clear that a single method, for example, cases where there are multiple qualifying entities connected to the same or multiple quota share accounts under alternative one, would not meet the needs of all participants or entities in the fishery who would potentially benefit from flexibility to make the most appropriate business decisions for themselves within the bounds of limiting gear switching to 29%. The way that the alternative one quota share holder classifications listed in table two of the attachment two are titled, are titled seem to suggest that gear switching participants are not also IFQR participants. 
Although this is not likely the intention behind these titles, the GMT reminds the council that gear switches are in fact IFQ participants and not a separate sector from vessels using trawl gear. Gear switchers are simply taking advantage of a gear use flexibility built into the IFQ program. This is important to note because the decision regarding quota share splitting by gear type should not be viewed as an allocation split between sectors, but rather between vessels within a single sector. This action would not create an additional sector beyond what already exists. And under the action alternatives, gear switchers would still be participants of the IFQ program. It is the GMT's understanding that if alternative one is chosen as FPA, these are only temporary classifications used to determine the ratios of trawl only and any gear quota share each entity receives on an annual basis and would not be used for any purpose after implementation of this action. The GMT reviewed the public comments submitted and offers the following thoughts on the requests made. Any alternatives or options that would allow for all IFQ participants to use any gear type to fish their quota after a specified conversion date, in other words, June 1 or September 1, would not be expected to limit gear switching to 29% because more than 50% of gear switching tends to occur after September 1st. Furthermore, any alternative or option that would disallow gear switching after the fleet-wide 29% limit is met would effectively create a race to fish, which is counter to the objectives of the trawl rationalization program. The GMT also reminds the council that this action is a long-term policy that will be subject to natural market and allocation fluctuations. Implementing any one approach for only a few years and revisiting the issue to determine whether that approach is appropriate would not account for the long-term nature of this action, especially given the ex exceptionally high Sablefish ACLs anticipated in 2023 and 2024. Guidance on provisions. Lastly, the GMT views many of the questions posed by the analysts to be policy decisions by the council that would be best informed by input from industry participants and therefore does not attempt to answer them with the exception of question number nine under alternative one. This question asks, should the Northern Sablefish quota share control limit 3% and annual vessel quota pound use limit of 4.5% be adjusted to take into account the division of the northern sablefish allocation into two pools? If so, how should that adjustment be carried out? Consistent with our suggestion that the council simplify this action, the GMT believes that meeting the purpose and need statement would not warrant a div divergence from the pre-established limit on the proportion of quota share or quota pounds any one entity can hold, which are currently 3% and 4.5% respectively. Therefore, the GMT recommends maintaining the 3% and 4.5% quota share control and quota pound use limits, respectively, for all gear types and not dividing those limits into gear specific limits to further simplify this gear switching action, recognizing that the control and use limit provisions are unrelated to the objective of limiting gear switching. Ultimately, it is at the Council's discretion as to whether these status quo limits need to be changed but the GMT does not view that change as necessary to meet this action's purpose and need. The GMT looks forward to hearing from fishery participants on the remaining provisions and to seeing additional analysis, both of which may hopefully elucidate some of the questions posed here. And with, ha with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Whitney. And let's see if there are any questions of the GMT. I'll check online. I'm not seeing any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, Phil Anderson, excuse me. I looked oh, over there, I didn't not see. Your, not your fault, it's mine, it's late. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Whitney and the GMT for your thoughtful report. Um, I noted in the, in the uh, gap report, which we're going to receive here in a few minutes, um, a suggestion for an additional alternative that was uh, similar to the one that uh, is referenced in your report. Uh, that is um, a fleet wide 29% limit. Uh, and that when that limit is reached that um, the uh, your, the ability to land say, trawl stable fish quota using gear other than trawl gear would be prohibited uh, or something like that. And uh, the GMT's uh, concern, I don't know if it's a conclusion, but certainly a concern is that it would create a race for fish, uh, as you noted in your report. And I, w I wondered if you had had an opportunity 
uh, to consider the CAPS discussion about that and why they uh, came to a different conclusion uh, about whether or not it would uh, create a race for fish before offering that as a perspective from the GMT. Through the chair, thank you, Mr. Anderson, for the question. Um, we did not have access to the GAP report before submitting our report. Um, we also were, the GMT was not scheduled to have a joint session with the GAP on this action item. So we weren't able to have that dialogue with them that, that may have answered this. Um, we also were under certain time constraints given that um, several reports were due yesterday. And so the GMT ourselves did not have a lot of time to talk at a at great length um, for some of these issues. Fair enough. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Corey Niles. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and thanks GM, uh, to Whitney and the GMT. I try to say those both at the same time. Um, yeah, on that, same, on that same paragraph, I guess, would it be unfair to say that the GMT on, on this, on the issue of the conversion date and not sticking to the, not likely to limit it to 29% with a high probability, it, is it fair to say this is not the first time the GMT concluded that this was a conclusion that you've, you've reached, you know, looking at the SAMTAC analysis and back in September if, in, in before then? Through the chair, thank you, Mr. Niles, for the question. That is correct. The GMT has commented on this in the past because it has been considered in some of the analyses proposed in prior meetings. Further questions? All right, thank you very much. Um, we have one more report. It's from the GAP. It looks like it's a panel presentation. Uh, just to let folks know where we're going after the gap report, uh, we'll take a morning break and then we'll come back and have public comment. Um, we have quite a bit of public comment lined up on this agenda item. Um, so we're going to take the rare step of uh, reducing the time. Um, it'll be three minutes for individuals and six minutes for groups. But I just wanted to give folks that, uh, that heads up. So now we'll hear from the GAP. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and Council Members. My name is Susan Chambers, and I will be reading uh, the first section of our GAP report. And I have with me uh, Mr. Jeff Lackey. He is online. And uh, Mr. Bob Alverson, I believe, is in the room with you. He is. OK. Uh, the Groundfish Advisory Panel received an update from Dr. Jim Seeger and Ms. Jesse Dorpinghouse, Council staff, under this agenda item and offers the following comments and recommendations. The GAP had a robust discussion of the alternatives and considered the questions posed in agenda item F5, attachment three. We appreciate the extensive analysis and preparation of the alternatives and the questions to help frame discussion and Council direction. This report is broken into two sections. The summary below lists the questions from attachment three with the GAPS answers in bold. The second section details perspectives from the trawl and fixed gear sectors. The first section, summary of responses. <clears throat> the GAP is recommending the individual approach under alternative one below, thereby eliminating the need to respond to the questions on the collective approach. However, responses to the collective approach questions are provided in case the council ultimately chooses the collective method. Additionally, the GAP would like to see a high level analysis that further indicates how the individual approach varies from the collective approach in terms of the number of entities that would be affected by this choice and the quota shares held by those entities. It would also be helpful to have a general description of some of the business arrangements for which the choice makes a difference. And with the chair's permission, I propose um, just referencing the question number and the gaps response in the interest of time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. For alternative one, the gear specific quota share alternative, for question number one, the gap, 
proposes the individual approach. For number two, the GAP proposes the control date, which if I recall is September 15th, 2017. For question number three, a collective approach. And if that group splits up, uh, the GAP proposes only the partner that had a history of owning a gear switching vessel would retain that status. For number four, again, the GAP proposes the individual approach. For number five, if a collective approach is taken and the group breaks up prior to implementation, have a cap proportional to their share of ownership of quota share as of the control date. For number six, under the collective approach, the quota share owned outside the group would not qualify <clears throat> for group classification status. For other alternative one issues to consider, for number seven, the gap suggests that yes, apply the same as they would be applied to all of the quota share owners. For number eight, um, the formulas, the gap suggests calculated calculation based on reported percent of ownership. For number nine, the gap recommends applying existing accumulation limits only at the aggregate northern sablefish level level. For alternative two, the gear switching endorsements. For number 10, how might the qualification criteria be adjusted to prevent potential circumvention? The gap prefers that to prevent potential circumvention of qualification criteria, all transfers of ownership after the control date, whether it be at the permit, vessel, or quota share level, won't qualify a person or entity for a gear switching endorsement. <clears throat> We combined questions number 11 and number 12. So in response to both of those combined, partial credit for partially owned quota share accounts with no double counting and in complex ownership situations, allow the involved owners to decide how to distribute credit for quota share accounts owned among gear switching limits that will be provided for the related endorsements taking into account the double counting would not be allowed. For um, other alternative two issues to consider for number 13, regarding uh, adaptive management program quota pound distributions, the GAP recommends changing the option language to clarify that the resulting gear switching limits that are based on options that take into account quota share ownership provide a limit sufficient to cover the AMP quota pounds issued for the quota shares. Number 14, and I'm going to read this one in its entirety. Uh, number 14, should there be an adjustment to the gear switching limit formulas based on gear switching history to take into account a partial year? Some members of the GAP recommend examining ending dates of December 31st, 2016 and December 31st, 2017 to be more fair to examine a full fishing season since many gear switchers wait until after September to catch their sablefish. Other members of the GAP believe it is important to maintain the integrity of the control date and use September 15th, 2017. Number 15, the gap suggests the limit for non-endorsed trawl permits should be specified as the smaller value of 0.11% or 10,000 pounds. So for the second section of our report on the perspectives, as the council is aware, the two primary sectors, fixed gear and trawl, have had very differing viewpoints of this issue in the past. We have presented these to the council in our gap statements in an effort to provide the council with the best representation of the issue. In keeping with that form, we provide those perspectives below. 
And for these two section, these two parts of the, our report, I will refer to Mr. Bob Alverson for the fixed gear sector perspective, and then to Mr. Jeff Lackey for the trial gear sector perspective. So ahead, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, um, from the fixed gear sector perspective, uh, the minutes read, the fixed gear representatives of the gap who are interested in gear switching recommend the following revisions to the existing gear switching alternatives. The first one we re recommend the council consider the proposal presented in the letter to the council from Ocean Beat Consulting LLC, which is part of the written record, public record, found under agenda item F5 as a sub option to alternative one. Second, we recommend that the, the phase out option, endorsement expiration option one of alternative two be dropped. And third, we recommend the council consider an alternative refinement that would allow for 29% of the trawl sable fish quota to be gear switched. And when that amount has been landed, the gear switching would be closed. Some have worried this would create a race for fish. We discount this based on the low level of numbers of vessels that actually gear switch and the allocation to gear switch at 29% is approximately 85% of historical levels of gear switching activity based on the years 2016 through 2019 um, utilizing, utilization of allocation by fixed gear. We do not see a classical race for fish materializing with this refinement. All right, thank you, Bob. Travis, or the Jeff Lackey. Yes, um, for the trawl gear sector perspective portion of the report, uh, first comments on alternatives. One, the current range of fixed gear limitation of about 5% to 29% with an expiration option in alternative two is appropriate to provide for a robust analysis. Second, the 5% limitation is appropriate for analysis as a base number since it represents a combination of qualifiers like QS ownership by vessel owners that fish 30,000 pounds in any three pre-control date years. Third, alternative one currently has only a 29% limitation and therefore an analysis that compares alternative one to status quo is not likely to provide much or any of a contrast for impacts to items such as purpose and need optimum yield, f and and program goals and objectives. Fourth, both alternatives have a fair amount of complexity. Although the analysis in November could provide some clarity in terms of the impact from different sub options. Proposal for a third alternative. Issue sable fish and North quota pounds each year to all quota share accounts in the same proportion of trawl only quota pounds and any gear quota pounds for each QS account. Analyze at 5% to 29% any gear quota pound uh, range and remainder trawl only quota pounds so it has about the same limitation range as alternative two. Comments on future analysis. One, it is desired for the analysis prepared for November Council meeting to compare and contrast the impact of 29% versus 0% fixed gear attainment limitation of sable fish north trawl quota on the long-term capacity of the program or fishery to A, achieve the goals and objectives as, as outlined in the Pacific Coast Ground Fish Fishery Management Plan in Amendment 20, with emphasis on multi-species optimum yield on a continuing basis. B, contribute to necessary continuity of markets, infrastructure, and year-round employment anchored in coastal communities. C, maintain necessary continuity previously mentioned in years when sable fish incidental catch is trending high in the shoreside whiting fishery. D, maintain a geographically distributed fishery that connects communities to the sustainable trawl dependent ground fish resource. And E, maximize contribution in amount and affordability to the nation's food security. Two, it would be informative to have analysis showing percentage of sable fish north quota share, that is, A, owned by vessel owners as of and since the control date and fished with fixed gear, 30,000 pounds in any three pre-control date years, B, and in addition, have maintained their permit and vessel ownership, C, and in addition, have fished fixed gear in the trawl IFQ fishery in the 
in the in at least two of the last three years, 2019 through 21. And that concludes the report. All right, thank you, Jeff, Bob, and Susan. Let's see if there are any questions on um, the gap report or any part thereof. Corey Niles. Th thanks, Mr. Chair, and um, yeah, thanks to the gap for a well-organized report. Um, my question is, um, oh, to, just lost my window one second here. It's on the list of questions, the alternative one, number one, and, and just kind of understand why the why the gap prefers an individual approach. Um, and just to kind of to state the question, the approach I, I would envision is that, you know, I would if I was in the business and I started an LLC or a corporation, for example, I would I would expect that entity to be um, treated as an entity and that that we wouldn't look beneath the entity unless we really had to and i'm uh i'm seeing the only reason we would want to is in case there were issues we didn't anticipate like the type, the type that staff has um raised about changes to companies after the control date all that so is there any other reason i guess the question why does the gap uh support the individual approach if there was a way to just look at it entity level while while taking that care of it exceptions would would there be any objection to that would be another way of, of stating another question and i'll stop there see if i can clarify um what i'm what i'm after here bob <clears throat> mr chairman um the um, troll and uh, uh, fixed gear people pretty much agreed with each other on these questions. In answering this first question, we took at least probably an hour of questions before we came to this conclusion. And the primary focus that we had is asking how would a family partnership or a LLC or a small corporation, what would be the fallout of the fishing privileges and rights and how does this affect that? And after, Quite a long discussion. Um, the fixed gear and troll folks on the on the um, on the gap felt the best um, analysis would be in the, the individual approach. Um, having said that, we're probably not completely sure that's the right answer, and so we'd like to see the analysis before we take a final on that. But um, we did, I think. Um, Come to the conclusion that the uh, the uh, the trawl and fixed gear people have similar ownerships in their boats, so they have similar answers on these questions. Um, and pretty much, we were in agreement on all 15 of these questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, the best I can do, Corey. All right, thanks, Bob. Let me just see if if Jeff has just to confirm that perspective. Yes, I think Bob said it well. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Susan. Hi, this is Susan. Um, I just wanted to add one more thing, if I could. Um, we did ask for uh, the analysis, like uh, Bob mentioned, um, in a paragraph above alternative one. And we did that because, um, and Jim, Mr. Dr. Seeger, correct me if I'm wrong, if we do that analysis, it will not slow the progress of this action, but it will allow an opportunity for the council to you know, if we do find something that is seriously um, wrong with the individual approach, it will allow the council to return to consider the collective approach in the future. All right, thank you. Uh, Krista and then Brad. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for the report. I will say that I'm encouraged to hear that there appears to be some common ground among people um, that are involved in the process. Uh, my question stems around the proposal for a third alternative. Uh, the way it's laid out in uh, this report, it, it looks a bit like it's coming in under the trawl gear sector perspective. And just wondering, is, is that a collective gap 
perspective uh, for a proposal for the third alternative? Is there consensus around that? Um, or is that specifically coming out of the trawl sector? Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Ms. Svensson, um, I think, and I'd have to look again, I think um, as proposed specifically here, it is coming out of the trawl sector. I think there was public comment that also proposed the third alternative, but the difference was on how much um, of the quota pounds were analyzed. And I would defer to Jeff and Bob to correct me on any part of that comment. If I may? Yes, go ahead, Jeff. Um, yes, thank you. Um, yes, at, at first there was talk of making it consensus, but there was enough differences. The vehicle was proposed by both. There was a public comment letter from uh, Michelle Robinson, and, and, and that was advocated in the gap. But the difference was there was a conversion date in the public comment letter, and the range was 29%. Now, for the trawl, it's the same vehicle, but there's no conversion date. And the request is to analyze a range of, of between five and 29%. All right, thanks for that response. Uh, Brad, before I go to you, I, Marcy actually had her hand up and I had forgot. Was, was there another, Bob, are you gonna to respond to that? Yeah, the, the main, the main uh, issue for the fixed gear people is is uh, the five percent uh, lower level in that analysis that the trawlers wanted to look at, and we didn't. Un I still don't understand the thirty thousand pound in item two under comments. So we took the Ocean Beat Consulting LLC at at its face value as presented. All right, thanks, Marcy, and then Brad. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had a question similar to Krista about the organization of the report and if the comments on feature analysis fall under the trawl uh, gear sector perspective or if that was a full suite of gap recommendations on the future analysis. So that's question one. Do you want to address that to Susan? Sure, thank you. Sure, I can I can take a stab at that. Um, yeah, as as uh, Jeff and Bob have mentioned, um, you know there was interest uh, for that uh, third alternative. The difference was only on the conversion and the percentage change. So um, I think we kind of wrapped that in with the uh, the fixed gear sector wrapped that in with their support for the Ocean Beat Consulting public comment letter. Um, I don't know how much more workload that would create for um, council staff, but that that was my understanding. If I could Thank clarify you. the structure and answer that question. Okay, Jeff, go ahead. Yes, in the report, the blue header trawl gear sector perspective, everything below that is trawl gear, uh, everything from the rest of the report. And the section comment on future analysis <clears throat> isn't tied to the proposal for a third alternative. It's comments on future analysis for, for all alternatives uh, moving forward. The proposal for a third analysis is, is just the two sentences below that header, if that helps at all on the structure of the report. Go ahead, Marcy. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jeff. I, I heard somewhat different things from you and from Susan, but I'm gonna set that aside and let you take that up, however. My, my real question is about the five to 29% analysis that is requested in the third alternative versus the 29 versus zero percent range that is, or not range, but one versus other analysis that's recommended in item one under that header. So maybe somebody can explain why one is a 
range from five to 29 and why under item one, it is 29 versus zero. Thank you. And again, I think all these gap questions will be directed to Susan. And if Susan needs some help from uh, Jeff or Bob, she can point to Jeff or Bob. Sure, Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Uremko, thank you. And for this one, I will defer to Jeff on, on that. Yes, thank you. The alternative two has a endorsement expiration. So there is an eventual zero or near zero potential outcome. And so for the analysis, it would incorporate the long term. Um, but for the near term, there's not a zero percent option in any of the alternatives. So that's why the the five percent is a lower end for the near term, but for analysis long term, uh, it, there's the potential for zero or near zero. Okay. All right. Thank you. And Brad. Thank you, Chair Gronick. Um Yes, this is, an, I, this is um, on the uh, third alternative, um, in that it talks about um, the quota share. Um, talk about using the quota pounds to designate as troll only or any year instead of the quota share. I'd like to kind of curious what the rationale or why they wanted to uh, why the troll sector um, or the troll um, participants in the gap wanted to go that direction instead of the keep it in quota share as a designated quota share as troll only or any year. Uh, we understand, I'd like to understand your rationale for that. Great, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Pettinger. Um, for this, I will also defer to Jeff on this because he, is, he has researched it and provided this option. Yes. Um, even the public comment letter from Michelle Robinson went the quota pound route. Um, if I recall, I don't want to mischaracterize her rationale. Part of it was simplicity. Um, part of it was treating everybody the same. Uh, this alternative was something that's been around for, since the beginning. It's been batted around by people and actually it was brought back up, um, interestingly enough, from both trial proponents and then we saw it from, from fixed gear in the mechanism, not the, not the percentages. Um, and so when I looked at it, and compared it to alternative one, well, it was brought to me as a quota pound. That's the way it was originally 2016, kicked around in the gap and in the cab. Uh, so it's always been that way as an idea. And when it came back and, and we were looking at it and talked about it and looked at alternative one that had quota share designated splits, the quota share, if, it, if quota share is designated as any gear, then there's a long-term incentive that that gets sold to fixed gear and we eventually end up with a de facto 29% or whatever, the, or lower percent or whatever it is, percentage works out to be, that just ends up out of the fishery. Whereas with quota pounds, everybody's equal and uh, there's, there's the uh, chance for trades movement around um, and, and still may meet the ultimate purpose and need more in the quota pound format than the quota share. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, further questions of the gap of Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to go back to this collective versus individual issue for a moment. Um, and my question is, um, I had some dialogue with Dr. Seeger here earlier this morning on that issue um, as he made his presentation um talk specifically about um corporations um and i i didn't speak to uh, domestic partners um but the 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 answer that or at least my interpretation of the answer that we got was that um corporations uh, like small LLCs and part, small partnerships, the types of 
organizations that the industry uses or is commonplace amongst the troll and the fixed gear sectors or gear switching uh, participants uh, would not be considered an individual. Um, uh, did you do? Did you understand that or, uh, when you made your um, selection of preferring individual versus the uh, collective? approach and i don't know if it was susan or bob or jeff i don't i think the chair wanted that directed through the chair of the gap and susan could call on others if she needed help sure uh thank you uh mr chair and mr anderson i will take a stab at this one as well i think when we had the discussion in the gap it was generally uh you know thought that the individual approach uh, represented the majority of how the fishery is operating now. Um, but, you know, again, like I said, you know, we still have the opportunity if through the analysis to explore that collective approach a little bit more when we come back in November. Um, and that's why we kind of hedged our bets a little bit there, so to speak, because there was a lot of discussion about it. There was a lot of, um, you know, thinking about it. And so um, that's why we wanted some more exploration of that, just for those reasons you mentioned. Um, but I will leave it to Jeff and Bob. They may have some more um, details on that. Bob. So through the chair, uh, Mr. Anderson, uh, we did ask that question uh, directly to Dr. Seeger and um, particularly how a um, family operation or um, brother and brother, brother and uncle partnership might fall out. And the answer seemed to, to uh, reflect um, a normal business um, process. And, and so we, we, the individual seemed to cover our concerns how the fishing privileges would fall out. Um, but we did hedge our bets as, as Susan has indicated. Jeff, anything to add? No. All right, thank you. Further questions of the gap? Pete Hussmer and then Keely Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks all the members of the gap for this. At I hope I'm not repeating a question that was asked. It's, it pertains to the quota share versus quota pounds split. And under the trawl perspective, there's the alternative three, excuse me while I page through my documents here, um, that would make the, the quota pound split or, or do the split at the quota pounds and under the fixed gear position, they were supporting the Ocean Beat Consulting um, proposal that I think also looked at quota pounds. The, the question is, did the GAP have a discussion at maybe it's a higher level that just simply looked at what are some of the benefits or detriments if the split is made at the quota share level versus the quota pound level in terms of benefits to achieving the purpose and need and what we're trying to get. Is there a difference in, in the way it functions? Um, and I guess, was there some agreement amongst the gap that one versus the other is a better way to go? Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Hassemer. Um, we did have some discussion about it, but since we were considering proposing a third alternative, we, you know, we discussed it, you know, only a little bit, but um, I think Jeff and Bob can answer those questions as well, since both uh, were talking more about quota pounds versus quota shares. So Bob or Jeff. So through the chair, uh, we didn't have a specific debate on this, uh, Mr. Hasselman. We, um, it, it, 
it seems that the quota pounds make things more is easier to 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 deal with as opposed to getting your quota pounds and then having those uh, established as quota shares in um, distinct um, what would they be uh, all gear all, all gear or just trawl gear it just seemed like there was a step that encumbers things by going to quota shares but um, willing to have that discussion again but the quota pounds seemed like it was an easier way to to thread the needle jeff yes thank you the the conversations i had were mostly offline and supporting of the quota pound uh, because the fixed gear side came to their own proposals with the quota pound it's almost like there was we didn't have a wider discussion in in the gap um, if that helps Keely. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chamish, for the, the report um, and the members of the GAP. I had a question about um, the portion of the report for the comments on future analysis. Um, I was wondering if the GAP talked about, um, in particular, when they were writing up the section about um, wanting more analysis of 0% fixed gear attainment, if you talked through the analyses that we've seen in the past on this issue, I think as most recently, was potentially April 2021 um, when there were analyses brought forward about what zero gear switching would look like in the fishery. And just wondering if that was part of your discussion when you wrote that part of the report up. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kent, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, we didn't talk about that too much specifically, um, uh, but I'll defer to Jeff on that since it's under the trawl section of our report. Yes, um, the the discussion. Most of the discussions have been offline uh, on that particular case, and and it, it there is a recognition in talking with other stakeholders that there has been reporting on if you take a uh, species to sable ratio and you extrapolate that out with zero and twenty nine or whatever the numbers are, that you do get some answers, and that analysis has been done. But in uh, respect to all of the items under there, A through E, there's far more complexities to it, and there's far more ebbs and flows that you need to sustain the rough years. Like, for example, D, when, uh, which is like this year, um, I'm sorry, um, C. C, like this year when the, when the whiting fishery is catching a lot of sable, that changes the dynamics uh, a huge amount. And so... Um, analysis that would incorporate all A through E in addition to sort of the the sable to something ratio and extrapolating out something in sort of a, a generic year, looking for a little more wider analysis along those lines. Further questions? Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Susan. Bob and Jeff for a great report here. Um, Susan, I, I'm not sure who could answer this, but it's at the bottom of page four, number two, A, and it's owned by vessel owners as of and since the control date and fished with fixed gear 30,000 pounds in any three pre-control date years. Read this several times, and I'm, I would assume it means in each of three controlled years, pre control pre control date years. But I could also read it to mean the total of thirty thousand. So um, I just want to know if you could clarify that. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Dooley. Um, that again is also under the trawl sector section. So I will defer to Jeff. Intent is 30,000 pounds in each of three years. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and just so it's clear, all those, the, the comments on future analysis are part of the trawl perspective in the report. Is that correct, Susan? Yes, that is correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. Further questions on the gap? I know that... Uh, well, when we come to public comment, some of the same folks will be up. So we'll be able to 
uh, follow up and ask further questions then. So I'm not seeing any other hands. So as I said before, we'll take our break here. We'll be back at 11 o'clock. At that time, we'll start with public comment and the time limits uh, will be three minutes for individuals and six minutes for group. So we'll see you back at 11 o'clock.
All right, it's uh, 11 o'clock, and we have public comment on this agenda item. So why don't we all return to our seats? All right, thanks everyone. We will start with public comment. We have a fair amount and uh, we'll take it on the list we have in front of us. Uh, first is Bob Alverson. Welcome, Bob. And Good just morning. as a reminder, um, we, we're shortening the time a bit here uh, because of the length of public comment up to six minutes for groups and three minutes for individuals. So for the record, Mr. Chairman, my name is Bob Alverson. I'm representing a Fishing Vessel Owners Association out of Seattle. We submitted a written public comment, which is under your uh, um, F5 uh, agenda. And I'm gonna speak specifically to the uh, uh, sub option that we recommended, which is found on uh, I believe the, the second or third page of that, uh, those comments. We suggested the council look at a alternative where 29% of the trawl sable fish um, quota share is just set up as a season. And when um, that is uh, caught, then that particular season ends. And we um, submitted this also to the gap, which they picked up. The, uh, the concern of a, a, a race for fish under this, we, we dismissed to some degree, or, or significantly actually. This 29% um, since the inception of your trawl I, ITQ program um, is probably very close to the historic average. The last five years before COVID, um, which goes 2016 to, to about 2019, uh, we saw record prices up and down the coast for sable fish that also preceded these in increased harvest limits that both in the North Pacific Council and this council um, have provided to the to the industry uh, based on the increasing population of this this resource. Uh, we we do not see a classic race for fish uh, such as we had uh, in the early 2000s for our tiered program where it collapsed to nine day seasons. Um, we see a similar season as we see now with the majority of gear switchers, which account for about 19% of gear switching coming in in the September timeframe and fishing to, uh, to uh, December. And I would imagine those who have bought quota share for this uh, or have quota share and only have ever caught it with fixed gear vessels or fixed gear uh, uh, type of operation, um, would probably be encouraged to to, uh, to get their quota in sometime around August, early September, so they make sure that their investment has been uh, uh, amortized and, and, and caught. Um, one of the concerns we have with alternative one and alternative two is that they are sort of result oriented in that through alternative two, through a permitting uh, mechanism, they um, reduce the amount of, of sable fish to trawl only to at least 71%, perhaps even less than that. And in alternative two through uh, a quota share and a permit, they do, the, do similar. So that 71% is trawl only and is, um, is, does not have the opportunity to participate in the open market. Whereas this 29% option would not provide any super valuable permit because all the permits would be treated equally and the quota would not lose its value because technically as is now, uh, there's always an opportunity for potentially um, uh, gear switching at a uh, higher economic level. So the asset values would not be negatively impacted and neither would you have a supercharged value of a, a permit under what we're proposing here. 
which we see as an issue under alternative one and alternative two. So we'd like to see something as that has a limit that the council has voted on, which was no more than 29%, and something that is more market-based, has some market-based aspects to it. So, Mr. Chairman, that completes our comments. If there's questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Bob. Are there questions of Bob? Corey Niles. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Bob. You said something there that I would, I. And you, I, I think, well, I'm, uh, you, you said alternative two twice, but you meant alternative one, but a distinction I'm not understanding between your, you're just open at the 29% option you want to add versus alternative one, which would create the same amount of quota share, 29%. So uh, am I understanding the difference to be what you're saying is under your option? So. And under either way, there, there'd still be only 29% of quota that could be used with fixed gear. But under the way you're proposing, am I taking you to mean there'd just be more people that you could lease, lease that quota from? Because in either case, I'm saying there's still only 29% of the quota pounds that could be used with fixed gear. Through the chair, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Niles, uh, the 29% is the same. So that result is the same, but uh, the a person holding quota share would not have it designated as a uh, troll only, which can only be delivered probably logically with some other ground fish to, to the processor. Um, currently, you have probably 71% of the trawlers who have never participated in um, in gear switching, but yet their asset value reflects um, uh, the the um, higher value of a, a long line or pot fish um, because they they have the opportunity, even though they don't exercise it, to participate in uh, in uh, fixed gear operations. So our proposal would. Um, would not result in the trawler's asset value being downgraded because it's designated specifically as trawl only. That's, that's the difference. Thank you. Further questions? Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Bob Eater. Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? You bet. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, council members. I'm Bob Etter, a sablefish trap fisherman out of Newport, Oregon. I would say that we, we agree with the GAP report insofar as addressing the questions presented by the staff, but take strong exception to the request for an alternative either uh, alternative to take 29% as just described by Bob Alverson. And this may be attractive in its apparent simplicity, but please keep in mind that we're talking about a possible adjustment to the trawl IQ program, a quota share system this alternative would be inconsistent with the basic philosophies and policies of the greater program that we're operating within. It would be unquestionably regressive. The GMT points this out. They describe that it would create a race for fish. And I agree, having been involved in many races for fish in the past, it would also um, deal with an unknown number of participants. If we were really addressing a problem in this IQ system, why invite more participation? The trial proposed proposal for a third alternative is even worse. Um, as an owner of a substantial amount of quota share to, to compel me to only fish 29% with my chosen, chosen legal gear 
is a horrible idea. The alternative two doesn't need to be so complex. I think once the council makes a decision deciding either ownership of vessel, permit, or quota share, this becomes very doable and clear. It's consistent with the greater IQ program. It represents a management exercise, which the council and NIMPS has done several times in the past, an exercise that the council has muscle memory to accomplish. And NIMPS has already acknowledged that this is doable. One last comment, um, we are grateful for the trawl suggestion to, uh, to analyze their, their last suggestion, number two, under comments for future analysis, to, to analyze the group, of, the group of quota share that is owned by vessel owners and has the 30,000 pounds in, in each year, et cetera. This is a group that we happen to fall into. And I think the, the level of both investment and physical participation is something that should be definitely considered at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Are there questions of Bob? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Bob, for your testimony. Um, I heard you say that the alternative three as presented by the trawl sector is even worse than the other two alternatives. And um, you mentioned being compelled to only fish 29% of the sable quota that you'd be issued is a horrible idea. And, and I just want to ask if you wouldn't mind elaborating on, on that further. I want to make sure I'm understanding that in your view, to be able to prosecute um, your activities the way you do today um, with the, the quota share you have, you would need to be acquiring each year quota pounds from someone else um, on an ongoing basis in order to make yourself whole. Is, is that correct? Um that that is correct um we we lease fish presently we own i think 1.5 percent of the of the northern sable fish quota um we we acquired much of that when we purchased the timmy boy uh, a historical trawl trawl vessel and decided to uh, take our our trial trial IQ fish with fixed gear. Um, so we take a hundred percent of what we own uh, with with fixed gear. So this proposal would say that I would need to only fish twenty nine percent of we of what we have purchased. And as you're aware, Marcy, we're talking about a, an expensive purchase. We we bought. We, we bought a uh, quota share after the program got going, you know, considering it a long-term investment. So to not be able to access our own fish that, that, that we have purchased and owned and fished consistently uh, in this program, uh, if the proposal frankly blows my mind. Thank you. All right, Corey Niles. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and, and thanks, Bob. Um, I'm thinking this, this idea applies to a couple of the options being in the GAP report, but I'm thinking particularly of alternative one, which um, assuming you all would, you, you would meet the gear switching participation criteria would allow you to keep all your quota share as is, as any gear quota. I don't know if you caught the discussion in Q&A with the GAP about the difference between um, having it structured so it's any gear quota share versus some one type of quota share that, and there's two types of quota pounds. The one difference I've 
I heard Jeff Lackey mentioned would, would be that if you did the quota pounds, it would affect the long-term investment climate maybe of, of investing in, in any Greer quota share. Uh, I'll, I'll see that if you're following what, what, what I'm after and, and just wanting to know if you had any opinions on how, what the difference would be if we, if we looked at alternative one as having two types of quota share or just having one type of quota share and two types of quota pounds that derive from it. And I can state that if I was unclear. <laughs> I'm not sure if I do completely <laughs> understand what you're getting at and that complexity. And it, as, I, as I made, made clear, I, I feel that the, the second alternative, creating an endorsement for those who have been, been uh, involved in action and in investment uh, is, is far preferable. Um, and really wouldn't be that that difficult. It would it would deliver an, a known answer every year based on based on uh, quota share, based on history, and that's the direction I'd like to go. I I don't know that I could comment towards your question. I'm very sorry. Oh, fair enough. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that answer. Uh, Jessica. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, Bob, thanks for your public comment. Um, I'm just wanting to hear your perspective. We heard from the gap um, under the fixed year sector perspective, um, a recommendation for council to consider the proposal um, from Ocean Beat Consulting LLC. And so I just wanted to get your viewpoint on that proposal. I'm not fully familiar with uh, with with that proposal. It, it, it's a modification to uh, to an alternative one, correct? Yes, through the chair. Yes, that's correct. And so it's that modification um, where there is quota that is designated troll only, and then it reverts um, to any gear on a specific date. I believe September one is. I, I haven't been fond of, of the uh, the conversion date. Uh, if, if that that's if that's what you're a asking about, Jessica. And again, it, it it creates a compressed time. We fishermen will race one another, whether there's only two of us, you know, or forty, and uh, being able to choose when when to fish. And we, we have fished in the spring, we have fished in the summer, we have fished in the fall. But, um, that, that choice has, has been something that we really enjoyed as IQ participants. And it was my understanding from the start that that's one of the, one of the rationales for creating the program. Um, so I, I'm not really supportive of that. Did I answer your question? You did, thanks Bob, to the chair. All right, are there any more questions for Bob? All right, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, we'll now hear from Paul Clampett, who will be followed by Travis Hunter. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Chair, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Paul Clamp, and I own the fishing vessel Augustine, and I'm the president of the Sable Fish and Halibut Pot Association. Um, we have participated in the Pacific Coast ground fish fisheries for over 40 years using fixed gear. We primarily fish sable fish, but have harvested halibut, rockfish, both directly and as bycatch with sable fish. Our current vessel is the fishing vessel Augustine, which my oldest son operates, and my youngest son is a member, crew member. We purchased a trawl permit and trawl quota as soon as it was possible when Amendment 20 was passed. We saw an opportunity to regain, regain through the purchase of trawl quota what was lost after the last allocation fight in the early 90s when a change in the division of sablefish went from 50% trawl and 50% fixed gear to 58% trawl and 42% fixed gear. Fixed gear, um, is again being punished for being more species specific, even though we have a lower impact on the environment. There's a lot of discussion on how sablefish is constraining 
in the Dover, Dover Thorny Head Sablefish Fishery. Uh, but there isn't any explanation of how it's constraining. Is it constraining because it's needed to catch Dover because they're mixed or our trawlers topping off Dover trips with sablefish and it's not constraining? How can it be constraining if processors have imposed trip limits on Dover salt? These questions haven't been fully answered or studied. We're just, we, we're just expected to assume it's true, in which case limiting gear switching becomes purely an allocation issue that the market should decide. I don't believe gear switching is the cause of their problems, but this is actually an attempt to remove fixed gear competition from the sablefish market in order for them to purchase trawl sablefish at lower rates to gain higher profits. If the lack of sablefish was truly inhibiting their ability to land Dover sole, there wouldn't be trip limits imposed by processors on their deliveries. There wouldn't be 1.8 million pounds of sablefish unharvested in the north and 1.5 million pounds unharvested in the south. The sablefish survey in Alaska shows the possibility of another big year class coming in 2020, and the year classes all the way back to 2014 are still looking strong. There's every indication that this fishery is booming and the quota would be going up. There is no reason to eliminate or curtail gear switching, and if the council deems it necessary to in some way restrict gear switching, it is my belief that anyone who has been involved at any time in gear switching needs to be made whole. We invested in gear switching in good faith. There was no indication that it would be eliminated. And if it is, it will be done completely arbitrarily and to the benefit of a few. Thank you very much. Thank you, <clears throat> Paul. Are questions for Paul? Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Paul, thank you for the testimony. I know today you're representing the Sable Fish and Halibut Pot Association, so just uh, wondering what your association's thoughts are on uh, the Ocean Bee proposal um, and potentially the proposals coming out of the gap or the proposal coming out of the gap. Well, thank you for the question uh, through the chair. Um, well, we are, um, <clears throat> for, our, for all the proposals being um, presented, in our mind, that's the best one. But we, our, well, actually, the best one is no action. We don't believe anything should be done here. But if we have to pick, I mean, that would be above the others, um, but below no action. Corey Niles. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Uh, Chair. And hi, Paul. I've got a couple questions for you. I guess first, why I'm on your answer to Krista, I'm not understanding why that would be preferable to businesses than alternative one, which lets you keep all of your, if you qualify, you keep all your quota share as any gear quota share, you can fish it anytime you want. So if you can clarify why um, the Ocean Beat proposal is preferable in that regard, I would, would love to hear a little more elaboration. But two, I don't know if you've caught this. There's a couple ways to do this quota-based way. One is to have two types of quota share or one type of quota share and then two types of quota pounds, the two types being any gear or trawl only. And just fair enough if you don't, but if you got any opinions on how that might affect you and your operations, uh, I would appreciate hearing those thoughts. And yeah, thanks for being here. Thank, thanks for the question, Corey, and through the chair. Um, you know, the, the problem is, for us, and I may not be answering your question uh, the way you want, but it's it's this whole thing is so overly complicated, and the the years that people have been working in, in this gear switching has been very, um, um, uh, you know, we had the COVID years, we had uh, <clears throat> you know low markets, and and now we have a huge amount of fish. People have been jumping in and out of the fishery because of um, because of um, you know their economic decisions, I just and now we ha we're there's almost three million pounds left on the table here right today. I mean from from 2021, so it it just doesn't make any sense to us that we're limiting gear switching. I mean, where is the problem? All right. Any any further questions? All right, thank you very much, Paul. 
uh, Travis Hunter followed by Paul Kujala. And just uh, folks, if your name is on the list, if you signed up for public comment, please uh, use the Ring Central feature to raise your hand. It'll be much easier for us to find you in the list and enable your microphone. So welcome, Travis. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Gorelnik, members of the council. Uh, for the record, my name is Travis Hunter. I am a uh, third generation trawler based out of Eureka, California, and the bottom trawl rep on the gap. Um, I want to lend my support and agreement um, to the questions or to the answers of the questions uh, in the gap report and lend my support to the trawl perspective on this issue. Um, I've, uh, I, I'm, I won't rehash why I think we're all here now and still discussing this. Um, so I'll just uh, make these more specific. Um, I would like to see um, on all the, the alternatives, the, the two that were posted here and the third proposed alternative, a range of five to 29, um, realizing that um, 29 was intended to be the maximum number and, and not the, the target in my mind. Um, and in, in crafting the, the gap statement, I'm always trying to find where we might have some common ground. You know, we're always trying to get consensus and that's often difficult. So trying to find some common ground and where I thought that we did, uh, and it's not maybe clearly stated because there's some minor differences, are the two alternatives proposed by Ocean Beat and the trawl alternative three. I think the frameworks are similar and, you know, some of the, the details on the, the range and, and I believe a, uh, a conversion date may be different, but I, I think that may be a, a path forward uh, for simplicity's sake, um, you know, a little easier to perhaps wrap everyone's head around where we're, we're trying to go with that. So uh, with that, that concludes my comments. All right, thank you very much, Travis. Questions for Travis? Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you. Just so that I ask everybody fairly similar question. Um, in terms of, of alternative, if we were to include alternative three within, um, how does that fall? And it may be the ocean be alternative three coming out of the trawlers for the gap. I, I have no idea. I don't even know that it'll be there, but um, where would that fall? Um, similar to Mr. Clampett's question um, in terms of, of preference. Do you have any preference personally or with your stakeholder group um, in terms of? Uh, through the chair, Ms. Svensson, um, depending on what the, the number is ends up being if it's low enough that is that would be my preference that was uh when we first started this in in my mind that was the simplest most straightforward path forward to to, to doing this um so to answer your question that depending on on what that number was um that would be that would be my preference would be the alternative three Okay, thank you. And I appreciate it because I realize this would all take the analysis to make any decision on any numbers, but appreciate your feedback on which alternatives. Thank you. All right, further questions uh, for Travis? Uh, with Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Travis, for your public comment. Um, can you please speak to your viewpoint, as you mentioned, was about the gap alternatives and those kind of being a common ground? Can you speak to the use of quota pounds instead of quota share in those alternatives and the reasoning behind that, some of the pros and cons of going with quota pounds over quota shares. Uh, through the chair, uh, Ms. Watson, that wasn't discussed at great length in the gap. Uh, you know, the, the, the ocean beat proposal was, you know, uh, written in public comment and there was no discussion on that. Um, as, as far as, as the trawlers proposed alternative three, 
um, at least in, in, in my mind, at the quota pound level, it, um, it was the simpler way to go. And it also, um, as Jeff Lackey had mentioned before, kind of it keeps it from a, a de facto, um, a, a, a de facto reallocation of, of the quota shares. Thank you. Anything further? Thank you very much, Travis. Thank you. We'll now hear from Paul Quila, followed by Lynn Langford Walton. Uh, good morning. My name is Paul Quila. Good morning, uh, uh, Chair, Council, Staff. Uh, I'm a trawler also from Warrington, Oregon. And I guess I'm not very happy about any of the alternatives. The reason being, um, the way I see it is they all are going to end up limiting me somehow. Um, I am one of the trawlers that fishes year round and I see, I just don't see how this really helps me because they are going to remove some of my flexibility in dealing with quota and going through this program and uh, trying to make it all work. So, you know, there's very differing views on these differing alternatives and what the outcome is going to be and the ramifications. And so I'm going to have to deal with that, you know, for probably forever, sounds like, you know. And so at the same time that we're going through these changes, I'm going to get a lot of my flexibility removed too. Now, to what degree? I don't know yet. It depends on which alternative and the percentages and all that. But I guess to explain myself is um, I own quota, have bought quota or whatever, and, and still buying. But I use, I lease twice as much Petroli than I own, for example. I use whatever I can. That costs a lot of money up front. So I use any kind of quota that I can, if I can get something for that or trade or whatever, then I can offset some of my lease costs. And so anytime you're going to constrain my market for that or put restrictions on what I can or can't do to process my fishery, then I'm not crazy about it. And so <laughs> that's, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm scared because I'm going to have to deal with it and I don't, and I'm scared about the finality of it. And which is why, you know, I've liked the AMP more because you can tweak it and adjust it. Um, so I guess my ask would be that please help me conserve what I'm doing now. And second of all is somehow if there's a way to adjust it, whatever you're going to kind of decisions you're going to make, if there's a way to readjust it, if we're not getting the desired outcome that we want in whatever, then I, I hope there's a way to do that. And uh, well, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Questions for Paul? Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Paul, for being here and your um, testimony. Um, I just wanted to explore with you a little bit to make sure I understand. Um, is it, can I, should I, can I assume that um, some of the sable fish quota share that you own, that you utilize a portion of that in your fishing strategy, and you also, at least at, in some years, use a portion of it uh, to lease, to derive economic value from it, to then apply the revenue from there to buy things like um, petroleum. Is that, am I following that correctly? Um, chair? Uh, yes. Yeah. So your point is if we, if, if the action were to reduce your ability to gain revenue from quota share from sable fish that you have, 
um, and utilize that revenue to buy species such as petroli that better meet the what the processor demands and in, in your markets are that that's going to cause could potentially cause you harm chair yes so i you know we always catch some i could catch it all if i want i don't want to because that's something i can use to get something that's more profitable for me to fish and so you know we ch always are constantly trying to judge i hang on to x amount whatever i think i'm going to need or whatever and which might be a lot and i hang on throughout the year and then i try to readjust and sometimes if i i need to keep fishing all year long bottom fish because i don't go participate in those other fisheries so sometimes it comes to the end where i have to go lease extra in fact i think i did it last year uh, if i overshot what i traded and whatever then i have to lease some back at the end of the year just one more follow-up th thinking about the the alternative that's been proposed about simply having a season and when the 29 percent is caught no more um trawl sable fish quota could be taken with fixed gear um and assume i mean in a in a, an example of where that were to occur by September 1 um, and um, the timing of that could also be a disadvantage to you when you have when you determine that you have um, uh, sable fish for example in the last part of the year that you're not necessarily going to utilize you no longer have the ability to lease it derive revenue and then apply that revenue to purchase or lease pounds like petroleum uh, chair yeah that's yes that's correct because if i know that i'm going to have trouble getting rid of it then i'm going to try to cut it closer you know so i don't eat it on that you know because i you got to put up money up front so i don't like eating it on there and and, and not seeing it get caught so correct you yeah. thanks appreciate you Thank responding you. to those questions Further questions of Paul? Keeley. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I just had a question on part of your testimony. I think you perhaps suggested setting something up similar to AMP, but I'm not sure that I fully caught what you were trying to say. Could you explain a little further what you meant by that? So, uh, Chair, thank you. So, in my mind, and my mind can get changed, but in my mind, I've always liked the part of adaptive management that lets you tweak it from year to year. And so if you make a decision and you end up seeing consequences that you didn't expect, then you can tweak it. And that's, that's kind of, that's what I'm saying. That's what I've always liked about it. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Paul, for coming forward today. It's always good to see you. Um, you talked a little bit about you use some of your sable and you 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 lease some out. Do you have? An, I'm just trying to get a sense of what that is on an average, a percentage of of your what you hold on an you know over the time of the the period here. Is there any sense of what average that you actually used versus leased out as a percentage uh chair um you know without going back actually and looking at my catch i would say it's i'd say that there's and it varies each year because of my encounters and the market but um you know prices and everything but uh i would say half Thank uh, you, Paul. Just a, a guess. Yeah, yeah that, that's good enough. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any further questions for Paul? All right, thank you, Paul. Uh, we'll next hear from Lynn Langford Walton, followed by Lori Steele. And just to give you a heads up, uh, we'll we'll go uh, take as many folks as we can before the, the lunch hour, and then we'll take our lunch and then we'll come back to finish up public comments. So Lynn, are you with us? Uh, I am Mr. Chairman, if you can hear me. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, for the record, my name is Lynn Langford Walton with the All Gear Group, which is a 
affiliated group of partners that are spread across this entire conversation. Um, I want to thank the staff, particularly Jim and Jesse. I think they did a stellar work and their efforts show in how they took a mass of information and laid it out as simply as, as is possible with something that's so complex. And I appreciate it. Um, I support the inclusion of the Ocean Beat Consulting LLC alternative that was introduced um, in public comment and have that incorporated into the, the analysis. I recognize that the makers of the range of alternative motions in September chose not to include that option. I, however, think it's particularly relevant to note that the gap statements have one, one visible common thread, and that is that it is to, an ad, to add analysis of an annual apportionment of, excuse me, of QP. I ask that you do as they asked, and in addition, include the assessment of a range of annual release dates to that assessment. I believe that the consideration, it warrants further detailed analysis as the economic piece moves forward. Um, we'll have better data to assess it against. It also adds scope to the analysis that I am concerned is very narrow. Um, with what we have on the table today. I would like to also reiterate, we've made past requests that the economic analysis going forward is finer scale as it relates to the trawl fleet. The fixed gear fleet tends to be fairly homogenous and it's a little bit easier to detail what they do. The trawl fleet though is extremely differentiated and I think you can identify that pretty well by the volume of landings. And doing that will help inform the council of the vastly different likely impacts across the range of economic resiliency or vulnerability of industry members as we assess the action here, which in my mind is the affordability of North Sable fish. I also suggest we include a robust discussion of how the open market does or does not work as a mechanism I believe that um, the market that we have actually is, is extremely responsive and reflective of what we intended to have happen. Lease rates peaked as did the sale value of quota share when you had some of the highest Sablefish X vessel values that we've seen in, long, in a long, long time, astronomically high. They've dropped Correspondingly, as the ex vessel price and demand for the product has dropped um, to a low in 2021 of 20 cents from a, that previous high of $1.50. The quota share pound was a high of between $18 and $20. And you've had sales recently in the $12 range, and you have offerings today at $8.50. I think that that reflects a market that does indeed understand the circumstances and responds very well to that. I'd also like to take a, a just a brief moment to, to comment relative to the investment and the certainty of investment and return on investment. I absolutely want to see healthy processors, healthy harvesters, healthy communities. Um, I know that the process of representatives have said in the have said in the past, and I believe it's accurate that you're looking at about $15 million, which is a lot of money to get a line in. I would like to mention that we have had vessels and we know of vessels oh, about five years ago, one of ours, one of another in a yard in Oregon that combined did a retrofit. I think it was somewhere in the vicinity of 13.2 to 13.8 million for those two vessels. And there was no certainty as to what those vessels would or would not accomplish when they did that. So if we're looking for certainty, I would ask that we consider that across the range of participants, not one sector only. So in summary, I'd like to ensure that the council analysis going forward is extremely mindful of where and from whom this, this affordable sable fish will come from. 
and not lose sight of the fact that these are families that have dedicated years primarily as businesses that are gonna be on not just the fixed gear side, but on the trawl side. And somebody has to generate this less affordable, or excuse me, more affordable sable fish. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Are there questions for Lynn? Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, appreciate the testimony. Thank you. And um, I know you mentioned the Ocean Beach proposal in there. Has your group, because they are a variety, uh, fixed gear and, and trawl, do they have thoughts or do you have thoughts on that um, versus or in addition to the alternative that came up in the gap? Through the chair, Ms. Svensson, um, I can say that, just to be very clear, um, our perspective for my group is still very similar to what it's been, is that we're still struggling to see something that justifies the action, the need for the action, um, as opposed to a desire for the action, to be clear. Um, we are supportive of the introduction of Michelle Robinson's Ocean Beat because it was a compromise position internally on if we have to go forward, how do we hit something that is more moderate, more reasonable, something we can understand, something that we might be able to coalesce around. And the difference, I think, was primarily in uh, the interestingly common ground that uh, it, the trawl and fixed gear representatives in the gap came to, it sounds like independently and then worked forward um, with those comments or understood that they had in common ground, is the difference between the proposal in the public letter and their comments was the uh, release date. And I did specifically want that my guys would like to see that we're not suggesting that that's going to be something you choose but i do think it adds the opportunity to understand what would happen with qp versus some of the other alternatives um, with better clarity hopefully that answers the question i think so but i think it might lead to one more question of course uh, thank you mr chair um so I understand you have some support for all of this, but I didn't quite get the consensus of if your group still preferred uh, no action over any of this. Um, and, and this is more of a trying to come to a compromise with everybody um, or find a path forward so that we can all get on about our business. To the chair, Ms. Fenson, to be clear, we are still solidly in a no action position. If the discussion has to go forward, we think it's reasonable to start looking for common ground, which has not been available to us in the past. All right, thank you. Further questions of Lynn? All right, thank you very much, Lynn. And next, uh, Laurie Steele. Welcome, Laurie. Good morning, thank you. Um, it's really nice to be here in person and see some of you, see some of the happy faces that I haven't seen in two years. Um, my name is Laurie Steele and I'm the executive director of the West Coast Seafood Processors Association. We represent uh, the vast majority of ground fish uh, shoreside processors um, along the West Coast. This obviously is a tough issue. It's super complicated um, and it is divisive for our industry during a time when we all really need to be standing together. That's become more clear over the last two years than anything else. Um, 
The shoreside processors position has really not changed with respect to this issue and the need for the council to take action to restrict the amount of trawl allocated sable fish that is allowed to be moved out of the trawl sector. In my 26 years of working through council management actions, I've never seen such a complicated and confusing set of alternatives. I support the recommendations of the trawl sector contained in the GAP report. Our shoreside processors continue to try to find markets, try to find workers, and try to find resources to support a year-round ground fish fishery. And we need to be able to get more fish out of the water on a year-round basis. We need certainty and stability. And that comes with taking the choke off of our sable fish allocation. We desperately need this lifeline. Relative to the range of alternatives that the council has before them today, it is imperative for the alternatives and the analysis to incorporate the widest range of limitations up to 29% in order to better understand the impacts of the alternatives and to provide maximum flexibility to the council for decision making. If alternatives one and two both move forward, I think they should both be analyzed with a wide range of percent limitations and I support five to 29% as recommended by the trawl sector gap members. Five to 29% should provide some clear distinctions in the analysis. On its own, 29% or something close to it is too similar to the status quo when you put aside all of the other complexities of the alternatives. Five to 29% provides the necessary contrast for the analysis. Towards the goal of refining and simplifying the range of alternatives, I strongly support inclusion of the third alternative identified in the GAP report. The pro proposed third alternative on page four is simple and straightforward. All of the nuances and complexities in alternatives one and two are going to dampen the ability to differentiate impacts in the analysis and distinguish between the alternatives. The proposed third alternative cuts to the chase and it does exactly what the trawl sector has been asking the council to do for more than five years. Set a clear defined limitation on how much gear switching can occur in any given year. That's all we want. It will provide some certainty and some stability and some clarity and some simplicity. I support this alternative and to address Ms. Benson's question, if it came down to it, I would support this alternative over alternatives one and two for the purposes of simplicity. Um, while in general, I support the control date and utilizing the control date at this point, I support simplicity. I think the council should embrace the third alternative and I think it would be unfortunate if this alternative was not in the mix for the council to consider when decision-making time comes. I also support the comments on future analysis on page four of the GAP report. Those recommendations are intended to facilitate an analytical approach that provides the ability to distinguish between the status quo, the individual alternatives, and the elimination of gear switching altogether. Towards this end, these recommendations are helpful. I want to take a minute to thank the analysts, Jim, Jesse, the GMT, you guys have done an amazing job. Um, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work and analysis has gone into this. And I want to also thank the GAP for their hard work on this issue. The amount of analysis and time and effort that has put us in this place today is staggering. We need to make this easier for everyone involved. We need to streamline and simplify the alternatives to make the council's job easier. And, to, and we need alternatives that accommodate our abilities to identify and understand impacts for decision making. Towards this end, I support, no matter which alternatives move forward, I support analyzing the same range of gear switching limitations across all of the action alternatives, five to 29%. 
And, I'm, and as I stated before, I support the addition of the trawl sector gap recommended third alternative. The bottom line is that limiting, reducing the amount of trawl sable fish allowed to be caught by fixed gear will increase the ability of the fishery to achieve OY. It will sustain the ground fish fishery on a year round basis and it will sustain jobs in our coastal communities. So we need a range of alternatives that will help us do this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lori. Let's see if there are any questions for Lori. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Lori, for your testimony. Um, Want to zoom in a little more on uh, your last point about um, reducing gear switching, having the effect of increasing the OI and increasing the value of the fishery in total. Um, I guess specifically, um, I'm hoping you might address um, something we heard earlier in testimony uh, that there are 1.8 million pounds of unlanded sable fish in the north. Um, I don't know if that number is correct. I don't, I don't know what the portion of that is uh, trawl uh, allocated, but I'm just hoping you can speak to that, that we're not fully utilizing um, the amount of trawl shares that are allocated. Um, and then I'm, I'm also hoping that you can specifically address or, or explain what you mean by um, it's time to take the choke off and we need this lifeline. So I'm looking for concrete, specific what things that you expect to happen um, were gear switching to um, and or be reduced. Um, and then third, um, I'm curious about the folks that you represent, um, the members of West Coast Seafood Processors Association. How many of them buy pot or line caught sable fish and what portion of um, their business portfolio does that represent? Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Um, in general, I guess I would refer back to uh, the testimony that I presented to the council in September of last year. I almost pulled a bunch of that into my testimony today, um, but that really, um, it really sort of highlights where we are in terms of capacity, shoreside processing capacity, and the ability for us to uh, harvest all of the available yield from the fishery. Uh, it, you know, in terms of getting fish out of the water, that's where sable fish comes in as a choke. And without any certainty about how much sable fish is going to bleed out of the trawl sector in a given year, it's been very difficult for the processors to uh, make the investments and really, really dig into what's necessary to get all of that available Dover sole out of the water and sell it in a profitable manner. Um, so I, I guess I would go back to my presentation that I made in 20 in September 2021, uh, which really highlights what would need to be done on our side in order to um, uh, really be able to pull all the fish that are available out of the water. Um, yes, the processors uh, that I represent, several of them are buying uh, fixed gear sable fish, line caught sable fish, um, and they would probably, they will probably always do that um, as long as it's available. But we want to be able to have the ability to process ground fish on a year round basis. And we cannot do that without the volume that Dover Soul provides us. Um, sable fish on its own isn't gonna sustain a year round ground fish fishery. Um, Dover Soul, some of the higher volume species are. So it's part of almost all ground fish processors portfolio, but moving forward in the future, what we would like to see is a much higher volume of other species that are available uh, be a, a much higher part of our portfolio. 
Um, and I'm, I'm sorry not to be more specific, but I would really encourage you to go back and look at the presentation from September 2021. Thanks. Thank you. Did that respond to all your questions? Yeah. Okay. All right, Corey Niles. Thanks, thanks, Lori. Thanks for the testimony. I guess uh, my, my question, and I, right, the task, I have a lot of questions, but the task here is to refine the alternatives and consider adding new ones as you're proposing. But on this idea of that the alternatives are complex, not meaning to be argumentative here, I'm wanting you to help me see something that I'm not seeing, uh, thinking of alternative one. So the policy decisions that we're facing if, if as we continue this are one, to limit gear switching or not? If so, do we use a quota based system or do we use a permit or vessel endorsement? So, on the quota based um, option, as I, I kind of went over in the WFD report, there's there are just two, there's one main question on um, how we recognize gear switching, how much, how much landing activity would be needed to demonstrate that. So, uh, 30,000 pounds for three years or just any kind of landing. And then two, with the remainder that's over, should it be given just to active bottom trawlers or, or just to the remaining, all remaining quota share? And then three, like you're getting at, we, we also thought um, we should look at the 29% a little bit closer, but around the edges, but you're suggesting a bigger range. So to me, that's those, two, those three simple two questions and then look at the 29%, which you're asking for a bigger look, which I totally understand your argument for, but where is the complexity and that I guess is what why is that complex is, is a question and maybe it's not a fair question but it's it's just two questions two two choices uh two sets of choices in, in my mind and um yeah I know you have a lot of experience in, in the New England East Coast area which I always pre appreciate hearing from but yeah not being not trying to debate but I'm how, please help yeah well thank you um I mean, when you say it like that, <laughs> it sounds so much less complex. Um, but I guess in response, you know, we've got 15 questions that, you know, need to be answered relative to alternatives one and two that sort of highlight where you can really get down into the weeds on some of this stuff and it gets very complicated. Um, I guess in you know in response overall, and and somebody addressed this in their earlier remarks, um, or in an in an earlier, I think Travis addressed this in in an, in a response to the question. I mean, one of the things that's appealing to me about the third alternative is that it's focused on quota pounds instead of quota share. And I think when you start getting into the quota share, no matter what, um, it gets super complicated in terms of reallocations, ownership issues, um, things like that. So that's one of the things that appeals to me about the third alternative is just the, the simplicity of, of dealing on an annual basis with the distribution of, of quota pounds. Um, I mean, if we can approach the other alternatives with a, a sort of a, a sim, more simple overview of just the policy decisions, then I guess I can't really argue with you. Um, but somehow we've gotten astray of that. And when you read the alternatives and you start looking at some of the questions and the minutia of some of the decisions that need to be made, it gets, it gets just overwhelming. Thank you. <clears throat> Further questions? Thank you, Lori. So it is uh, 1204. Uh, I think we'll take our break now. We have five more folks to uh, offer public comment. So let's be back at uh, 115 and we'll take the rest of uh, public comment and then probably um, uh, recess this agenda item because it'll be back on our agenda uh, tomorrow. All right, so we'll see you back at 115.
All right, welcome back. Why doesn't uh, why don't we all grab a seat? And we'll continue with public comment. As a reminder, if you have submitted a card to speak and you haven't yet spoken, uh, raise your hand uh, using that function in Ring Central so that we can enable your microphone. Okay, uh, we have five more public speakers. We'll start with John Gonzalez and then Tim Hobbs. Welcome, John. So, John, we're not hearing you. I see that your hand is raised and I see that you're enabled. Why don't we um, looking? So, why don't we'll, we'll come back to you, um, John? Don't go away. Uh, Tim Hobbs, are you with us? Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Welcome. Great. Uh, thank you, Chair and, and members of the Council. Uh, my name is Tim Hobbs. I'm an attorney with the law firm of k &L Gates, and I represent Jim Sievers and Jeff Lackey, uh, representatives of the trawl sector. I would like to ad uh, briefly address two legal issues with respect to gear switching. The first has to do with NEPA and the range of alternatives. An alternative that would accomplish the council's objectives should be included in the range or the council should provide a rational justification for why it's excluding that alternative from consideration. Our understanding is that the 29% limit is a ceiling, not a floor. And some testimony and analysis suggests that lower levels of gear switching, lower than 29%, could better accomplish the council's objectives. Alternative two would look at limits from roughly 5% to 29%. Um, and we recommend that the council also look at a similar range for alternative one um, so that there are comparable analyses with respect to both alternatives. And the same would apply with respect to, to the third alternative that, has, um, that, that was discussed in the gap report, um, which also seems like a simpler alternative, um, which may aid in consideration. And if the council is thinking about incorporating uh, even some of that alternative um, into uh, a future decision, it would be prudent to include that now for purposes of, of analysis. The second issue I'd like to address has to do with National Standard 4 and the requirement that allocations be fair and equitable. We agree that the council must weigh the benefits versus the costs and rationally conclude that limiting gear switching will maximize overall benefits. In considering the benefits of limiting gear switching, the touchstone of the council's analysis must be on achieving optimum yield and FMP objectives. The National Standard 4 guidelines are clear on that point. They say that an allocation should ra be rationally connected to the achievement of optimum yield or with the furtherance of a legitimate FMP objective. In addition to achieving OY, relevant FMP objectives here include six, seven, and nine to achieve the greatest possible net economic benefit to the nation, to establish policies that extend fishing and marketing opportunities as long as practicable during the fishing year, and to foster full utilization, harvesting and processing of ground fish resources. In that regard, the benefits of limited gear switching are not merely to provide a more attractive business climate for processors. It's important to carry that further and to explain that the point of that is to improve the business. The point of improving the business climate is to better achieve optimum yield for underutilized species that are caught with trawl gear along with sablefish. That is why limiting gear switching is rationally connected to the achievement of optimum yield and the FMP objectives I just talked about. 
We've recognized from the outset that there's some uncertainty about these benefits. The council can create favorable conditions by stabilizing the trawl sector and closing a loophole that creates uncertainty about how much of a potentially constraining species will be available to get other species out of the water along with it. Prior testimony has explained how increased certainty should spur business planning, market development, and investments needed to better achieve OY and FMP objectives. But there are no guarantees, and in managing fisheries, there rarely are. And by the same token, the disadvantages to gear switchers are also difficult to project with certainty. The number of gear switching vessels has been declining so that any limits may be affecting a smaller number of participants in the future. And whatever quota pounds may have been leased by gear switchers in prior years is no guarantee that the same level of leasing would continue into the future. Ultimately, the council must exercise what courts call administrative judgment in the face of all of these acknowledged uncertainties. But in exercising that judgment, the foundational purpose must be rationally connected with achieving OY and FMP objectives. Mitigating disadvantages for gear switchers by setting a limit at the higher end of the range, around 29%, must be weighed against the potential ongoing underattainment and the effects on the capacity of the overall fishery to achieve optimum yield for various stocks. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for your comment. Let me see if there are any questions from around the council table. Corey Niles. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the testimony uh, and really appreciate you uh, addressing the um, some of the thoughts we put out there, what's in our mind at WFW on, on how we weigh this choice and, and, and you know, putting out there is our current understanding. And so thank you for, for um, taking some of those considerations head on and, and then speaking to those. I really hope we get more to that at, at the next stages because um, I think you are thinking about it very similarly in terms of how the national standard guidelines help frame us frame this this choice for the council so i guess you, you you cut out a little bit at the beginning just a very tiny bit on your i think your nepa point um but i think i got it but just maybe you could respond to this question on on the suggestion that um alternative one could be could could have a range of, of five to 29 percent so i guess uh, just a, a re something for you to react to and maybe i'll just make the argument and you can say if it's correct but uh, five percent, um, you know, NEPA. You need you, you the range of alternatives. The reasonableness of the range has to do with the purpose and need ach achieving the purpose and need. The council's purpose and need is to create a limit gear switching, but respecting investments made. So I think uh, September was a long time ago. But the reason why we we didn't put a, a, a lower percentage in there is because it didn't seem to make meet that purpose and need. Uh, of respecting uh, of uh, respecting investments made, but would you was you, your argument then the five percent would be justifiable under national standard four because the benefits are great enough um, to reduce the respect given? And I'm not choosing my words here carefully, so I'm not you know would would it would be able to disadvantage people more because the benefits are justifiable justifiably high enough? And sorry, that was kind of a long-winded question, but if you had any reactions to that. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think, well, one, I, I, I'm if the council is going to not consider a, you know, a, a limit, you know, lower than 29% for alternative one, I think it needs to explain why it's making that choice. And I'm not aware that the council has sufficiently explained yet why, why it would not consider something less than 29% for alternative one. Um, I do think uh, that there that the that the council could conclude that the benefits of selecting, let's say, five percent, could outweigh the disadvantages. Um, but that's going to depend upon an assessment of looking at the overall benefits, looking at the capacity to achieve uh, optimum yield, and what would the overall effect be? What would the what would the economic effects you know be if the council was successful? Um, you know, in maximally successful in pursuing these uh, the, these limitations. 
So I think that it's certainly possible that the council could rationally conclude that that limiting gear switching to 5%, maybe even phasing it out, as, as there's been some discussion of that, um, could be outweighed by overall benefits to the fishery in uh, maintaining the capacity to to you know increase attainment and achieve optimum yield. Thank you. That was helpful. Further questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we'll give John Gonzalez a shout. John, are you with us? I am here. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Members of the council, can you hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear. Welcome. Excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, just for the record, my name is John Gonzalez. I'm the fisheries policy specialist at Pacific Seafood. And just uh, going to keep this really short here in the interest of time and um, voice our support for the trawl sec sector perspective uh, portion of the gap report um, specifically. Um, just uh, supporting that the council keep the whole, you know, five to 29% range intact on alternative two, uh, which was prescribed in the September 2021 motion that passed and is also um, uh, the rationale that was inherently in memorialized in the transcripts from that meeting as well. So uh, just going to keep it really short, keep it at that. And uh, again, voice our support for the trawl sector perspective portion of the report. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, John. Are there any questions of John? All right. Thank you, John. Uh, Brian Blake, followed by Kevin Dunn. You got me? Uh, all right. Got you. Uh, this is Brian Blake with Ocean Gold, Westport, Washington. Uh, we've made an investment in, uh, in uh, a Dover line. Uh, both the fillet machinery and freezer capacity, and we uh, we need uh, uh, access to the black cod quota to continue that investment. This market has great potential, and uh, reports I was getting this morning from the ocean are uh, about a four to one ratio over to black cod encountered, and so this is pretty critical. And with that, in the interest of brevity, uh, we support the trawl sector uh, statement in, from the GAP statement. And thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Brian. Are there any questions of Brian? Thank you, Brian. Uh, Kevin uh, Dunn, followed by Jeff Lackey. Welcome, Kevin. <laughs> Am I live? Are you? I am. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, council members. I probably don't need to yell. For the record, my name is Kevin Dunn. I operate a 12 month a year trawler, the fishing vessel Iron Lady, out of Warrington, and we deliver to Bornstein Seafoods. I don't have much to say publicly. I've been part of the Community Advisory Board. I've been on the SAMTAC, and I have listened to an awful lot of discussion about this topic. We seem to have made it about as complex as anything could be. I see I got three minutes, everybody else got six. Um, there you go, quota. Um, I, I support the gap statement. I like alternative three. And one of the questions been asked a few times is about the surplus sable fish left at the end of the year. I don't know how many people understand how complex it is to run a boat for the year, fish to zero, which wasn't part of the program, encounter weather, crab seasons, processors with workforce issues. So last year you had one of those storms. November was horrendous. Unbeknownst to anybody, crab season went off on December 1st. 
my processor can't do bottom fish and crab at the same time for workforce issues. Is that the reason it was all left on the ground? It's the reason a lot of it was left on the ground. And you never know. You don't, you have many different variables that come into why there's some left at the end of the year and why there isn't. I think that concludes my testimony. If anybody has any questions. Thank you very much, Kevin. Are there questions of Kevin? Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for your testimony, Kevin. I, I think it really helps clarify um, some of the issues around that window at the end of the year and, and catchability for everybody. Um, but I have asked all of the other guys that have not clearly talked about uh, the alternative out of the gap um, or the ocean be kind of where that falls in in the picture for you in terms of the alternatives that have been proposed in in terms of getting analysis. So just would like to hear your thoughts on that as well. Through the chair, Ms. Vinson. Um, if I understand it right, <clears throat> excuse me. What was the question again? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to cough and distract you. Um, so the question was just uh, your thoughts around uh, the trial alternative in gaps in the gap report um, and the ocean bee proposal um, and kind of where they stacked up in terms of, of how this would work for your business and other small to mid-size uh, shore-based 12 month a year trawlers. We'll shoot again. Uh, the Ocean Butte or Ocean Beat paper. I'm not real fond of the conversion date. Um, I hear race for fish all the time. Everything's a race for fish. I, we don't have enough time in the day. Um, as to where it fits in with me this year, I don't know. It may be different next year. I, I, I like the ability of doling out the quota as alternative three or even ocean beat. I'm just not fond of the conversion date and the end. I know the data shows a lot of it is caught after September, but I, I, I don't know how it would impact me. I'm just not fond of the conversion date. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Kevin. Um, Similar kind of question to what I asked of Paul Coyle here a bit ago about uh, the importance, relative importance to your operation to be able to have flexibility to trade fish, be it table fish or petroleum or whatever it might be. But uh, given that we're focusing on sable fish here, that ability to have that flexibility in terms of meeting your kind of your business model and your business plan. Um, can you just give me some, give us some sense of how important that is to have that flexibility throughout the year, uh, as opposed to maybe having it through a portion of the year and then at the, back, the end of the year, no longer having it. Through the chair, Mr. Anderson. Um, at the beginning of this battle, I traded an awful lot of my sable fish. I, I do each year for petrol sole. I'm a more focused flat fish boat. I think I've hit the vessel cap many years and I've tried to concentrate less on the sable fish part of it to have it to add for trading. Um, the value of those species for trade has changed over the years, but nonetheless, I, I go into the year thinking I can get rid of X amount of sable and acquire X amount of petroleum. Um, we end up having to lease over 100, 125,000 pounds of petroleum every year to get to the cap. The name of the game in our operation and my owner's operation is we try to exchange as little money as possible and do it all through trading. So I, I very much need that flexibility to trade my sable if necessary to acquire other more desirable, profitable fish for me. 
Go ahead. Thanks, uh, Mr. Dunn. Uh, if you're calling me Mr. Anderson, I'm calling you Mr. Dunn. <laughs> um, and on the, just to, to put a point of emphasis on your previous point having to do with this idea that there were about the leftover fish, and I, I'm thinking, I can't remember the number, 1.9 or something like that this year. There's a lot that goes into that. Um, I mean, to, 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 um, to manage it to zero um, and, and not run the risk of not having anything available in the last month or two of the year is just about impossible, would seem to me. Um, and then when you add in the, the unknown variables of weather and crab fishery and your um, processor capacity to do um, um, multiple species at the end of the year, that there's going to be some years when you have some left over. And, and there's going to be other years where you're close to running out. Is that a fair assessment of kind of what you were explaining? Through the chair, Phil. <laughs> it, it, it is. I mean, it's just, it's a balancing act. I'm, some people do great at some things, and we just try to balance and get to the end of the year. And as a crabber knows, they never know when they're going to start. Um, I'm sure this year they'll plan on December 1st, and it'll go to February. I mean, I just... You never know, but you do need to get the fish to the end, and and that's always the game. You have to have Sable being one of my traders, and you have to try and get your petroli to the end of the year. So it's it's just a game. Thanks. Corey Niles. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and um, thanks, Kevin. I guess I just... This may, may not be a fair question, but I hear you all, everyone talking about the complexity of alternative one, which I kind of think is the aim was to change the IFQ program as little as possible. I was around, I, I was around during development of Amendment 20 and Amendment 21, and I remember how complicated that is. I, I see, I don't know that how you all manage 20 different quota types and uh, along these lines of, of what you uh, you were talking about with Mr. Anderson, but it seems that you prefer the flexibility of the, of the IFQ program over the triple mit program. And I guess just would it be fair to say the, the complexity of the, of the IFQ program and developing it, do you, do you prefer the IFQ program over the triple mit fishery is, is what I'm kind of getting at and was the complexity of, of developing it worth it? Maybe a weird way of answering the question, but has the IFQ program provided you with more flexibility than, than you used to have before it existed? Mr. Chair, Mr. Niles, if you're asking me if tomorrow I would go back to the two-month limit, the answer is yes. All right. Further questions? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm trying to, I'm thinking about your testimony. I'm thinking about Paul Quayle's testimony. Um, I'm thinking about your remark that you like alternative three. Um, and yet I hear Paul saying he doesn't particularly like any of them. But it sounds to me like you prefer all three over status quo. But yet it is likely to, in some ways, limit your flexibility some. But maybe you can speak to why you prefer Alt-3 over status quo, because it, I mean, does it put more money in your pocket because it limits gear switchers? Does it, like, what is the benefit of Alt-3 over status quo? Mr. Chair, Marcy, um, I guess I, my opinion, the complexities seem to have come in trying to address everybody's wants and needs. Um, I, I felt that just awarding QP was a most simplistic approach. Status quo, I'm not quite sure where it would go, unlimited. 
Um, I, I, I don't know what else I have to offer you. If, if something is going to be done, and Paul and I would probably certainly have different opinions as to the complexity of this issue. Um, he is the boat owner. I am a boat operator. I manage the quota for the owner. So it's possible we have different opinions on where that's going to go. And Paul's younger than I. So I, I, I don't know that I can answer your question specifically the way you want. But I know everybody has different opinions, and I just liked the simplicity of alternative three on the gap statement. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Kevin, for your testimony today. Um, I'll just follow up the same question I asked Paul earlier. Um, on an average, throughout this period of time that we've had a catch air program. How much of your, uh, as a percentage, have you leased or, or traded of your sable fish annually? Mr. Chair, Mr. Dooley, do you know it's actually, when you ask that of Paul, mine's kind of changed, but probably for different reasons. Um, you may or may not know I've been through three different processors in the last few years and different processors have different wants and needs and that changes what I have to do. Um, this year with the abundance of Sable, I am probably gonna have to lease it in for the first time. Um, however you wanna gather that, I mean, did it come quicker in the deep? Yes, it did. Did I have some oopses on the beach? Yes, I did. I'm eating it up faster. So I will have to lease, patro or lease black cod in. Static, for the most part, I would say I'm in the 50-50, 60-40 range. This year is a different year for me. Thanks, Kevin. That's great. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further questions? Uh, Kevin Dunn. Kevin, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now, our last uh, public speaker, Jeff Lackey. Welcome, Jeff. Yes, thank you. My name is Jeff Lackey. I manage two trawlers out of Newport. Previous speakers have made a good case for proposed alternative three. The alternative itself and its 5 to 29 range could be important tools for the council to have as it, at its disposal in full or in part come PPA and FPA. Previous speakers have made a good case for a wide range in alternatives, five to 29%, to provide robust analysis useful to compare and contrast. I advocate for adoption as guidance, the gap report, trawl section recommendation for future analysis. These items are necessary to give a fuller context and dynamic real world application of the issues before us. Now to speak on the fishery and its future. I talked to a fisherman recently about this subject who said two things that really struck with me. First thing, with gear switching, the council is deciding what the trawl fishery is going to look like for the next 20, 30, 40 years for future generations. The second thing, we lack fisheries with capacity for expansion with the exception of ground fish with Dover sole as a major driver. Sable fish is financially and logistically critical for that expansion. These two things cut through this process to get to the long-term reality. The bottom line is that the amount of trawl sable fish quota going to fixed gear is indirectly proportional to the long-term capacity of the program and fishery to achieve OI, maximize employment to communities, and maximize food production for the nation. Ocean Gold isn't the only processor investing in infrastructure, machines, and fillet lines, looking at more investments, I am potential USDA mass purchases, working on market development, and all but eliminating trip limits for some periods. If they are even partially successful in these endeavors, and in addition, tap more of the whole coast vast resource, all of the trawl sable quota, even with zero gear switching, would ultimately not be sufficient in the long run to facilitate the potential of the fishery. The 2022 trawl sable north catch is off the charts compared to previous years. 2.6 million pounds through the end of May, 
after not going above 2 million pounds in the last several years. There is no sable left on the auction website as of this morning. Sable is the lifeblood of the future fishery and its impact fluctuates year to year, sometimes in unexpected ways. Finally, zero gear switching has the greatest potential to lift the value of all individual trawlers assets, even for a petroleum centric boat that occasionally has excess sable quota. Uh, the dynamic that I've heard explained over the years as I've watched particularly the last four or five years unfold and the lease price go down and fixed gear come in and out of the fishery when it is uh, more viable or less viable and then to contemplate the future capacity of the fishery, I've come to the conclusion that the exact opposite dynamic is true. The greatest value to every trawl fisherman and the value of all of their assets, boat, all species, quota, everything, is, is a healthy fishery, and that is less and less fixed gear. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Jeff. Are there questions for Jeff on his public testimony? All right, thank you very much, Jeff. Well, we have this agenda item set for uh, tomorrow, um, but maybe before we recess the agenda item, um, we can have an opportunity for council members to address any questions or seek any clarification from council staff or maybe uh, put out some initial thoughts, keeping in mind that we'll have our uh, more lengthy discussion and motion practice uh, tomorrow. Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess my question is for um, Dr. Seeger and Ms. Doreen House. Um, one of the points of emphasis, um, at least that I took away from your uh, your your introduction of where we are. And I think it was also picked up in the GMT report is the importance of making substantial progress relative to the analysis over the summer so that we can be in a position to stay on track with our schedule uh, of making a decision and um, further refining that decision in September and then looking ahead, I think it is to April for an FPA. Uh, you've posed a number of questions to, to all of us, uh, the, the committee, the public, the committees, um, the council uh, that I interpreted um, as needing to be answered in order to put you, you and, and your, your colleagues in a place where you can make um, that progress on the analysis is, that, that will put us in a position to make an informed decision in September. Um, so I want to check to make sure that, that you know, I, th I think there were 15 questions, but, uh, and I think there were maybe a couple of them as the discussion ensued both here as well as in the gap in the GMT that, that either, well, that, that may have uh, taken on a little bit uh, different uh, flavor in terms of the importance of answering those in a, in a final way at this meeting. So it would be good to know what those are. Um, I th think uh, some of the discussion around um, the collective versus individual is, is an example of, of, of one of those perhaps. Um, so I want to make sure that, you know, that I, that, that I understand correctly that, uh, getting those key questions answered is a, is imperative in order for us to, to stay on schedule. Uh, and that there was, I think there, it was certainly expressed in the GMT report pretty directly that if we don't stay on track here and, um, and we, we, and we don't get the kind of make the kind of progress between now and September that um, um, there's a risk that it could be delayed for some period of time because it will begin to conflict with some other 
uh, uh, kind of obligatory, mandatory things that we need to do. So um, the the import again, they're just em emphasizing uh, and ensuring that I have clarity and the council has clarity on the importance of getting answers to the to these questions. Um, so I I had one other thought that maybe if if I could ask for Dr. Seeger and Ms. Dorbinghouse's thoughts on on that and make sure that I have that right, so we have an understanding of that. Oh, I know what the other one was. Um, I think between the different perspectives that were offered in the gap report, um, that there are is three, potentially three additional alternatives that are being suggested uh, that we add uh, to the to the to the ones that we currently have. And I uh, I also um, understood from um, your presentation and I think in some of the written material that you provided that adding additional alternatives here uh, uh, it could be problematic. Uh, maybe could is maybe should be would um, in terms of of getting the analysis completed to the point where we can make that informed decision in September. And obviously you've had an opportunity to hear um, some of the specifics of those three alternatives and any feedback you might be able to give us on your thoughts about the degree to which that would complicate um, your ability to, to complete the uh, analytical work uh, over the time frame that we have would also be helpful so we so we don't end up walking out of here with a a um, a workload that is simply not achievable um, and there thereby would put us in a bad position in September dr. Seeger <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Anderson. Uh, I'll start uh, by talking about the questions uh, part of that, and then I'll uh, turn to Ms. Dorbinghouse here uh, for talking about some of the implications of uh, new alternatives for, for the analysis. Um, with respect to the questions, uh, I think we need most of them answered. You were asking about kind of maybe there were a couple that were uh, less important. You know, the big one is the um, collective versus individual approach, which covers the first six questions. Uh, I think that does need to be resolved. Uh, it, those do need to be resolved in order to move forward. Uh, then we had three other in association with alternative one. We had three other questions that were were pretty minor, and, and one of them was just a calculation. I apologize in some ways for even bringing that to you because it, it's uh, something we probably could have handled. And, and uh, anyway, so the question seven, eight, and nine. Uh, number seven was the trust NGO question, pretty straightforward. Eight was the one about this calculation thing that's also very straightforward. Uh, nine was the modification of the quota share control limit and the annual vessel quota panel limit. That was the one I said that, yeah, we could walk out of here without that and, and still uh, stay on track. Uh, however, you do have a consensus recommendation between the GAP and the GMT on that to, uh, to work with. Then with respect to the um, alternative two questions, uh, let's see, the first one, yeah, we do need to resolve the circumvention issue and, and if and how you want to handle that, that's question 10. Uh, we do need to take care of the one to many, many to many uh, questions. Um, that's questions 11 and 12. Uh, and then the, the three issues that are on slide 50 you're looking at, those other issues to consider. Uh, the AMP should be addressed. Uh, the, uh, the, the partial year issue uh, for the uh, allocation uh, needs to be addressed. And then, oops. Uh, and then the, the, the final one there, number 15, on whether you specify for the uh, non-endorsed trawl permits, if that's specified as 10,000 pounds or percentage or the lesser of kind of a thing, that one could could slide. I don't think that would have a major uh, implication on things. Uh, with respect to the need to stay on schedule, so right now the council's expected to pick up with the next trawl sector review. You pick that up in the September for first meeting. 
Um, we don't necessarily need to pick up the um, trawl alloc, uh, excuse me, we don't necessarily need to pick up the heavy lift on that uh, right away. I mean, you could wait, you know, to uh, pick up the heavy lift on that till sometime in maybe the early part of the next year. And the point I'm making there is that, um, uh, so this is scheduled to next come for, for the council in November. We need to get everything together by early October for that November meeting. Um, if for some reason this gets delayed uh, and because of the workload or other things, um, we aren't able to move on it until next March, essentially we would then have to delay the heavy lift on the trawl sec catch trawl program review until sometime after we complete all of the work on this so you could kind of get it started but we wouldn't be able to do a lot of work on it until we complete the gear switching part of that um and uh, let ms dorpinghaus uh, talk about that as well as that point that's fine i just need to know on that yeah, question <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I guess in terms of adding alternatives, so the ones related to the quota pound alternative that are kind of this similar in nature to the SAMTAC alternative one, we do have some underlying pass analysis to help inform that. That being said, we are on a crunch timeline. And so adding in any kind of alternative is definitely raises concerns on my end outside of just being able to analyze the two alternatives in front of us and get to the level of um, impact analysis that I think everybody is wanting to see on who might be affected, which ports might be affected and, and that level of detail to be able to take a and potentially select a PPA in November. So I guess I'll say that in terms of adding a new alternative and then, you know, the degree to which there's options and sub options of that alternative, of course, you can multiply that, that impact. Um, there was a couple of suggestions in the gap report. And, you know, I think when we initially came into this meeting, it was like really needing to pick this whole individual or collective and, and kind of go with it. And I know the gap mentioned in their report that they were um, recommending the individual approach, but would like some information on the collective approach. I've done a, a minor bit of digging um, because I've had some time this meeting and I think that there um, we could bring that type of analysis back for November of, of how people might be impacted. I've only really looked at gear switching entities, um, but not gone any farther than that to look at the IFQ participation option, for example, with the bottom trial impact. So I think we could manage to get into some discussion around the collective versus individual, because I do know that that may or may not impact uh, certain corporations or businesses or things like that. And having that in front of you would um, help with the decision. But I do think it would be important to establish the answers to the collective question so that we could truly evaluate, here's what an individual approach looks like, here's what the collective approach looks like, because we can't have it still be open-ended. Hopefully that answers some, and Jim has more to add. <laughs> I've got the button pushed. It says green, I think. Yeah, there we go. Um, so as the GAP was working on this individual and collective approach, there were some questions and some a little bit of uncertainty. And so what we told the GAP is that, that and, and based on their discussion, sounded like they were kind of like 90% certain they wanted to go with the individual approach. And we said one of the things we could do is move ahead with the individual approach, move full force ahead with the analysis on the individual approach but also bring back, because we need to document this anyway, the contrast between the individual and the collective approach. And that's what on their report under the summary of responses, the second paragraph where it says, additionally, the gap would like to see a high level analysis that further indicates how the individual approach varies from the collective approach. 
that's what that was about. So our plan is to go ahead and bring that contrast back just to confirm if, if you go with the individual approach here, just to confirm that that was the right and there's not some big surprise like, oh my gosh, this performs in a totally different way. And the understanding was that if we did bring it back and there would be a, and there was a surprise, then we would have to regroup and possibly change direction at that point. But in general, there was comfort with the individual approach, with the understanding they'd have a chance to just check it out and make sure. Go ahead, Phil. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for those responses. Um, and I, one of the reasons I was probing a bit on this collective versus individual is I saw what been read and heard what the gap was recommending as he reflected on the individual. And then when I was asking how their businesses were put together, I got a different, I got an answer that didn't make sense with that choice. I got an answer that, well, there's a number of different partnerships between family members or there's LLCs, there's uh, corporations that, that own, and, and, and there was a lot of similarities, at least initially thought between uh, uh, on the trawl side versus the fixed gear side in terms of how the ownerships were structured. And it wasn't, it didn't make sense to me that then you would pick the individual. So I totally, I understand why they would want to have an opportunity, why we should all maybe, to the extent we can, maintain the opportunity to look at both of those to make sure we're picking one that fits the way that these are, businesses are organized. So, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, my understanding from uh, their discussion, and I understand how it was described here, is that while there are differences in, in the way, for example, that the quota share ownership uh, is organized versus the, the way they organize their the ownership of a uh, of a vessel, so maybe one is an LLC and the other is a corporation or a partnership, that even though there are differences there between the, how the families may organize themselves, that the Owners, when you go below the surface on the LLC and below the surface in the partnership, you still have the same individuals involved on both sides. That's my understanding of their discussion and how they reach the comfort. So that has that diversity you're talking about, but at the individual level, there's the commonality. Um, and that's what we part of what we then explore. And then I think uh, the point Ms. Dorbinghouse is making was that um, if we are going to explore the collective approach as described here, that we would kind of need to know how to look at it. Uh, we do have the recommendations of the gap here that we could just simply follow in this preliminary analysis to bring that back to you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Further, uh, uh, Keely Kent. Thank you. Um, I have another question for council staff. Um, you know, in looking at this action, the council is really looking at developing a mechanism for how the privilege for gear switching is allocated. But another comparison point based on how alts one and two are structured right now is how we recognize what the investment independence in gear switching is. And I'm wondering from your perspective, would it be feasible, like reasonable, <laughs> reasonably feasible to look at a common set of qualification criteria between alternatives one and two, so that when we come back to this the next time, we're really seeing a clear comparison between those mechanisms, so we can really evaluate the benefits and costs rather than being a little bit set up to look at apples and oranges between different qualification criteria. Mr. Chair, Ms. Kent. So analytically, that makes a lot of sense. That being said, it does, again, I hate, I'm like broken record here, workload does increase because we still have to work through the, the, yeah, I can establish, you know, who gets qualified under XYZ qualification alternative, but then actually figuring out how that is impacted under alternative one versus alternative two is a very different 
type of discussion to have because one, you're granting it to, you're, you're affecting the quota share holder and the other one you're affecting a vessel or a permit limit. So there is definite benefits in the analytical being able to compare them, but I mean, that does add complexity in terms of the analysis to have the same set of qualifying requirements, if that makes sense. Go ahead. Yes, that does make sense. I guess the one um, follow-up I would ask is, you know, thinking about thinking globally about benefits and costs that will look at the benefits and costs to the individuals that do or do not receive privileges, the benefits and costs to the fishery as a whole, to coastal communities, net benefit to the nation, that there'll be, there's a variety of levels that will look at that. I certainly understand what you're saying about from the individual level. I don't know if your answer changes at all when trying to think about those other levels of effects that we'll be trying to pull out. Um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, um, Ms. Kent, um, in terms of, you know, the, at the individual level, a lot of the impact comes through the, the first initial allocation, right? Uh, and then as the program runs over time, the impact is really sort of the different ways the program is set up, whether it's a, a, a quota share, gear specific quota share versus a, a permit. And I think, and uh, I'd like to get Ms. Dorpinghouse's opinion on this as well. Um, I think that that um, over the long haul, those the, the way the program actually functions, you would get a good contrast on that without needing to have the um, the qualification alternatives be be compared. But the qualification alternatives, you get that apples and oranges on that that short term initial impacts at the individual level. Corey. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, back on the topic that Phil was was after, um, we put the WW report out there. We heard the gap uh, as responses. I, um, I I think I'm not seeing a high level of comprehension and understanding of all the scenarios and in and, and wanting to hedge bets, as they said. And I agree. But I guess uh, I, I haven't changed my mind too much from what's in that WDFW report. And so I'm not wanting to stay here too much longer, but I'm not totally grasping what the difference between what you're looking for in terms of if we were to say, just kind of flip it around from the gap, start with the entity, don't look at the individuals underlying it unless you see an unfairness situation, bring those back. Um, what else you'd need to know to take it that way. But I, I don't think it matters too much. Like you said, you're gonna compare and contrast them. But I do continue to think the collective approach is simple. And just here's a, it, it, we see people were just overwhelmed with those details. Um, and everyone's looking for something simpler. But just to put it in context, I continue to blink. We're talking pay, maybe it was one or 2% of the businesses, maybe I would be surprised if it was 5% are gonna be influenced by these scenarios. And the big policy questions, as I got to with Lori Steele are still the, the two sets of gear switching participation criteria, the, the IFQ participation criteria, those are the two main questions. So looking for responses, I mean, am I wrong in thinking that you, I understand the hypotheticals you're putting forward about um, why these are important, but but again, am I, am I wrong in thinking that these are really only influencing and going to expected to influence a handful of the participants? Jim. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Mr. Niles. Um, yeah, I mean, it may influence only a handful. Uh, and I'll again, turn to Ms. Dorbinghouse for, your, for a confirmation. However, uh, as I indicated, we need to have uh, things well specified in order for the council to get informed comment about the impacts. Um, this council has taken actions and done things out of concern about the impacts on just a few people. Uh, and I sometimes gone back to actions and redone them because of an impact on, on, a, on, a, few, on a few people that they found was in, inequitable. Uh, so, you know, keeping in mind that if we don't take a look at how those folks are impacted, we may end up being back here. And so that's a risk to take there. With respect to, to an entity approach, um, I think we need some more 
guidance. You and I have had some discussions about this, um, but I think we need some more guidance on how you look at the entity level without considering who the underlying owners are. And, you know, unless you're, unless you're tracking a name or something like that. Um, and maybe that's something you and I can talk further about, but that's, that's one of the uh, um, challenges that are, yeah. Anyway, thank you. Go ahead, Corey. Just a, just a quick response. Yeah, we, we're still not on the same page about what the approaches mean and, and my fault just as much. So, but yes, I'd love, love to hear more offline how we can tailor the guidance better. Is there further questions of staff in order to clarify the issues before us or, because we'll, I'm sure we'll spend the evening thinking about it and we'll come back tomorrow and complete the agenda item, but is there any initial discussion folks want to have just to sort of put some issues out there that for folks to think about so we can have a more productive discussion tomorrow. I want to give everyone a chance here before we change agenda items. All right. I think that we'll recess this agenda item until tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Uh, and with that, I will uh, hand the gavel off to our Vice Chair Brad Pettinger uh, for the last agenda item of the day and the second agenda item of the day, F6. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, we are behind, and so uh, hopefully we can be efficient here and, uh, as we go through all the reports and uh, try to end as early as possibly can. And so with that, um, I'll look to uh, Todd to uh, take us, get us started on F6, Todd. Thank you, Mr. My, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Uh, welcome, Ms. Watson, to specs, your first specs item. So today before you, we have final action in the 2023-2024 harvest specifications and management measures uh, agenda item. So in terms of this particular agenda item, there are three, uh, I'd like to think of it in three uh, particular pieces. The first piece that the council should consider is the harvest specifications. Uh, so as the council will recall that back in April, they selected three harvest control rules for clawback rockfish. So we will need a decision on that particular item. Um, additionally, in between meetings, we discovered an apportionment error in the calculations for copper rockfish in California. So the council should uh, take that up as well. And that, uh, that information, of course, is related in attachment three. And just as a, I guess, a corresponding piece to that, the decisions that the council makes on both copper and quillback rockfish at this meeting will also relate to how the nearshore rockfish complexes um, are, uh, those ACLs and OFLs are calculated. The second piece of the specs action um, is, of course, the EFPs. So the council has the opportunity here to recommend the EFPs that had been forwarded to it for review. Um, of the EFPs the council has for it, two of them, the one being the Emily Platt, the other being the Real Good Fish EFP, have some changes that are associated with them. Um, additionally, there, uh, the Emily Platt has uh, requested an expansion of the area of their EFP. That would be an expansion north of 4010. Uh, that information is provided in the gap report, and I won't say too much about it here. Um, just noting that by expanding that EFP, there are no new set-asides associated with that. And of course, the third piece are the management measures. Um, in relation to the management measures, there are obviously um, quite a few decision points that do need to be made, um, including what we consider the new management measures. Um, those are listed under item 12, which is in your action item checklist. Um, in April, the council forwarded to our uh, asked the GMT to look at the block area closures for mitigating ground fish bycatch. And they also requested uh, some more information on calculation of ACTs for quillback and copper rockfish off of California. 
So in terms of looking at this particular agenda item, we have prepared what is known as the action item checklist, which I mentioned here shortly, which is attachment one. That is in general how we've structured these uh, decision points and how both the GAP and the GMT have discussed them in their reports. Looking at the, the multitude of reports that this agenda item has, um, I'll only point out a couple here that are, um, I guess, something that the council might want to just be aware of. Of course, the first one is attachment one, which is the action item checklist. The other item um, would be attachment nine. Um, that one speaks to the potential changes to the EFP, or excuse me, the FMP, that this action could um, require, depending on the decisions that the council makes. Um, in that particular attachment, it is the uh, suggested language of those changes, and we're very interested in hearing um, your opinions and your thoughts on those. Looking additionally down further, um, you see we have SSC report, we have reports from National Marine Fisheries Service, Washington, California. Uh, we also have a tribal report um, with the GMT. You'll notice that there are three reports there. They do not plan to read those reports. However, that information will be provided in their presentation. Um, I'll note that, of course, the GMT members who wrote those reports are in the room today um, and can uh, discuss and or answer your questions. So just looking across that, um, your action today, of course, is uh, four parts. The first one is to adopt final 23-24 harvest specifications and default harvest control rules for all ground fish stocks and stock complexes, to adopt final recommendations for the 23-24 EFPs, to adopt yield set-asides to accommodate those EFPs as necessary or as needed, and then finally to adopt the 23, 2023, 2024 season structures and management measures to be implemented on January 1, 2023. And um, last but not least, I'll note that I do have a, a support crew here, Mr. John DeVore and Dr. Jim Seeger. Uh, John can answer some questions on the harvest specifications piece and Jim of course can uh, answer questions on the EFP should the councils have any of us. So with that, Mr. Vice Chairman, I would conclude my overview. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, or we could move directly into the reports. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Questions for Todd on his overview? Okay. Thanks, Todd. We'll go to the NIPS report and Keeley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I have uh, Ms. Lynn Massey on the line, who's gonna present the NIMS report. Thank you, Lynn. Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, can you hear me? We can. Great, thank you. Uh, for the record, this is Lynn Massey with the National Marine Fisheries Service and I'll be summarizing the NIMS report under agenda item F6. Uh, this report is specifically for action item 12E under the 2023-24 management me measures and its purpose is to allow vessels participating in the directed open access sector the ability to fish inside the non trawl rockfish conservation area with select gear types. Uh, you've prior seen two versions of this report. The first was in March and the second was in April. Uh, NIMS has been evolving the specifics in this report in response to feedback from the GAP, the EC, and the EFP directors for the Emily Platt and Real Good Fish EFP projects. So what you see here is our third and final version of the gear specifications for fishing within the non trawl RCA and the definition of directed open access. So the changes we've made since April in this report are as follows. Uh, first, based off of feedback from the EC, we revised the minimum depth requirement for both gear types to be the distance between the bottom weight and the lowest fishing hook instead of the overall depth off the bottom. The purpose of this modification was to provide enforcement officers a physical measurement to take during boardings that would ensure that fishing depth was at least 50 feet off the bottom which is what is currently practiced in both EFP projects. Second, based off of feedback from the GAP and both EFP directors, we modified the maximum hook requirement to allow an additional 25 hooks to be carried on board the vessel to replace lost or broken hooks at sea. And then last, based off of feedback from the Real Good Fish EFP director, Alan Lovewell, NIMS clarified that hooks on the troll gear configuration are required to be separated by a visible marker as opposed to float specifically. Uh, the purpose of this change is to provide flexibility in the markers used to separate the hooks as floats may cause gear entanglement during deployment. Uh, that concludes my summary and I'm happy to take any questions the council might have. Thank you, Lynn. Questions for Lynn on the NIPS report? 
Okay, I'm not seeing any. Thank you, Lynn. All right. That will take us to the tribal report. And Joe, do you have something for us? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I wasn't going to read the travel report next to the record, but wanted to uh, refer the council to that. Okay. I'm sorry, John. I'm having a hard time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So there is the uh, Tribal Supplemental Report 1 under this agenda item. I wasn't going to read it into the record. I just wanted to refer the council to that. Okay, very good. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Perfect. Um, next up will be the uh, WBFW report. And uh, Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I will summarize the WDFW report under this agenda item. Um, it basically um, summarizes our meetings with stakeholders that we've held um, throughout the process um, to consider management measures for 2023 and 2024. Um, our management measures are really responsive to the stock assessments for um, Quillback rockfish, copper rockfish, and vermilion rockfish. The um, FPA that we recommend in our report is to prohibit the retention of copper rockfish, quillback rockfish, and vermilion rockfish in the months of May, June, and July. This recommendation, um, this FPA recommendation is the same as the uh, PPA recommendation that we brought forward in April. Um, there are no other changes to our management measures that we're proposing under this um, report and for the upcoming biennium. Um, and in that report, you can see the projected impacts and mortality that we're looking at for 2020, 2023 and 2024. Um, as always, uh, our management um, process, state management process allows for us to consider in-season catch and make adjustments as needed through our uh, regulatory process uh, with the um, delegated authority to our director. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Heather. Questions for Heather on the WDFW report? Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Heather, for the report. Um, I just want to um, acknowledge my ap appreciation for um, the information that you presented to us in table one. And I'm thinking back to discussions um, primarily in April and concerns about um, the projected mortality in 23-24 uh, for canary rockfish. Um, it's If I'm reading the table correctly, it's looking like you're there. Is, is that correct? That's correct. If if what we see in 2023 is similar to what we saw in 2021, um, we're looking to see what catches in this current season. That's really how our projections are based. Um, although I would say for this biennium, our projections were a little bit different because we disregarded 2020. We had fishery closures and a lot of disruption to where folks could access um, ports and that kind of thing. So our projections are based on the average of 2019 and 2021. So we're, we are up against that um, canary rockfish um, Washington harvest guideline. But, and we talked a lot about this in April and are still um, looking at that going back to when uh, Canary was rebuilt, how we think about what sectors need. Uh, we know we're just starting to figure that out. We're starting to see our fisheries um, start to target after a very precautionary period uh, where restriction was prohibited and then stepping very carefully out of that. So um, what we would do if we reach that canary rockfish, I don't 
expect that we would close our fishery down, but we would consult with um, managers in Oregon and California, the council, if it's, you know, around the June, September council meeting period and talk about what that looks like. But. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Heather. Um, that's exactly what I expected to hear and um, just good work, good planning. And I think um, uh, the states agree that we'll be coordinating quite a bit uh, next year and looking forward to it. Thanks, Marcy. Further questions for Heather? Phil Anderson? Um, well, I wasn't going to say anything until that last exchange. Um, and I'm really, I'm listening closely to the words that are used, maybe too closely. Um, the, so, um, you know, I, I've been focused on this issue a bit in previous meetings as we've worked our way up to this final decision, been concerned about canary rockfish in the Washington Recreational Fishery. Um, you know, we've looked at the, I mean, we, we are, uh, I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head here, but we're miles away from the ACL when we add all the pieces together. Um, and I was, I've been concerned about this one uh, because of the increase that I saw in the canary catches last year. And as Heather reflected, um, we had both our ports of Nia Bay and La Push were closed. There's uh, uh, the availability of canary to those recreational fisheries that are originating out of those sports has generally been good. Um, so I've been worried about this number. Um, I was uh, leaving the last discussion about this uh, with a, a degree of comfort um, because of the dialogue around the table that was similar to, to what was just uh, what, what I just heard. But what, what prompted me to engage in the conversation was the something like I don't know what we would do if we got up to the to this number, but we probably wouldn't close. That's a little too vague for me um, um, because I didn't think that closing this this fishery at, if we reached this number was something that we were even contemplating. Given that given that we're leave hundreds of tons below the ACL when we add up all the components of the different fisheries. So uh, there is obviously, if we were going to run the risk of exceeding the ACL, that would be a totally different question. Um, but we wanted in this case with Canary to, as, as it was rebuilt and as there began to be more targeting on the species, we wanted to see how things settled out if you would if you will before making any long-term allocation decisions about it so that's that's my understanding of how we're going to do this um and how we're going to manage the fishery uh, the same as it would be in the other states uh with similar situations um so i, I just want to make sure there's clarity uh, on on that point Thank you, Phil. Heather? Marcy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And um, thank you, uh, Phil, for raising the point. And I guess I will explain um, what the process has been uh, recently between the states in terms of our coordination when we ex when we notice through our in-season tracking activities that we might be approaching a harvest guideline. Um, we're very quick to reach out, usually by email, um, to say, hey, we're, we might be getting close. How are you doing? How is the commercial sec how are the commercial sectors doing? And where are we relative to our reference points? So that communication goes on pretty routinely. And um, that's that's my understanding of the arrangement that we will have 
in this situation. And so um, when Ms. Hall remarked that, you know, I don't think we would close, I think she meant that it would be only in a case that when we tally up all the catches that we might be at risk of exceeding that ACL that such action would be considered. Hopefully that helps. Thank you, Marcy. Heather? Thanks, Vice Chair. Um, thanks, Marcy, and thanks, Bill, for the comments. I, we're, we are on the same page, and I probably could have used stronger language about what we would do um, relative to the ACL. I don't think I, I referenced that we would look at it relative to the ACL, but uh, and I certainly don't expect that we would be closing the Washington Recreational Fishery based on catch reaching this harvest guideline. And so I, I do think we're all on the same page with how we're gonna approach Canary in the upcoming biennium. Phil? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Appreciate the clarification. That is where I thought we landed in our previous conversations about this and just wanted to make sure we were still clear on that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Next up will be the uh, CDFW report and Marcy. Yes, thank you, Mr. Rice Chair. I believe we have Melanie Parker teed up to provide our report. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, I am Melanie Parker with CDFW. Today I will be reading a supplemental revised CDFW report one. Again, this is a revised report that um, was posted to the briefing book earlier um, today. Um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife report on final preferred management alternatives for 2023-2024. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife, CDFW, offers the following recommendations for council consideration as final preferred alternative, FPA, management measures for the 2023-2024 biennium. Between the April and June council meetings, CDFW met remotely with stakeholders on May 19, 2022 to discuss harvest specifications and management measure options, and to solicit input to develop final alternatives for sport fisheries. The management measures presented in this report have all been analyzed within the draft integrated alternatives analytical document, agenda item F4, attachment two, Pacific Coast Groundfish Fishery 2023-2024, harvest specifications and management measures from April, 2022. As stated in April 2022, CDFW anticipates the need for continued discussions with stakeholders beyond June and that in-season actions during 2023 and 2024 may be appropriate to respond to newly available fishery data in 2022, which reflect substantial regulatory changes and discard mortality rates or unforeseen events as they arise in the new biennium. New management measures. CFW recommends as FPA inclusion of the new management measures as analyzed in the integrated alternatives analysis for action item two, adopt proposed rockfish conservation, RCA, updated waypoints and modifications as found in E5A, supplemental CDFW report one, November, 2021. Action item 12E, non-bottom contact hook and line gear allowance in the non troll RCA. Action item 12H, recreational bag limit changes for coolback rockfish, copper rockfish, and vermilion rockfish. Action item 12I, novel utilization of existing RCA boundary lines. See the discussion below on rationale for recommendations on new management measures in the commercial and recreational fishery sections. CalCod annual catch target, ACT limit south of 4010 north latitude. CDFW recommends as FPA, the CDFW Preliminary Preferred Alternative, PPA, that removes the precautionary 50 metric ton ACT, action item five, as described in agenda item F4A, supplemental CDFW report one from April, 2022. Commercial fishery. 
CDFW recommends as FPA the CDFW PPA for copper and quillback rockfish commercial sub triplements. Action items 12A, or sorry, 14A, 14B, 15A, and 15B, and non bottom contact hook and line gear allowance in the non trawl RCA. Action item 12E, as described in agenda item F4A, supplemental CDFW report one from April 2022. Regarding maintaining minimal retention of copper rockfish and quillback rockfish in the 2023-24 biennium, i.e. 75 pounds per two months sublimit, sub trip limit, CDFW notes that for nearly 20 years, a deeper nearshore species fishery permit has been required for the take, possession aboard a boat, or landing of black rockfish, blue rockfish, brown rockfish, calico rockfish, copper rockfish, olive rockfish, quillback rockfish, and tree fish for commercial purposes as per California Code of Regulations, Title 14, Section 150.02, Section 2.8.2 of Agenda Item F4, Attachment 2 from April 2022, indicated in 2021, there were 181 deeper near shore species fishery permits registered, of which 120 were active, i.e. a permit holder made at least one landing of deeper near shore rockfish. However, these numbers were in error. In 2021, there were actually 176 permits registered, of which 107 were active. Additionally, many of these deeper nearshore species fishery participants do not fish year round and or solely in the nearshore fishery. A review of landing receipts along with discussions with industry indicate that deeper nearshore fishery permittees also participate in other sectors of the ground fish fishery, such as the LEFG non nearshore fishery and non ground fish fisheries, Dungeness crab, salmon, and California lobster, to round out their portfolios. Furthermore, participants in the restricted access deeper nearshore species fishery are also subject to California Code of Regulations, Title 14, Section 150.16, subsection E5, which states cumulative trip limits. Trip limit values noticed in the Federal Register by National Marine Fishery Service for the cumulative trip limit periods for shallow nearshore rockfish, deeper nearshore rockfish, and California scorpion fish apply to each individual California commercial licensee in addition to the federally defined vessel based limits. Landings are summed by an individual's California commercial license number listed on fish receipts submitted to the department pursuant to section 8043 Fish and Game Code. For these reasons, a well-established restricted access permitted fishery, a state regulation that further restricts the landings of copper rockfish and quillback rockfish, along with the list of contributing factors described in section 2.8.2 of agenda item F4, attachment two, April 2022, should significantly and effectively limit commercial harvest of copper rockfish and quillback rockfish. CDFW continues to recommend maintaining the 2022 sub trip limits for 2023 and 2024, noting the ability to adjust these limits in season based on the most recent data and projections. With respect to RCA updated waypoints and modifications as found in E5A, Supplemental CDFW Report 1, November 2021, CDFW recommends that the Council adopt the RCA corrections adopted as the PPA be adopted as FPA. The proposed modifications fall into at least one of the following categories. Establish new non trawl RCAs around the islands, banks, and high spots within the CCA and address CDFW enforcement requests and industry requests to better align coordinates with the depth contour, as well as correct crossovers. With respect to non-bottom contact hook and line gear allowance in the non trawl RCA, CDFW continues to recommend this action as it is expected to achieve two different objectives. First, it will provide new opportunity to access underutilized and healthy midwater rockfishes by the commercial non trawl sector Second, it is expected to result in some effort shift of activity from nearshore waters into the deeper nearshore, deeper waters of the non trawl RCA. CDFW also wishes to acknowledge that 
CDFW also wishes to acknowledge that access to healthy stocks in the Montreal RCA was identified as a prioritized action the Council recommended to the Department of Commerce to reduce burdens on domestic fishing and to increase production of sustainable fisheries to meet Section 4 of Executive Order 13921, promoting American seafood competitiveness and economic growth. Agenda item H2, attachment to April 2021. Recreational fishery, model and catch projection uncertainty. The anticipated mortality of select groundfish species in the California recreational fishery under various season structure options is projected using the recfish model. The model was developed in 2004 with subsequent augmentation of monthly catch by depth and time parameters. Recfish allows projection of catch by depth and season length independently in each of the five California groundfish management areas. The recfish model is a catch-based model as opposed to an effort-based model and has been previously reviewed by the Scientific and Statistical Committee, SSC. While the recfish model is the best available science, there are multiple known uncertainties and deficiencies which are explained here. For some species, few data are available to inform the model, which is particularly the case for species with deeper depth distributions, such as the shelf and slope rockfish species, or species for which retention is prohibited or encounters are infrequent. For these species and depth bins, projected impacts may vary substantially from actual impacts. Recreational fishing regulations off California have allowed virtually no recreational fishing activity in offshore waters for more than 20 years, which means there is virtually no data to inform the model for these depth bins. The model assumes that management measures, fishing behavior, and ocean conditions during the historic period will be representative of the current fishery. It also assumes the management measures, fishing behavior, and ocean conditions during the historic period and current fishery will be representative of those into the fisher future. If significant changes to management measures are made to the fishery, or if large shifts, shifts in angler behavior or ocean conditions occur, substantial changes to actual fishery impacts may result, which the model cannot predict. The historic catch data informing the model for 2023-24 are from 2017 through 2019 and January through October 2021. Data from more distant years is not likely to be useful to inform projections, given the number of changes to management over time. In 2020, 2017 and 2019 and 2021, the bag limit for copper and coalback rockfish was 10 fish within the 10 fish rockfish cabazon and greenling, RCG, daily bag and possession limit. In November 2021, the Council recommended and NIMS approved reductions to bag limits for coalback and copper rockfishes from 10 fish to one fish within the RCG daily bag and possession limit, effective January 1, 2022. Additionally, the vermilion rockfish sub bag limit was reduced from five fish to four fish in response to continued high catches. The projections of total mortality produced in November 2021 are likely overestimates of total mortality. However, no new catch information has become available since that time to update projected mortality. As the 2022 fisheries progress, new information will become available. Unfortunately, this information will not be available in time to inform the recommendations that must be made at the June Council meeting on the season structure and management measures for 2023-24. The greatest sources of model projection uncertainty include the reductions in 2022 from a 10 fish to a one fish bag in the RCG complex for quillback and copper rockfish, are not something the model predicts well. Copper rockfish was a target species during the time period used in the projection model, not a species to avoid. This change will impact angler behavior in ways the model cannot predict. Anecdotal information from 2022 also indicates commercial passenger fishing vessels, CPFEs, in many areas are actively avoiding areas with high copper rockfish encounter rates which could further reduce total mortality and could result in pre-season catch projections that are too high. The model is inherently uncertain whenever significant changes to regulations are made. The management measures proposed by CDFW in this report are a radical departure from past and current management measures and introduce the greatest source of uncertainty to projecting impacts 
as fishing would occur in completely new areas that haven't been accessed by the recreational fishery in two decades. New descending device depth dependent mortality release rates are in development by the GMT and are expected to be available for use in management later in 2022. It is expected application of these new rates will change the discard mortality in CDFW's monthly California Recreational Fishery Survey, SURFS, estimates, and subsequently in the RecFish model catch projections. In-season tracking and monitoring. For the reasons discussed above, CDFW believes the catch projections provided are highly uncertain, and for quillback and copper rockfish are expected to be over projections. CDFW tracks groundfish mortality in season on a weekly and or monthly basis to ensure that mortality remains within allowable limits. Several rockfish species of concern, yellow eye rockfish, black rockfish, and previously cow cod and canary rockfish are tracked on a weekly basis using surf's field reports. Beginning in 2022, the list of species was expanded to include quillback and copper rockfish as a result of new stock status information. Data on observed and released fish from the weekly search reports are converted into an, an anticipated catch value, ACV, in metric tons using catch and effort data from previous years. Weekly ACV data are used as a proxy value to approximate catch during the five to eight week lag time between when data are collected and when surf's catch estimates become available. ACVs have proven to be an effective and reliable tool to closely monitor recreational in-season mortality on a weekly basis. The Council might be most familiar with CDFW's ACV methodology because of its application to in-season Pacific halibut quota monitoring, but the approach originated out of the need to track overfish species attainment, yellow eye and cow cod, in California's recreational groundfish fisheries many years ago. Although the boat-based recreational groundfish fisheries in California only open statewide May 1. Preliminary in-season data from SURF's weekly reporting covering January through May indicates total sampled or reported copper rockfish in 2022 are less than half the number from January through May in 2021, and about 25% the number from January through May in 2018 and 2019. This information suggests the new one fish sub bag limit for copper rockfish is resulting in significant reductions to encountered fish, and it is expected that reductions to surf's monthly catch estimates will be realized once they become available. Since it is still early in the fishing season, limited data are currently available on quillback rockfish sampled in 2022, but the data that are available indicate a reduction in sampled or reported fish compared to prior years. For additional information on catch to date and analysis of the measures that took effect January 1, 2022, please see the CDFW report on in-season adjustments under agenda item F7. CDFW also performs monthly tracking of target species, vermilion and canary rockfish, using SURF's estimates produced throughout the year. These species tend to be encountered at a much higher frequency than yellow eye rockfish and quillback rockfish, thousands of fish per week as opposed to tens of fish. The volume of data associated with these species makes it much more challenging to summarize and track on a more frequent basis than monthly. So CDFW prioritizes the use of, of ACV methodology to only those species that are constraining or need close monitoring to ensure catches stay within allowable limits, such as yellow eye and Pacific halibut. Monthly tracking, tracking has proven effective at keeping catches of the remaining species within allowable limits. In-season tracking reports are provided by CDFW to the council at each council meeting. To date, CDFW's weekly and monthly tracking processes have been an effective and reliable tool to closely monitor recreational in-season mortality and serves to provide timely and accurate information to inform in-season management considerations. In-season management response. The CDFW proposed FPAs within this document were developed to reduce total mortality of quillback rockfish and copper rockfish in response to the best scientific information newly available in 2021. Both quillback rockfish and copper rockfish continue to be managed within the minor nearshore rockfish complexes, both north and south of 4010 north latitude, and species within complexes are managed to the annual catch limit, ACL, for the complex. CDFW reminds the Council that the level of precision needed to manage fisheries with ACTs 
or harvest limits below five to 10 metric tons is extremely difficult, if not impossible to achieve, as random encounters in the fishery can lead to large expansions in even the best sampling surveys. While acknowledging the challenges with expansion and sampling design, CDFW believes that, an, that even an extremely low ACT or harvest guideline, HG, can serve as a meaningful reference point to inform in-season management decisions. If mortality of these species in season reaches or is projected to exceed ACTs or other harvest limits, CDFW will notify NIMS, the council and agency fishery managers who may confer to consider the risk to the resource and the socioeconomics of the fishery to determine if in-season management action is warranted to slow or stop further mortality from occurring. If warranted, CDFW anticipates stepwise adjustments to measures to try to curb impacts accordingly, changes to depth limits, season length or bag limits. The scope and duration of in-season management changes will be dependent upon which species triggered the action or actions, the time of year, and the scale of projected harvest limit exceedance. The range of management alternatives analyzed in the draft integrated alternatives analytical document covered a larger than normal range and will allow for a greater range of options available for use in in-season management responses. Sub bag limits of zero fish were analyzed for both quillback and copper rock fishes, and this option will be available for use in in-season management should it be necessary. The new management measure allowing for fishing seaward of a specified RCA boundary line and prohibiting fishing shoreward of that line will also be available for in-season management if necessary. Additionally, CDFW appreciates and recognizes the voluntary steps that recreational fishery anglers Organizations and CPFEs are currently taking to avoid areas of high copper rockfish and coolback rockfish encounters and the utilization of descending devices with released fish to reduce mortality on these species. CDFW has broadened its angler outreach on descending devices and is committed to educating the public on their use along with distributing free descending devices to anglers provided to CDFW by the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission. CDFW also reaffirms its commitment to keeping mortality of yellow eye rockfish, the only remaining rebuilding stock in the FMP within the California Recreational HG by using the in-season monitoring and reporting methods described above. Additionally, per 50 CFR 660.60 C4, in-season action can be taken by NIMS outside of a council meeting should the yellow eye harvest limit be attained or projected to be attained prior to the first day of the next council meeting. Recreational fishery season structure FPA. All of the season structures depicted below are a substantial departure from the status quo and that each management area will incur a significant reduction in fishing time in near shore waters of 30% or more. The severe reductions are necessary to incorporate the best scientific information available from the 2021 stock assessments for quillback and copper rock fishes off California and the rebuilding analysis for quillback rockfish off California. The proposed reductions are intended to keep harvest levels proportional to the biomass off California, consistent with the SSC recommendations of combining assessment areas for copper rockfish status determination. In lieu of multiple regional ACTs for each management area south of 4010, CDFW recommends using a single ACT in this area combined with traditional management measures season structures, depths, bag limits, et cetera, that equitably distribute the limited fishing opportunity between subregions. These proposed season structures were crafted following multiple discussions with interested stakeholders between January and May of 2022, and are refinements of scenario four as presented in agenda item F4A, supplemental CDFW report one from April, 2022. Under status quo, California's nearshore waters in each of the five ground fish management areas are open between eight and 10 months of the year. The proposed 2023-2024 season structures all reduce nearshore fishing opportunities that span from five to five and a half months, depending on the area. CDFW notes that for Southern California, the reduction in nearshore fishing time is the most severe from 10 months down to five and a half months. 
CDFW worked with stakeholders over winter to examine possible alternatives to mitigate for losses in nearshore fishery opportunities that are necessary to reduce catch and bycatch of these species, sorry, of these two nearshore rockfish species, such as an offshore fishery, a fishery that operates only seaward of a specified RCA boundary line, as described in agenda item E9A, supplemental CDFW report one, March 22, and agenda item F4A, Supplemental CDFW Report 1, April 2022. Projected impacts in metric tons were calculated using the established rockfish catch projection model and are highly uncertain, except for vermilion rockfish, Table 5. Vermilion rockfish is not one of the species included in the rockfish model. Instead, CDFW updated the in-season analysis conducted in November of 2021 See agenda item E7A, Supplemental CDFW Report 2, November 2021. With full year 2021 data and projected fishery performance in 2022 to develop recreational catch projections for 2023-24. Projections include impacts for quillback and copper rockfish under the status quo one fish sub bag limits for, and for vermilion rockfish status quo four fish sub bag limit as described in the bag limits section of this document. See model and catch projection and certainty section of this document and an agenda item F4A supplemental CDFW report one from April 2022 for additional information. CDFW proposes the following recreational ground fish fishery season structures by management area for the 2023-24 biennium as an FPA. In the northern management area between 42 north latitude and 4010 north latitude, the fishery for rockfish, cabazon, and greenling, RCG complex, and lingcod is closed January 1 through May 14 and October 16 through December 31, and is open in all depths from May 15 to October 15. And see Table 1 for a graphic description. In the Mendocino management area between 4010 North Latitude and 3857.5 North Latitude, and the San Francisco management area, between 3857.5 North Latitude and 3711 North Latitude. The fishery is closed January 1 through May 14th, open May 15th through July 15th seaward of the 50 fathom RCA line, and open in all depths from July 16th through December 31. And see table two for the graphic description of this season structure. In the central management area between 3711 North Latitude to 3427 North Latitude. The fishery is closed January 1 through April 30th, open May 1 through September 30 in all depths, and open October 1 through December 31 seaward of the 50 fathom RCA line. And this season structure is described in Table 3. In the southern management area, which is between 3427 North Latitude and the U.S.-Mexico border, the fishery is closed January 1 through March 31, open April 1 through September 15 in all depths, and open September 16 through December 31 seaward of the 50 fathom RCA line. And the season structure is shown in Table 4. In all management areas, California scorpion fish, sand dabs, other flatfish, petrali sole, starry flounder, leopard shark, and other ground fish, which is defined in California Code of Regulations, Title 14, Section 28.49, as including soup fin shark, Dover sole, English sole, arrowtooth flounder, spiny dogfish, skates, ratfish, grenadiers, fine scale codling, Pacific cod, Pacific whiting, stable fish, and thorny heads are open year round at all depths. In all management areas, during months that an offshore only fishery is active, in that management area, possession or retention of nearshore rockfish, defined as black rockfish, blue rockfish, black and yellow rockfish, brown rockfish, china rockfish, copper rockfish, calico rockfish, gopher rockfish, kelp rockfish, grass rockfish, olive rockfish, quillback, quillback rockfish, and tree fish, cabazon and greenlings is prohibited in all depths throughout that area. During an offshore only fishery, Fishing for take and possession of shelf and slope rockfish and lingcod is only authorized in waters seaward of an RCA boundary line as defined by connecting the series of waypoints. 
During times that an offshore fishery, offshore only fishery operates, vessels may transit through water shoreward of the RCA line with no fishing gear in the water with the aforementioned species aboard. This means anglers who are targeting species such as bass, barracuda, California halibut, yellowtail, California scorpion fish, and California sheephead in the area shoreward of the RCA cannot have aboard any rockfish, cabazon, greenlings, or lingcod during the times when an offshore fishery operates. Anglers are advised to plan their trips accordingly, especially when fishing for multiple target species during an offshore only fishery. Compliance with these retention requirements ne necessitates advanced planning when fishing for ground fish and transiting through closed areas back to port. Ocean whitefish and California sheephead are two state managed species for which regulations, especially in the recreational fishery, have been coupled to those of federal ground fish to help minimize encounters with overfished shelf rockfish species. Currently, yellow eye rockfish is the only rebuilding ground fish species off California, and there is no longer a need to couple the recreational regulations for ocean whitefish and California sheephead to those for federal ground fish. Proposed modifications to state regulations, California Code of Regulations Title 14, would allow recreational take of ocean whitefish year round in all depths. No changes to the current 10 fish daily bag limit are proposed. As proposed, the recreational California sheephead fishery would be closed January 1 through the last day of February and open March 1 through December 31 at all depths. And the daily bag limit would be reduced from five fish to two fish to keep catches within a state-defined total allowable catch limit and sector allocation. Next, we have tables that show graphically the season structures that I have just described um, in words. You can see in the Northern Management Area for Table 1, um, the RCG Rockfish Cabazon and Greenling Complex and Lingcod would be open in all depths between mid-May through mid-October. Um, the other ground fish species would be open in all depths year round. And then we have the seasons for the state managed California sheephead and ocean whitefish. Table two shows the proposed season structures in the Mendocino and San Francisco management areas. Um, you can see here the near shore rockfish cabazon and greenlings would be closed from January through mid July. There would be that offshore only fishery for the shelf and slope rockfishes in Lincoln that operates seaward of the 50 fathom RCA between uh, May and mid-July. <clears throat> the fishery would be open for all species in all depths from mid-July through the remainder of the year. Table three shows the um, season structure for the central management area. Um, this one, the all depth fishery for rock fishes, cabazon, greenling, and lingcod would begin in May and run through September. The nearshore rockfish, cabazon, and greenlings would then be closed for the remainder of the year, and the offshore fishery would operate seaward of 50 fathoms for the shelf and slope rockfish and lingcod. Table four shows the southern management area season structure. Um, here, the fishery would be open for nearshore rockfish, cabazon, greenling, shelf, and slope rockfish, and lingcod starting in April at all depths, would run through mid September, at which time retention of nearshore rockfish, cabazon and greenlings would be closed, and the offshore only fishery would operate seaward of the 50 fathom RCA for shelf and slope rockfish and lingcod. Table five shows our projected recreational impacts of select ground fish off California for 23-24 under our CDFW FPA. Uh, yellow eye rockfish is projected at 12.8 metric tons, Quillback rockfish north of 4010 is projected at 2.6 metric tons, south of 4010 at 2.7 metric tons. Copper rockfish is projected north of 4010 to be 3.6 metric tons, and south of 4010, 119.4 metric tons. Cowcod south of 4010 north latitude is projected to be 7.3 metric tons. Canary rockfish statewide, 106.9 metric tons and Vermilion rockfish south of 4010 north latitude, 200 metric tons. Sub bag limits, quillback rockfish. CDFW recommends a sub bag limit of one fish, status quo, for quillback rockfish within the 10 fish RCG daily bag and possession limit as the FPA. Copper rockfish, 
CDFW recommends a sub-bag limit of one fish, status quo, for copper rockfish within the 10 fish RCG daily bag and possession limit as the FPA. Vermilion rockfish. CDFW supports an FPA that is the status quo vermilion rockfish sub-bag limit of four fish within the 10 fish RCG daily bag and possession limit. As described earlier in this document, there is a high degree of uncertainty in the projected impacts as the modeling likely overprojected the estimated discard mortality as described in the model and catch projection uncertainty section earlier in this document. CDFW sees merit in the continuation of the one fish sub bag limits for quillback and copper rockfish to allow for fishery dependent data collection, specifically biological data. It is extremely important for future stock assessments to maintain the flow of data as data gaps would add to greater uncertainty in the results of future assessments. Therefore, maintaining status quo sub bag limits is advisable until data become available to better inform managers of the effects of the changes that became effective January 2022. See the in-season management response section. CDFW expects the vermilion rockfish status quo bag limit, changes to season structure as described above, and in-season catch tracking and monitoring will provide the necessary management tools to keep vermilion rockfish mortality from exceeding the species-specific ACL or overfishing limit contributions to the minor shelf rockfish complex. With that, I will take any questions. Okay, thank you, Melanie. Questions for Melanie on the CDFW report? Okay, very good. Thanks, Melanie. Um, we've been at it for over two hours, so we're gonna take a, a 10 minute break and um, get right back at it here. So um, we'll see everybody at uh, 3.16.
Secretary. If everyone can take their seats, we'll get started here. Okay, we're uh, we're back in session here, and uh, with that, I'll turn to um, Jessica um, Watson uh, from the ODF and WC, which she has any updates for us. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I would just direct the council to the ODFW report um, from the April meeting, uh, agenda item F4A, ODFW report one, for our. 2023-24 biennial management measures for our Oregon recreational fishery. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. All right. Um, with that, we'll do the um, GMT report or GMT presentation with Mel Bandrup. Mel? I wasn't sure if you're going to go with the SSC first, so I came up to get prepared. Yeah, one moment while I work this out. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, in real life, uh, Mel Mandrup here um, for the groundfish management team on agenda item F6, 2023-24 EF, uh, EFPs, harvest specifications and management measures, final action. Uh, before I dive into this presentation, uh, I'd like to give um, an opportunity to uh, ask or see if you have any clarifying questions on our reports one and two that are in the briefing book. Report one being um, uh, about the black area closures and report two about the harvest specifications and accountability, accountability measures for copper rockfish and coalback rockfish. Okay. Okay, so here we are, uh, final action. Uh, we'll cover the EFPs and EFP set-asides first, and then we'll go into the remaining harvest specifications. We need to, um, recommend and the management measures. So first, uh, we have the five EFPs uh, that have been in our briefing book. Um, that would be the uh, year-round mid-water rockfish um, trawl EFP, the EFP from CDFW uh, for cow cod, the Platt Emily EFP, um, which uh, there's an amendment to, and then WDFW, their EFP uh, for yellow eye rockfish, and the Real Good Fish uh, EFP, which is also, um, also has an amendment uh, to that for the uh, set-asides to cover the, the use of natural bait, 
um, when testing the gear in the natural in the natural RCA. Uh, the GMT rec recommends um, to move forward and adopt all five of these EFPs and the amended set asides um, for the two Emily, the Emily Platt and the Real Good Fish EFP with regard to their um, additional set asides needed to cover uh, for using testing natural bait. And then also have the 100 Chinook salmon threshold um, or 100 Chinook salmon to help cover the what may be taken under the EFPs. Um, so uh, I'll stop there. Um, I, I figured I'd stop periodically and make and see if there's any clarifying questions for folks before I um, continue on just to make sure everyone's good. Um, okay, any clarification, any good on EFPs? So uh, remaining harvest specifications and management measures. So uh, in, in April, um, the council adopted FPAs on pretty much every, uh, all the harvest specifications for everything we manage under the EFP or the F FMP. Thanks, Todd, for that. <laughs> uh, except for Quebec rockfish. Um, and then uh, I'll just note through the exercise the GMT did between the, the April meeting and the June meeting, um, we thought it would be prudent to come back with uh, additional um, ACL alternative for copper rockfish. And that is spelled out in the GMT num uh, report number two. And so um, the GMT here is recommending uh, to con continue with the FPA on everything else except um, to adopt, uh, we recommend adopting alternative one for quillback rockfish, and that would set the ACL lower than the ABC, and that value would be um, the ACL from the SPR value of a 0.55 uh, with P star 0.45, and that would give you a statewide ACL 2023 of 1.76 metric tons, in the 24, it would give you a statewide ACL of 1.93. And I'll note that, that those statewide ACLs then get a portion to become the ACL contributions. For copper rockfish of California, we recommend going with no action, and that would be applying the default harvest control rule, um, the 4010 adjustment to each assessment area ABC as the PPA. So next item is the RCAs. Uh, so we had a few reports um, on the RCA. My notes here, sorry. On the RCAs um, from CDFW uh, from November and um, in April, however, I'll note that the April uh, report did not, uh, was omitted in the GMT report, so apologies for that, um, but that is included, and that would be CFW report number five from April, and so uh, the GMT is recommending to adopt uh, the PPA as FPA under this uh, agenda, or this action item. Um, and that would be the proposed modifications uh, that fall into at least one of the following categories, uh, establish new non troll RCAs around the islands, banks and high uh, islands within the CCA, the banks and high spots within the A CCA, and address CDFW uh, enforcement requests uh, and industry requests to be aligned better align with coordinates with the depth contours um, as well as corrected cross, correcting cro crossovers. Uh, so before I move into uh, off the tops, 
set-asides, allocations, HG and ACT, any questions on those harvest specifications and RCAs? Clarifying no, questions. Um, I, I, it's pretty, um, oops, excuse me. I, I think it would be best just to, keep, just to go through the, the presentation and we'll, um, if uh, we'll someone really has to ask a question, we'll have a, I'll look for hands and then we'll just uh, maybe um, or finish with questions right at the end. So we're, we're a little behind here, but I think it's pretty clear. And so let's uh, please, please proceed. Alrighty, uh, off the top deductions. Um, we'll start with um, research. We uh, recommend adopting the PPA uh, research set asides as FPA, and that would be 2.92 metric tons for yellow eye rockfish. 10 metric tons for Calcod south of 4010 north latitude. And we also ado uh, recommend adopting the PPA as FPA for these incidental open access fishery uh, species that are caught in the IOA, Petroli Sole, um, with 100 or 11.1 metric tons. Uh, Sablefish south of 36 would be 25 metric tons. Dark black rockfish uh, would be 9.8 metric tons. Yellow eye rockfish be 2.66 metric tons, and near shore rockfish would be 1.3 metric tons. Moving to tribal, um, GMT recommends adopting the PPS FPA. Um, except for the dark blotch rockfish, that would be five metric tons. Uh, and for Pacific Ocean perch, that would then be 130 metric tons. Moving on to our ACTs. We have yellow eye rockfish. Uh, we recommend adopting the PPA's FPA and that ACT would be 39.9 metric tons for all non trawl sectors. And then for Calcod south of 4010, uh, recommend that PPA is FPA, and that would uh, be to remove that 50 metric ton ACT that sits below the fishery harvest guideline. The new ACTs uh, that have been evaluated, um, uh, the G, there's the ACTs for quillback and copper rockfishes. Um, the GMT uh, recommends if you are going with this ACT to set the ACTs equal to the ACL contributions for these rockfishes within their complexes. Uh, and the rationale being that it would um, create a benefit of a buffer below the ACL um, and is not likely give is not likely given such uh, low values the act equals the acl contribution would formalize the acl contribution and allow for in-season management measures in response to exceeding the acl contribution moving on to the two-year non-trawl trawl non-trawl non allocations uh we recommend going um Adopting the PPA as FPA. For the Amendment 21, not trial, non trial allocations, we recommend going um, the, F, the PPA be the FPA. For the harvest guidelines or state shares for complex, for stocks in a complex, uh, GMT recommends. Uh, adopting the PPA as an FPA, so that would be for black gill rockfish in the southern slope complex, where the HGs uh, equal the component ACLs, um, and that's part of a broader custom sharing approach. Uh, there's also the Oregon Black Blue Deacon and the Oregon Cabazon Greenling Kelp Greenling and Washington Cabazon Kelp Greenling. Uh, complexes where uh, we recommend uh, there's no need for specific species uh, har harvest guidelines. And then for near shore rockfish north, uh, we recommend going with the, the status quo sharing to set the HGs for Washington, Oregon, California. It's complicated, but it's the best biological apportionment 
Um, the ATC set assigns, we also recommend adopting the PPA's FPA. For within non troll HGs, ACTs, or shares, we also recommend adopting the, F, the PPA's FPA. So moving on to new management measures, we have uh, the short belly rockfish uh, threshold trigger, that, which would be the FMP amendment, the non-bottom contract contact hook and line gear in the non troll RCA item, the extended primary season sablefish season end date to December 31st item. There's also the corrected FMP language for block area closures, as well as the California Recreational Fishery bag limits and the California Recreational Fishery RCA measures. And lastly, the block area closures for ground fish mitigation. So for the short belly rockfish threshold trigger FMP amendment, uh, the GMT continues to recommend the FPA um, or the PPA uh, as the FPA. For the non-bottom contact hook and line gear and the non troll RCA, GMT recommends adopting the PPA as FPA. Um, for extended primary stable fish fishery date uh, extended to the end of the year, GMT recommends adopting the PPA as FPA. To correct the FPM, FMP language for block area closures, GMT recommends adopting the PPA's FPA as well. For California Recreational Fishery Bag Limits, GMT recommends adopting the PPA's FPA. For California Recreational Fishery RCA measures, GMT recommendations to adopt the PPA's FPA. For block area closures for ground fish mitigation. This one we uh, recommend to adopt option one as the FPA for both gear types. So here the GMT recommends adopting option one to develop trawl block area closures for ground fish mitigation purposes by bottom trawl and midwater trawl gear as outlined in agenda item F6 GMT report one under this uh, for this year or this month. And the rationale being is that this action would provide the council with appropriate spatial tools to mitigate trawl based catches of species such as Pacific spiny dogfish, which exhibit spatial and seasonal aggregations while also minimizing economic impacts to the industry. Moving on to our commercial accountability measures and trip limits. For shore base IFQ trip limits, the GMT recommends to adopt the PPA's FPA. For the open access north of 4010 trip limits, um, the, the GMT recommends the PPA as FPA um, and as well as adopting all other um, trip limits uh, as status quo, um, except for noting that the there's the sable fish north of 36 trip limit. Trip limit. Uh, so we're going with option one where that removes the 600 pound daily limit. And then for Quebec rockfish, going with that status quo, uh, 75 pounds per two months within the 2000 pound per two month minor nearshore rock limit for the area between 42 and 4010 north latitude. And similar with copper rockfish, going with the status quo 75 pounds per two months within the 2000 pounds per month per two months uh, minor nearshore rockfish for the area between 42 and 4010 north latitude. 
for the trip open access trip limits south of 4010, similar to the north of 4010 open access access trip limits, the GMT is recommending to go to adopt the PPA as FPA um, with those, uh, except for the quilt, there's the Quillback rockfish south of 4010. Um, we're recommending going with the status quo, 75 pounds per two months within 2,000 pounds per two month uh, deeper nearshore trip limit and for copper rockfish. Um, staying status quo with the 75 pounds per two months within the 2,000 pounds per two month deeper near shore limit. Much like open access north of 4010 um, with the limited entry fixed gear north of 4010 trip limits, um, going uh, adopting, recommending to adopt the, the PPA's FPA with the quillback rockfish uh, in uh, off of Northern California going with status quo, 75 pounds per two months within the 2,000 pounds per two months minor near shore rockfish trip limit in that area. Same with copper rockfish going with the 75 pounds per two months within the 2,000 pounds per two months minor near shore limit for the area between 42 and 4010. For the trip limit entry fixed gear trip limit south of 4010, uh, we're recommending, the GMT recommends adopting the PPA's FPA and for those quillback, the quillback rockfish trip limit remains status quo, 75 pounds per two months within the 2,000 pounds per two months deeper near shore trip limit and same with copper rockfish going with status quo, 75 pounds per two months with the 2,000 pounds per two months within the 2,000 pounds per two months deeper near shore trip limit. Moving on to the recreational trip limit, trip and bag limits in season structures. Washington spoke to what they're um, proposing and uh, the GMT is recommending to adopt what WDFW recommendations are in that report. Um, this is to maintain current season and bag limits in place, except for prohibiting retention of copper rockfish, quillback rockfish, and vermilion rockfish in the months of May, June, and July. Oregon Recreational um, recommend, the GMT recommends adopting the ODFW recommendations that are in their report. Uh, number one from, is that, I believe that's from this, it's supposed to be April or June. April. Uh, so that would be the PPA, uh, same as 2021 and 22, except for uh, allowing long leader gear fishing in the all depths halibut on the same trip, along with otherwise legal ground fish allowed on all depth halibut um, and Pacific cod, sablefish, and other flatfish species. Moving on to California, um, the GMT recommends adopting the CDFW recommendations in the CDFW report um, given a moment ago. Uh, the GMT re reviewed that report, which includes the season structure and bag limits proposed by CDFW for the California recreational fishery. With that, um, I will take any questions. Thank you, Bill. Um, with the presentation, uh, questions for Mel on the GMT report. Okay. Very good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Next up will be the uh, gap report. And I see uh, Louis Zeman and potentially maybe Merritt. Louis? Merit? Okay. I'm just going by what they tell me. <laughs> I'm a uh, GAP member Merritt McRae, and I'll be reading from 
Agenda item F6A, Supplemental Revised Gap Report 1. The Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel Report on Exempted Fishing Permits, Harvest Specifications, and Management Measures. The Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel, or GAP, and the Ground Fish Management Team, GMT, discussed the issues and reviewed the documents under this agenda item and offers the following comments and recommendations. With respect to exempted fishing permits, the GAP supports moving forward with all the proposed EFPs. Additionally, the GAP supports modifying the Yellowtail Rockfish Jig Fishing Emily Platt proposal, attachment four, to the accommodate expansion of the EP, EFP north of 4010 to the Oregon-Washington border at 4616 and south of Point Conception at 3427 north to the Mexican border to test the gear using natural bait in the non-trawl non rockfish conserva conservation area, or RCA. For the expansion north of 4010, the GAP supports the participants testing the gear using natural bait under open access trip limits north of 4010, and to be subject to the 2023-24 yellow eye rockfish ACTs set for the non-trawl commercial fishery, which is about 8.4 metric tons. This amendment or modification aligns with the long-term goal of the EFP to allow commercial fishing, commercial jig fishing with this gear off the entire West Coast, including the RCAs by open access and limited entry participants. Additionally, this will gather information to better inform National Marine Fishery Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service of bird interactions with this gear type on the shelf north of 4010. That is, these changes would provide a more real-world environment of this fishing gear with natural bait under federal cumul cumulative trip limits. Lastly, by fishing the EFP under current open access trip limits north of 4010, this alleviates the need to make further adjustments to the off-the-top deductions and all other allocations below the fishery harvest guideline. As noted in the Emily Platt EFP application, and I quote, the long-term goal of, ex of experiments proved successful is to allow commercial jig fishing with this gear off the entire West Coast, including the RCAs, by open access and limited entry participants. If successful, this gear would also be used by the nearshore fleet to avoid species of concern and could create a fishery that would fill out the portfolios of those who make up the bulk of the fishermen in the West Coast coastal communities. The recreational fleet might also benefit from using similar gear with fewer hooks, similar to the Oregon Yellowtail EFP previously mentioned. Thus, the benefits of this EFP would extend beyond the initial EFP participants. Despite the generally depressed condition of many West Coast groundfish stocks, there are some stocks that remain healthy. These healthier stocks could safely sustain increased harvest levels if they could be fished more cleanly and without bycatch of more depleted stocks. If stronger stocks could be targeted without increasing fishing mortality on depressed stocks, the West Coast commercial fishing fleet would have an alternative fishing, would have alternative fishing opportunities that would provide some economic relief to the industry while providing the public with highly desirable, sustainably harvested local seafood, unquote. Biennial harvest specifications. Referencing the action item checklist under this item, the GAP has the following comments related to particular items in that list relative to harvest specifications and management measures. Number one, adopt quillback and rockfish harvest specifications. The GAP supports option two in that list as listed with an ACL less than the ABC, the SPR of 0.55 and P star of 0.45. This option provides the most fishing opportunity for the fleet and the public. The GAP recognizes this opportunity as not to target quillback, but to access the more robust stocks in the complex. This will allow access to quillback for research purposes to inform the tentatively scheduled 2025 stock assessment. The gap did not include an ACL for copper rockfish for which the GMP provided additional analysis since April. To that end, the gap believes the no action alternative is the best option. That is applying 
a de default harvest, harvest control rule 4010 adjustment to each of the assessment area ABC as, as the FPA, as detailed in Supplemental GMT Report 2. Five, annual catch targets. Consider annual catch targets for coolback and copper rockfish off California. The GAP agrees with the GMT and recommends setting the ACTs for copper and quillback rockfishes off California equal to the species-specific ACL contributions to the complex ACLs. 12, 12C, FMP amendment to establish short belly rockfish bycatch threshold to trigger council review. As the GAP noted in April of 2022, we recognize the interest in continuing to refine monitoring catch of short belly rockfish and groundfish crawl fisheries. Fisheries participants closely track and respond to our interactions with short belly rockfish. In addition, the GMT has developed a robust, has developed robust season reporting to keep the public and council apprised of short belly rockfish catch amounts with reports available on the PACFIN and catch summar summaries provided by the GMT at council meetings. When the council categorized short belly as an ecosystem component species, council discussion at the time identified 2000 metric tons as a threshold, threshold value that if exceeded could trigger council review of current information and consideration of whether action was, was needed. The GAP understands this review process would need to be codified in the Groundfish Fishery Management Plan as part of the 2023-2024 specifications and management package. While the GAP continues to view this as a low priority re relative to other elements within the suite of new management measures, we also clearly understand council's intent to move this item forward. 12E, non-bottom contact hook and line gear allowance in the non-troll RCA. The GAP concurs with the National Marine Fisheries Sur Service report on this item. With the changes that the vertical line gear specifies a 50 foot 50 foot hook leader, or excuse me, a 50 foot leader between the sinker and the lowest hook. The carriage of an extra 25 hooks on board as spares. And for the troll gear, the substitution of separation of segments by a marker rather than specifying a float. 12H, California recreational fishery bag limit changes. The GAP supports the PPA to adopt the bag limit range for quillback rockfish and copper and vermilion rockfish. It provides needed fl flexibility with regard to management measures the council may desire to use. 12I, California Recreational Fishery, RCA Management Measures. The GAP concurs with the PPA, which provides flexibility to use management lines to delineate recreational closer closure areas shore, shoreward of the line where previously their use was restricted to seaward application. It provides for additional use in conservation of ground fish not declared as overfished in addition to those declared overfished. 12J, consider block area closures for ground fish mitigation. As the GMT states in Supplemental Revised GMT Report 1, Block area closures should be considered as a last resort measure behind industry implemented avoidance measures. Industry efforts to control incidental catch through spatial management tools are generally more precise and timely than post facto actions taken by the Council or National Marine Fisheries Service. Therefore, the gap highlights that voluntary industry actions should be the first line of defense for responding to and minimizing incidental catch of non target species including spiny dogfish. However, the GAP understands that the council wants to ensure it has all the tools necessary if council action is needed and recognizes that block area closures are a more precise tool than currently available fathom line-based bycatch reduction areas. With that in mind, the GAP accepts the inclusion of development of block area closures as a potential in-season catch control measure in the management measures package. Number 16, fishery adjustments, Washington recreational trip limits, bag limits, seasons. The GAP supports 
The sport fishing management measures as outlined in the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife Supplemental Revised WDFW Report 1 under this agenda item. 17, fishery adjustments. Oregon recreational trip limits, bag limits, and seasons. The GAP supports the management measures as outlined in GMT Report 4 under this agenda item and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Report 1 from April of 2022. 18, fishery adjustments, California recreational trip limits, bag limits, and seasons. The GAP supports the CDFW's recreational fishery season structure, final preferred alternative in supplemental CDFW Report 1. While this option is far from ideal for participants in the fishery, it is the least worst of available options, according to stakeholders. Many were uncertain if the limited season structure was actually survivable. Their best hope is outlined in that report with respect to demonstrating their ability to avoid copper and quillback rockfish this year, the 2022 season. In addition, they hope to provide sufficient samples in support of a full assessment of copper rockfish in 2023. However, it is critical that the CDFW final preferred alternative for season structure survive intact without further restricted access to the ground so critical to them and the public's continued access to our rich fisheries resources. The council should understand once shelf rockfish species are aboard, it res restricts their ability to fish inshore waters. And yet it's mornings when outer waters are most accessible due to weather patterns. It's afternoons when winds generally make exposed deep waters unfishable and inshore access is most needed. Thank you, and that concludes our statement, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Merritt. Questions for Merritt on the uh, GAB report? Marcy Rook. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, my questions pertain to the very beginning of the report on the EFP recommendations. Um, you're supporting that participants operate under open access trip limits and be subject to the yellow eye rockfish ACTs for the non trial commercial fishery, which is a statewide ACT. I maybe I'm not recalling things correctly, but I thought that fish taken under the EFPs had to be consistent with what was in the set-asides. Apparently that's a good question. So we are gonna phone a friend here. Do you know? Afternoon, council members. Uh, I'm Dan Platt, and I'm one of the administrators of the Platt Emily EFP. And uh, I signed up for uh, public comment, was actually going to come up then, and I can still do that. Uh, Marcy, um, we had some discussion about this with the um, GMT, and uh, it was our understanding that their suggestion was uh to um for the boats uh north of 4010 uh to have them rather than uh creating set asides for that for the for that extension to into that area to have the boats uh um adhere to all the open access limits the uh, the main point of wanting some boats in that area was to test the um, using natural bait on the shrimp fly gear. So we're not expecting a lot of participation. It's just a data collection, really. And so we felt that um, those limits were um, sufficient to uh, provide for the uh, boats that would be up there testing. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Dan, for uh, jumping up there. Um, I think maybe my question is better answered by National Marine Fishery Service if this is an appropriate pathway forward. I, I had a different understanding that there would be set asides uh, for the north of 4010 area that might uh, be, that were already established that might be utilized under the Cook EFP that might be incorporated into Emily Platt in order to extend its boundary. But maybe, maybe you can elaborate. I, I thought that's how we were moving forward and I thought there was some yellow eye set aside really? as well as target stocks. Thanks. Thanks. Yes, I know there was a lot of discussion about this. Um, believe where it ended up and and just to be clear under the emily platt um, and the real good fish uh, efps they are exempted from the trip limits so they're fishing to those set asides that exemption from the trip limits is a choice and so i think the understanding is is that um, for any species that they're not going to be given set asides for we could allow them to fish up to the trip limits that catch will still be recorded as efp catch so we'll be able to keep track of it that would be fishing up to that. So it's, it would be a change to how we're setting up the exemptions in that EFP. I, I know the GMT talked a bit about the um, potentially different species mix, and I can't speak to that because I didn't catch that whole conversation. So if that is more of your question, that might be a question for the GMT about what they discussed. But in general, um, we didn't see necessarily an issue with allowing um, fishing up to the trip limits in that expanded area if that was you know, the will of the council and the recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Keeley. I just wanted to know, it's a new approach to me, so thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Keeley. For the questions for the gap? I think we're good. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next up will be uh, the SSC report and uh, Dr. Holland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'm Dan Holland, Chair of the SSC, uh, and I'd like to read into the record agenda item F6A, Supplemental SSC Report 1, Scientific and Statistical Committee Report on Exempted Fishing Permits, Harvest Specifications, and Management Measures for the 2023-24 Fisheries Final Action. <clears throat> Mr. John DeVore, Council Staff, provided a review of the corrected apportionment of copper rockfish found in Agenda Item F6, Attachment 3, as well as alternative harvest specifications for quillback rockfish found in Table 1-6 of Agenda Item F6, Attachment 2. The original apportionment of copper rockfish that was based on the proportion of historical catches north of 4010 latitude for all of California was corrected to reflect only the proportion of the for the assessment area north of Point Conception. The SSC agreed that the correction to copper rockfish apportionment, apportionment in tables two and three of attachment three uh, agreed with that and endorses the resulting values for use in management in 2023 and 2024. In attachment two, the no action alternative for quillback rockfish uses the default 4010 harvest control rule while the alternatives considered use SPR harvest rates of 0 0.55 and 0 0.6 as calculated in the rebuilding analysis to inform ACL contributions. The SSC endorsed the rebuilding analyses for use in management, agenda item F2A, supplemental SSC report one from November 2021, with which the alternatives are consistent. That concludes the SSC's report. Happy to take questions. Okay. Um, questions for Dan on the uh, SSC report? All right. Not seeing any hands. Thanks, Dan. Um, next up would be the EC report and to Greg Bush. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. My name is Greg Bush. I'm with NOAA Fisheries Officer Law Enforcement and Chair of the Enforcement Consultants. I'll be reading agenda item F6A, Supplemental EC Report 1, Enforcement Consultants Report on Exempted Fishing Permits, Harvest Specifications and Management Measures 
for the 2023-2024 fisheries final action. The enforcement consultants have reviewed the documents pertaining to agenda item F6, exempted fishing permits, harvest specifications and management measures for the 2023-2024 fisheries and provide the following comments. The EC have concerns with any proposed proposal authorizing fishing activity within a ground fish conservation area with specific gear and area restrictions due to the need for additional shoreside monitoring and at sea enforcement to ensure gear and retention requirements are met. As previously stated in supplemental EC reports to the Pacific Fishery Management Council, the EC recommend making changes to the boundaries of the non-trawl RCA over a partial reopening to provide additional ground fish fishing activities. The EC are also concerned with allowing fishing to occur both inside and outside the non-trawl RCA in the same trip. This adds additional enforcement challenges due to the expanding monitoring and gear verification requirements. That said, the EC recognizes the Council's desire to provide additional fishing opportunities within the non-trawl RCA, while additional analysis and a final recommendation on modifying the boundaries of or eliminating the non-trawl RCA is contemplated. Regarding proposed RCA updated waypoints and modifications as specified in F4A, Supplemental CDFW Report 5 from April 2022, and E5A Supplemental CDFW Report 1, November 2021, DC have no concerns with the proposed changes. Regarding F6A Supplemental NIMPS Report 1, the EC have no additional concerns with the gear and declaration definitions and appreciates the changes supported by the Council. Regarding F6 Attachment 2, Section 212, California Rec Recreational Fishery, and F6A Supplemental CDFW Report 1, the EC have reviewed the material associated with the novel utilization of existing RCA boundary lines with respect to the California Recreational Fishery and met with California Department of Fish and Wildlife staff member James Phillips to discuss CDFW's recreational fishery season structure, final preferred alternative recommendation. The EC have concerns with any proposal, proposed season structure scenario where a vessel would be permitted to fish with bottom contact gear shoreward of the 50 fathom RCA boundary line during the greater than 50 fathom shelf and slope rockfish and ling cod offshore fishery time periods. Permitting fishing activity for other species shoreward of the boundary line while only allowing the retention of shelf rockfish, slope rockfish, and ling cod seaward of the boundary line is problematic for enforcement. For example, existing CDFW provisions allow the recreational retention of petroli sole, starry flounder, and other flatfish, including Pacific sand dab, while using bottom contact gear in the RCA and cow cod conservation area. Enforcement has made several contacts where recreational fishers were observed fishing in those two conservation areas. The fishers discarded their unlawfully taken ground fish overboard once they saw the approaching patrol vessel. When contacted, the fishers claimed they were fishing for Pacific sand dabs and the rockfish floating around their vessels were prohibited ground fish they had released. Enforcement prefers the proposed scenario A season structure where the take of shelf rockfish, slope rockfish, and link cod are only permitted during the open to in all waters time periods. That is scenario 1A over 1, scenario 2A over 2, etc. The position of these species on board the vessel would be prohibited regardless of where taken during the closed time periods, making it much easier to enforce regardless of the vessel was contacted at sea or at the dock and would eliminate the sand dab scenario described above. This concludes the EC statement. Thank you, Ray. Uh, questions on the EC report? Mark Rill, Richard Rolling. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks for the report. Um, I just want to uh, just get some clarity on the recommendations regarding the California recreational uh, season structure. I'm looking um, not at attachment two now, but I'm looking at the CDFW preferred alternative here. And um, it looks like this period where we're only fishing deep is only two to three months of the year. And so I guess I'm trying to understand we're not, the concern isn't an, a year round enforcement issue. It's, it's an enforcement issue for those two or three months where we have just the greater than 50 fathoms fishery. 
through the vice chair, um, Mr. Gronick, um, that is uh, correct. Our, our concern is during that time period, that two month period or, th or three month period where the greater than 50 fathom fishery is opened, that, that's where we have the enforcement concern. Those periods of time within the CDFW proposal where it's open to all depths, those, those time periods are not a concern because um, you don't have a fishery where they're open, they're allowed to catch fish outside, but not inside the rest of the um, management area. Okay, thanks for that, I appreciate that. And, and I guess the illustration that was in the EC report, I guess relates to current fishing practices, current enforcement challenges that exist today, even without the greater than 50 fathom fishery. So it seems like this is an enforcement problem whenever the fishery is open and not really restricted to this greater than 50 fathom issue. Through the vice chair, um, yes, Mr. Grunlich, that we are highlighting the challenges that enforcement faces anytime you have closed fishing areas alongside open fishing areas or you have the potential that vessels are allowed to fish and retain a species using a gear type in one area but it's closed in another and and in the potential scenario we we can't distinguish gear type it has to be an on-site on-board enforcement um, action uh, with so Sorry. We're, we're trying to highlight the the challenges that we face now and if we can close off these loopholes or these these areas to where we can help improve our ability to enforce on the water and at, at sea we're providing those recommendations to you all right thank you very much okay thanks mark uh, further questions for the ec marcy rimco thank you mr vice chair uh thank you greg um First, I just want to acknowledge um, the intent of the message to us. And I know um, the offshore fishery proposal does create new complexities uh, and new challenges for enforcement. And uh, just to um, let you know that, you know, it, it will require significant outreach on CDFW's part to uh, retrain our anglers on what's permissible with regard to RCA management and uh, we're committed to doing that. And again, I, I just want to acknowledge we, we haven't made your job easier with this suite of FPA recommendations. Um, but with that, I do want to ask you a question about a particular term that you used in this report um, toward the bottom of page one. Uh, you say that the EC has concerns with any proposed season structure scenario where a vessel would be permitted to fish with bottom contact gear shoreward of the 50 fathom RCA boundary line during the greater than 50 fathom offshore fishery. Um, why did you elect to use the term bottom contact gear and are, are you talking about fishing for ground fish with bottom contact gear. And the reason I ask is we have a multitude of state managed fisheries going on in these same waters concurrently in the near shore areas, um, a number of target species um, that utilize what I would characterize as non as a as bottom contact gear. So maybe you can clarify what's meant by this statement and um, if you intend that, um, if you intend the statement to apply just to ground fish, thank you. Through the vice chair, Mr. Remco, thank you for the, the statement and your question. Um, with regard to the term bottom contact, we're looking at common hook and line gear configuration consisting of, of a weight and a hook that you would use to catch any of a number of bottom species to where the weight would, would hit the bottom um, and that same gear would be a similar configuration that would be used to catch rockfish if they were fishing further offshore. So, so we're looking at the same gear or methods would be used in one area um, so they'd have the, the potential to catch the species that would be prohibited for retention in that same area. 
but allowed further offshore. So, so we don't have any, the use, I, I recognize that in the commercial fishery, there is more context when we're looking at the commercial gear defined as bottom contact, non-bottom contact. Here we're looking at more commonly used recreational fishing gear that would be hook and line, which also inc includes bottom and non-bottom contact. Thank you, Mr. Rice Chair. Um, maybe I have another question or maybe I'll say it a slightly different way. Um, I know it would be the EC's preference if we had no offshore fisheries and only all depth fisheries. Um, but those all depth fisheries, the way those seasons are structured, we have some open seasons for all depth and then some completely closed season for all depths. But even in those closed seasons, folks are still using bottom contact gear for other species. So the challenge here, of course, is how do we distinguish groundfish fishing? And again, I know it's this is just something that is a, a challenge for enforcement all the time, year round. Um, but certainly we're, I think, interested in hearing any advice on how um, how we would manage that situation. Um, but I, I guess what I'm trying to, to, to tease out is, is there a distinction between ground fish fishing and ground and fishing with bottom contact gear for other species? Through the vice chair, Ms. Remko, hopefully I, I can answer your, your question. Um, as you know, the off the coast of off the west coast of the U.S., it's it's a large area. We have few resources, so anytime we can eliminate or or reduce the need for on-site at sea enforcement, that's our preference. And and when you have different areas that are open to different species retention, that that's where we have challenges to to not be able to enforce it when for instance they come to the to the dock these vessels don't require any monitoring they could fish anywhere catch the species and if we did not have a vessel on site that boarded them at sea they could tell us that they caught it outside caught the rockfish outside of 50 the other species inside of 50 or if they were a, a, a all depth fishery they could say they caught it anywhere so so we're looking at and our recommendation is based on that desire to be able to enforce it at sea or shore side because um, otherwise we have to be at sea to be able to verify that the rockfish that were that they're allowed to keep outside of 50 were in fact caught outside in 50 and not inside of 50. It's that that prohibited retention that that helps us. Thank you. Yes, that that helps. I understand. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. Further questions for the EC? Don't see any. Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> okay, that takes care of our advisory bodies reports. It takes us to public comment, and we're trying to. Get... Anyway, well, I see eight cards. I believe it will wait till Chris gets it up. Okay. Okay, first up is uh, Donna Kilez and um, followed by Dan Platt. Donna? Yes, good afternoon. Hello, Vice Chair and Council Members. My name is Donna Kilez. I'm a landing owner, CPSC owner, and I'm also on the board of the Sport Fishing Association of California as well as CCA Cal. My family and I own Dana Wharf Sport Fishing and Whale Watching in Dana Point, California. Our fleet carries over 25,000 fishing passengers per year. We currently employ 45 full and part-time workers. My father and founder of our business, Don Hansen, was a far former PFMC chairman. Sadly, he passed away earlier this year. 
As some of you may know, my father loved the council. He loved all of you, and it was part of his life for over 40 years. He firmly believed in the sound management of fisheries through this council process. And although I manage the day-to-day -day operations of our business, he created a passion does exist inside of me to learn all that I can about the process that manages our fish. It is with his spirit that I write this letter to you. The perceived low estimate of the population status of copper rockfish is threatening the existence of our livelihoods. We have always been a year-round fishery from Dana Point since 1971. We try to fish every single day, weather permitting. We do not ever close, nor do we take the winter off. Even with the current rockfish closures in January and February, we have, over the past few years, with the exception of times under COVID, seen a decline in January and February fishing effort. We believe that this is because catches are reduced through management measures and restrictions, and access to many of our species are restricted. Our customers have figured this out over time and now believe they should just wait and fish in March. The March rockfish opener is a huge part of our business. The month for us has been marketed as the rockfish opener for years. In my letter that I sent earlier, you can see my fleet's efforts in both March and April. The fishermen are motivated for the real beginning of the season and consequently the trips are sold out. However, in September of 2021, it became clear that several concerns were raised regarding the stock assessment techniques applied to copper rockfish, also quillback rockfish, but we don't catch any of those, so I cannot speak to that stock. These copper rockfish have been a target species, I'm sorry, these copper rockfish have never been a targeted species for us, nor have they ever been a frequently caught species for us. They're in fact a very minor part of our very diverse catch. For years, they were reported as a miscellaneous rockfish by our captains and were not a species of concern. Since I believe around 2012, that's all I could find, a bag limit was imposed on copper rockfish of 10 per fish within the 10 fish bag limit. However, it was not until 2022 when the bag limit was reduced to one copper rockfish per person for fear of overfishing. It is currently best practice in our fishery to just not retain any of them if we do perhaps come upon them. We quickly were told this March when the season began that those efforts may not even be enough. Our season in 2023 and 2024 is in jeopardy. So we have asked the public and all of our customers to release any copper rockfish that they may catch to help save our fishery. We have done this through social media posts and telling all of our people that come in to buy licenses. We are doing our part. Our fishery is under constant attack. We are still waiting for the MLPA areas that have been closed for over 10 years to our near shore fisheries to our north to open. Then we had COVID hit us. And then of course, the California Air Resource Board restrictions on our engines. Then to top it all off, we had an oil spill off our coast that closed my near shore fishery from October 4th to November 30th in 2021 causing financial hardship to us and our other vessels. And now further copper rockfish restrictions that threaten our landing. Plus, we are also encountering the rising cost of everything, including fuel. It is increasingly harder every day to run a business, and we are now running the risk of denied access forced on an entire fishing community because of a cute little copper rockfish stock assessment that is questionable at best. As the report from CDFW states, the assessment is highly, highly uncertain. We need to keep affordable, easy access opportunities for the public to the fishery year round. We need to recognize the effects that this has on low income communities, seniors, military, veterans, children, and those that with special needs. 
we as an industry are committed to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the recreational fishing community, but we cannot achieve this if we don't have access. We have a healthy working waterfront in Dana Point. We bring in our passengers each day and they eat and they shop and they explore our community. This ground fish management decision will have an effect on the culture and economy here. According to Rexon data in March of 2017, there were 34,000 bottom fishing trips in Southern California, and they produced over $38 million in sales and over 5,000 jobs. And we're just talking March alone. Please consider standard eight in Magnuson. Here is some of what it says. And I know you all know this, but conservation and management measures shall consistent with the conservation requirements of the Magnuson-Stevens Act, including the prevention of overfishing and rebuilding of overfished stocks, take into an account the importance of fishery resource to fishing communities by utilizing economic and social data that are based upon the best scientific information available in order to provide for the sustained participation of such communities and to the extent practical minimize adverse economic impacts on such communities. Was there an economic impact survey done on the effects of closing rockfish season 5.5 months? I'm sure that I missed it, but if someone can tell me where it is, that would be great. The current proposed table four is one that we struggled to support and it's essentially a rockfish closure in my area from September 16th to March 30th, 5.5 months. And that is what CDFW just told you. We support the status quo scenario of last year until more data is received. I would suggest that a better management strategy would be to just avoid copper rockfish with no take restrictions instead of closing all of March and September 15th to December 31st to protect this one stock. Currently, the fleet as a whole is in avoidance and relief mode of copper rockfish unless there's a sampler on board. And if the species is, it is encountered, we will release them with a descending device. While some favor a season with access to rockfish in areas greater than 50 fathoms, that does not work for my area and would result in several closures for us. We have very little area left to fish. We were actually very hesitant to support a March closure. We do not feel it's necessary, but in the spirit of co cooperation, and we've been told that CDFW has no choice but to do this, we will agree with the fish and wildlife recommendation. However, we are very, very concerned about our future and the message this will send to our captains, our crews and the fishermen. What am I to do with all of my captains and crews in March? 50 fathoms or greater does not work in our area. And September 15th to December 31st is just going to close more access. However, one silver lining in the all depth fishery and the opening of the 14 mile bank will allow more options and we will be received well by our passengers and our captains. In addition, it is worth pointing out that sheephead has also been reduced from a five bag limit to two for 2023 and 24. And that was a measure that we do support. In closing, I would like to ask, during the time these management decisions were considered, did anyone stop and ask if we had enough data to make a credible assumption of the stock assessment status at that time? We, uh, it seems to me that if everyone agreed that data is wrong, best practice would be to wait until you're certain you have the best available data. I think we need to consider this before we make decisions that continue to put people out of work and create further hardships on all of us. Thank you for your hard work. And I recognize more than ever how hard your decisions are for all of us. We hope that and look forward to CDFW in season changes. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Questions for Donna on her testimony? Okay. okay. Thank you, Donna. 
Next up is Dan Platt, followed by Tim Clausen. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Daniel Platt, and I am one of the administrators of the Emily Platt EFP. When we recently submitted our application for the 23-24 biennium, we did so for the specific reason to test the use of natural bait on the shrimp fly gear. After it was submitted, we had requests from fishermen both north and south of our current EFP area who were interested in joining the EFP to test the use of natural bait in their areas. I am therefore asking to extend our EFP area in the north to 4616, the Oregon-Washington border, and in the south to the Mexican border to gather some data from both areas. We are not asking for any additional set-asides for these areas. <clears throat> north of 4010s, the boats will be adhering to the current open access limits. South of 3427, we have not come close to any of our EFP set-asides in the last few years. Um, I want to add that I recently um, talked to Barbara Emily, and uh, as I suspected, um, we're, we're not asking for a, additional vessels because uh, in the last few years, um, only two at a time at the most of our uh, current seven allowed vessels have been fishing and uh, we, we should be able to uh, transfer um, some of those permits to the boats to the north and south of us so that they can uh, test uh, the use of natural bait in their areas. With that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dan. Questions for Dan on his testimony? Marcy Urmko. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Dan, for um, coming forward today. I, I just want to acknowledge uh, the work that you've done behind the scenes to um, work to um, bring new information into the council process and recruit participants uh, into the EFP. And I think expanding the scope of it, is, as you've uh, suggested, uh, will give us some very good information, um, particularly in light of uh, bird interactions and potential differences uh, between uh, north and south of uh, 36 degrees and, and just generally um, across a greater geographic area. So I just want to um, thank you for um, your work to um, bring us uh, new best available science that helps inform our management into the future. Appreciate it. Thank you, Marcy. Anyone else? Okay, thanks, Danny. Next up is Tim Clausen, followed by uh, Wayne Cotto. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, Council. My name is Tim Clausen. I own a charter fishing business in Eureka, California, and I'm here today to represent the Golden Gate Fishermen's Association. It's an association of charter boats from uh, Monterey to the Oregon border. Our Northern California ports are very diverse. Some ports have fishing options like halibut or salmon in addition to rockfish. Where I'm from in Eureka, we also have salmon and halibut, but both are highly restricted with a quota on halibut and frequent restrictions on Klamath management zone salmon. The one consistent target for us has always been rockfish. Rockfish are the backbone supporting many boats on the California coast. So far, this has been a difficult year for most boats due to high fuel costs and below average bookings. California charter boats need the opportunity that consistent access to rockfish provides. Fortunately, our partners at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife recognize this. 
They've done a great job of listening to fishermen this year and putting together season structures that will help provide access for our boats while protecting vulnerable species. Are these season structures perfect? Far from it. Everyone's season is significantly shorter. We're still facing some difficult times. I'll ask that the council approve California's final preferred alternative for agenda item F6A supplemental CDFW report one. The boat operators know what it is, what is at stake, and I'm confident that we can work together to protect copper and quillback rockfish and preserve sport fishing businesses well. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Questions for Tim on his testimony? Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Tim. I appreciate you uh, being here today. Um, just want to acknowledge um, that you are one of our new GAP members and you're um, filling some big shoes behind uh, Bob Ingalls in representing GGFA here today. Um, many folks may not know you around the council table, um, but Tim has been um, a very uh, hardworking representative on behalf of the charter fleet and has uh, provided us uh, lots of advice, both on uh, recreational groundfish uh, issues as well as uh, Pacific halibut. So um, we're just very glad to have him be a part of the gap and the council process on groundfish. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Marcy. Further or anyone else for Tim? Okay. Thanks, Tim. Next up, next up is uh, Wayne Coto and followed by uh, J.B. Diamond. Wayne. Good afternoon, Vice Chairman Bettiger and the council members. I'm Wayne Cotto with CCA California, representing the Recreational Anglers of California. I would first like to thank everyone who put so much time and effort to try to find a solution to our groundfish management issues. All of us agree that we want healthy stocks and sustainable fishing. We all understand the complexity of collecting all the diverse data needed to make sound decisions. I think we all also understand when best available science is not optimal, robust, or complete enough to accurately reflect what we see on the water. We all want to help and support better sampling efforts going forward so that the models will have complete information and accurately reflect current stock status. Given the major economic and social value of the rockfish fishery and the seriousness of these closures on our fishing communities, it is critical that we ensure managers have the highest quality data possible upon which to base these decisions. There needs to be a pause option available to the council when they know that they do not have the full picture or the models are contrary to what we're seeing on the water. We understand the need for a conservative approach as we navigate through this delicate matter and have partnered with SAC and the fleet to ask our anglers to take precautionary actions to avoid landing and retention of coppers and quillback rockfish. We have also re-emphasized to our angling community the importance of in utilizing descending devices when releasing fish and have distributed many uh, to the anglers for free. We have also asked our anglers to please submit catches to the California surf samplers to aid in the data collection and are hoping CDFW will be able to increase their coverage. We hope that our efforts along with others will not be taken for granted and understood that we are all trying to work towards the same goal and need to find better solutions and changes to gain the missing data. Sometime in the future, this issue could be used as an excellent case to explain why we have uh, MSA provisions and how the national standards are followed. In regard to which preferred alternative we support, we support the CDFW Recreational uh, Fishery Season Structure FPA in Supplemental CDFW Report Number 1. While we have much reservation and know the harm this will cause to our fleet and anglers, we understand that this is the least harmful alternative at this time. We need the council to recognize how unreasonable it is still for part of the fleet that once they have a rockfish aboard, they cannot fish inshore, which is the standard option for them as they go deep in the morning and inshore on the way back as in the afternoon, uh, mostly due to the windy conditions. Our hope is that NOAA will invest in survey methodologies that will better inform us regarding the stock status of species associated with nearshore rocky habitats. The current efforts have limited utility to inform management. Finally, 
finally, we hope that our current efforts and additional sampling will, will have positive outcomes for possible in-season management actions in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Questions for Wayne? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Thanks, Wayne. Next up is Jamie Diamond, followed by uh, Kim Frankie. Jamie? Good afternoon, Vice Chair, Council Members, and staff. I am Jamie Diamond. I, along with my husband, Jason, and our three kids own Stardust Sport Fishing in Santa Barbara, California. We have two commercially uh, commercial passenger fishing vessels and 13 crew. We fish the Santa Barbara coast and Northern Channel Islands primarily for ground fish. I'm here to speak with the proposed copper rockfish management measures and the CDFW final preferred alternative. We, the passenger fishing vessels, ask for status quo, coupled with our voluntary active avoidance and release of copper rockfish. We initiated avoidance and release efforts several months ago in an effort to demonstrate we are capable of avoiding and releasing species of concern under status quo situation. As we collect more data on the water to better inform decisions on man management measures and season structure. As written in the CDFW Supplemental Report 1, SURF's weekly reports covering January through May indicates the total sampled or reported copper rockfish this year are less than half of the numbers from the same time last year, and about 25% of that same time period in 2018 and 19. We just began the voluntary avoidance and release in April and we expect to see an even larger reduction by September and again in November at the following council meetings. Although the GMT and GAP suggest setting the ACT equal to the ACL and copper rockfish, I wanna underscore our efforts reflected in the year to date reductions. We intend to come in far below that copper ACT. Sport Fishing Association of California has initiated a data sampling collection project partnered with NIMPS and supported by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to fill the gaps in copper data. It is important to know we will retain copper rockfish when surf samplers are aboard and when we're conducting our data collection in partnership with NIMPS. This project was created out of necessity in the wake of a fatally flawed data moderate assessment potentially putting us out of business. Our fleet has been successful with our strategy, again, of avoidance and release of sheephead, cow cod, and now copper rockfish using descending devices as necessary. I believe these actions, along with the new descending device depth-dependent mortality release rates the GMT is finishing this year, will show significantly reduced mortality, taking any action above status quo totally unnecessary. I appreciate and thank the California Department of Fish and Wildlife for the time, effort, and outreach they have put into the California FPA, especially the addition of an all-depth access opportunity time. But let me be clear, this is the least worst option. It will have a significant negative impact on our business. The proposed seaward 50 fathom season poses many challenges, Primarily, it creates safety concerns and operating conditions, as you've already heard from several other speakers, so I won't go into that too much further. With the proposed season, we would have to fish shallow in the morning, like they said, and then go out deep in the afternoon. This is not how we, we fish, not because that's just how we decided to do it, but because that's how nature forces us to. This is putting boats and people in unsafe conditions, or it removes our ability to fish for half of our targets, either having to choose one or the other, further reducing the value of our trips. We will also lose a month of business right off the top in March, which includes the well-established and much anticipated March 1 rockfish opener, as well as spring break business. We will have difficulty retaining our Coast Guard certified, highly trained crew because we will have little to no work for them upwards of seven months during the proposed mid-September through March closure. There are fishing families who will not make it through this proposed season, period. I ask you to consider what it means to survive this difficult situation, because for many it looks like losing their home to make boat payments or selling a boat to make rent, financial hardship, losing crew, mental health crisis, and quality of life. 
This year, we've already lost passengers due to the reduction of vermilion from 10 to four and copper to one or essentially none part of our voluntary, op uh, our voluntary actions. More than 10 charter groups and hundreds of individuals for my boats alone have decided not to book, citing increased participation costs and less quality fish in their bags. This paints a very grim picture for our future. However, I believe we are able to reduce our take of copper rockfish without implementing draconian management measures. I wanna thank you for your time. I wanna thank staff's efforts. I know this has been challenging. And if anybody has any questions about our, um, our data collection program we're, we're, we're working on or any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Questions for Jamie on her testimony? Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate you coming up here and being here for this and sharing your insights and your stories and what this is like for your business. Um, also, the um, just appreciate the research that you've started in conjunction with CDF and W and NIMPS. That's critically important. I think that's widely recognized and really appreciate the avoidance measures that you're already doing. So um, it's really more of a comment, but just thanks for being here and we hope to keep hearing back from you. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay. Next up is Ken Frankie, followed by David Kishida. Welcome, Ken. Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. I'm Ken Frankie, President of the Sport Fishing Association of California. Our membership includes the majority of the commercial passenger sport fishing vessels from Santa Barbara to San Diego. I preface my comments with our sincere appreciation of Marcy Uremko and her CDFW team for the extraordinary outreach effort they made as we conducted preparation for a preferred alternative for the 2023-24 ground fish seasons. It was truly a team effort with everyone participating. And I really mean that. They, they really went out, uh, out of their way to try and connect with us. We recognize there's many factors to consider as you work through the topic of copper and quillback rockfish and the season structure. Let there be no question, we're all concerned about every stock in the ocean. We want them all healthy and robust. Tremendous effort has been made to collect better data to help make good decisions. ROV surveys, acoustic studies, tagging projects, design device testing are all examples of the serious collaboration between our fleet and the science community. The goal is to help the process of data collection and resource protection. We're currently working with our science partners to develop improved sampling programs as an example, we have commenced implementation, as Jamie mentioned, of a program where in the crews, the boat crews, uh, are measuring the copper and quillback rockfish, then forwarding the samples to the NOAA uh, Santa Cruz, or the NIMP Santa Cruz lab for further study. Uh, we hope to see a new flow of data into the process to assist in decision making. And CDFW is also ramping up sampling post COVID, and these efforts will also join the information flow. Foundationally, we're concerned with what appears to be inadequate data in the previous assessment. There's a risk on decisions made with an incomplete picture of what's going on in the ocean. We believe the efforts just mentioned would give regulators the better data needed to make good decisions. But there needs to be a plan on how to get from where we are now to an appropriate season structure for the next two years. It will start with our desire for status quo, that's desire for status quo, but support for the state's preferred alternative that they worked very hard to prepare. From a fleet perspective, our actions have been precautionary as demonstrated in our avoidance of cow cod, sheephead, and now copper and quillback rockfish. Prior to your last meeting, the fleet recognized the issues, the SAC board of directors and working with GGFA pro proactively commenced with a voluntary zero, zero bag limit, of copper and quillback rockfish. Avoidance and release have been the action taken. The exception being, if there's a sampler present in need of samples, our rationale was simply, if we can avoid and release a species of concern, then consideration be can be given to maintaining season structures as more data is collected. 
We've all been on a strong path of conversation, uh, converse, conservation for decades. We want it to continue. However, it's critical that the sampling be maintained, and that can only occur if the vessels are in operation. For this reason, we really like the aspect of the state's preferred alternative of a one fish bag limit on these species, as this permits us to obtain critical samples while the balance of the time, we voluntarily continue with a self-imposed zero bag limit, and it's working. This is a win-win if the fleet is in operation. Another piece of information, and it was touched on a bit by Jamie, is you should be made aware of the impact of the industry survivability after imposition of restrictive season structures. The fleet has trained Coast Guard licensed captains and trained crews. If those restrictions put in place are too restrictive, companies stand to lose those personnel. That is why every effort must be made to consider actions which permit operations while protecting the species of concern. There are 193 Coast Guard inspected CPFVs in the state. We lost 30% of the fleet in the last 20 years. For those that come from lower economic and diverse communities, our fleet's the sole means by which they can access the ocean and get seafood. We wanna see that access continue. The sustainability of what remains of the fleet should be an important factor in the decision processes. Several have mentioned, you lose five or six months, what if you owned that boat? What are you gonna do with those employees? Put them on the beach, they're gonna find somewhere else to go to work and now what do you do? Uh, with regard to the preferred alternative put forward by CDFW, we're in support of it as it is the least harmful, but it is harmful. Statewide input was received by the department on recommendations to protect copper and Quebec rockfish and the season structure. They're aware of our concerns and did what they could to give as much opportunity to the fishermen as possible. That said, in conclusion, we look forward to a hard look at the numbers of fish caught this year and the performance of the fleet's avoidance and release efforts while supporting sampling this year. If we collectively can protect the resource while operating, then we could encourage, then we encourage consideration be given to have avoidance and release as an option to help adjust season structures for consideration prior to the 2023-24 season. And just as a final comment, uh, I had a boat owner call me the other day, his crew sitting by waiting to hear how this goes. They're deciding whether or not this summer is their last summer, because if we end up closing the whole season down, they intend to quit. That's what we're up against. So we, we look forward to working with you all. Let's take a look at those numbers and see if at the end of the year we can turn this around. Thank you. Welcome, any comments? Thank you, Kim. Uh, questions for Kim? Oh, Phil Anderson. Uh, I don't have any questions. I've, I've got a couple questions, but up there for Marcy. Uh, but I'm not going to ask him right at the moment because I'd be out of order. But I do want to thank you, Mr. Frankie, for making the trip here to Vancouver, Washington, to provide your comments, as well as Jamie and others that have come up during the public comment period on this issue. Um, I do have personal experience with what it's like to own a charter boat and have seasons cut dramatically. Um, so I am very, um, I don't know if I want to say sympathetic. I am understanding of the challenge, the challenges that you face. Um, and I am, um, interested, committed as a council member to look at all of the measures that may be taken. Uh, that could potentially offset some of the closure periods that are currently planned. Uh, this is going to be a, uh, I, I suspect this will be a, a, a learning um, experience here as we go and see what type of results can be obtained through voluntary measures that, that regulations simply don't aren't able to achieve. And uh, I really appreciate to hearing about the outreach that California Department of Fish and Wildlife has made in the 
and, and understanding that what we have in front of us is the least of the worst of what we have to choose from at this point in time, but hopefully through the cooperation between the agency and the fleet, we're able to find a better pathway. But so, but thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Any other questions? Thank you, Phil. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Ken. Next up is David Gashida, followed by Merritt McRae. Vice Chairman, Council Members, Staff, thank you for having me. My name is David Kashida. I'm with Coastside Fishing Club, and I'm a newly appointed member of the GAP, representing the sport fisheries at large. I'm only speaking for people from Monterey up to Bodega Bay, basically, because that's uh, where my constituency is. And I'd like to speak in favor of support for uh, CDFW's FPA for the 23-24 season. And when the first options were presented to us, we were taken aback by the drastic changes of the season structure and the loss of fishing opportunities. But after spending time as a member of the GAP with uh, the meetings with CDFW regarding how the, the season structures, mm -hmm. I was very surprised you know, the, uh, the change has been very equitable. We achieved goals of protecting the fish stocks and also giving us time to fish on, you know, be on the water. And uh, the members of the sport fishing community that I was able to get input from asked for specific times and options. And I presented those to CDFW. And I was pleasantly surprised the end product is, you know, they gave us pretty much what we asked for. It's, it's not completely what we asked for, but it's advantageous for everybody. And, uh, Basically, I'd just like to thank CDFW for working with us and giving us access. So, thank you. Thank you, David. Questions for David? RC. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, not a question, but I also just want to welcome Dave um, to the GAP and Council family. And we've sure appreciated uh, your input in our sidebar discussions. And you've um, quickly become a very... Um, a uh, critical member of our uh, GAP team. So it's it's nice to have strong representation from the CPFE, the private boat uh, fleet, and the commercial sector from California. So welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Thank you, David. And uh, finally, uh, uh, Merritt McRae. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Pettinger, Council Members, I'm Merritt McRae. And I, I just wanted to note that the fleet would appreciate access to fish deeper waters under the CDFW FPA within CDFW Report 1. It will help distribute effort off nearshore rockfish stocks, and, and in particular, it will open waters on offshore banks not previously available. In Southern California, near port areas, this includes the fingertip in the Santa Barbara Channel, the 14-mile bank off Orange County, and most importantly, the nine-mile bank off San Diego County. This area is one which has remained outside the current 100-fathom line, which is the current demarcation for access, and yet offers much opportunity in depths of 50 to 70 fathoms. For more remote offshore areas, deep water access is significant, including the west bank of Santa Rosa Flats and Captain Louis Zim's 60-mile bank. However, these are among the more rough water areas of the bite, but when seas are calm, offshore reefs are the most productive in the region. In addition, deep water access will distribute overall effort much more broadly across both area and rockfish complexes during the all depth season, thus reducing our dependence on places where copper and quillback rockfish are likely to be caught. I thank CDFW staff and the GMT for their tremendous efforts in exploring options that might provide charter operators the best chances of surviving this challenge and thereby the public's undiminished access to our fisheries resources in the future. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Merritt. Questions for Merritt? Okay. Thank you, Merritt. Okay, that concludes public comment. Um, we're going to finish this up um, 
on Monday, uh, but as we did the earlier day with gear switching, uh, get some time to have some council discussion. Oh, Marcy. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, just if I may, I just offer a few remarks um, before we leave here today uh, in response. Okay. I thought when, um, I thought we might I'd ask the council if they'd like to have a break um, before we get a discussion, or you just want to just finish it up right now. I don't know how long it's going to take. I thought I'd just ask. So I'm not seeing. Okay. So we're in a council discussion. Please. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I, I just want to um, not only acknowledge um, the remarks from the speakers here today under this agenda item um, that have brought us so much uh, input um, on the development of the FPA alternatives for recreational fisheries off California, um, but I want to follow up for a second uh, on some of the remarks made by uh, Phil Anderson and our commitment uh, moving forward uh, after we leave actions here uh, this week. Um, as, as we know, we have to make FPA recommendations here in June for measures that take effect in January. Um, however, we've made so many uh, dramatic changes uh, beginning in January of 2022. And as many of you have noted in your testimony, we are just beginning to see uh, the results of the bag limit reductions, as well as the results of your voluntary efforts to uh, avoid the species of concern. Um, so what we can commit to today, and, and Donna brought this up, and I'm really glad she did in her testimony, um, in season is um, a wonderful tool that the council has to uh, react and respond to the best and newest information that we have in hand on catches uh, and how those catches um, uh, match up with the projections that we made. And as you've heard in the CDFW report here today, um, we have pretty substantial uncertainty in our projections because we are making so many big changes. So um, as you will hear in our in-season report later uh, this week uh, on the progress that we've made and the changes that we've instituted in our in-season tracking, um, what we can uh, certainly do is, you know, we will be consulting um, with agencies as we proceed through the season on the progress of our fisheries. Um, I know many of you are looking for um, relief, and I can I can just um, promise you that the council does respond in as timely a manner as it can to new information, and um, you know we will be doing that uh, at least five meetings a year. So, um, in any case, uh, June is just you know one step down the road but we will have other um you know this this is not the end of the discussion so um again i just want to thank you uh, for working with us and we will continue to to do that uh on the sidelines so thank you again thank you marcy anyone else bob dooley thank you mr vice chair um, I just had a observation comment that this week in general, but particularly this agenda item, we've seen uh, a collaborative spirit come through and industry working hand in hand with the states and the agency and everyone involved to, to get a better result. Um, you guys all know I'm neck deep in MREP and many of the people you saw today has gone through that program. And we're seeing more and more people hit, uh, hit the road running here and being very contributory to the to the process. Um, I really it burst with pride <laughs> because of that. It's uh, it's a good thing, and the the biggest thing I think that we're getting out of it is trust. We're learning to understand each other. We're learning to to work together that we're partners in, in, in getting good results. But I'm also, I was excited to hear about the, the some of the data collection 
that collaborative work that might be happening to help inform some of the stocks that we don't know so much about. So um, I just wanted to make that comment. So thank you. Thank you, Bob. Okay, further discussion? Bill Anderson. Um, I had a question for Marcy. Um, the, um, and I don't, well, I know you'll know the answer. Um, the, um, what I think is some pretty extraordinary efforts being made by the industry in your state to respond to the copper rockfish crisis, I'll call it. Um, and the, and the use and the voluntary use, or at least I think, I don't think, I'm not sure what your, your regulations are, but in terms of using descending devices, um, and you know, the sophistication of those de descending devices has really matured over the years and being able to set depth release points. Um, and I understood that there, there was a reference, I think, I think it was when Jamie testified about work being done to look at what the uh, release mortality rates are, um, given that I don't think we have those yet for copper rockfish. And so my question is, do you, can you, uh, do you know what the, uh, what it, what the, what work is going on to look at that question for that species? Is that, I'm, Hope I'm not asking an unfair question. Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Phil, for the question. I can tell you that our GMT uh, and others in a subgroup have been working to revise our depth dependent mortality rates. Um, I thought we might hear an update on that this meeting. Let me. September? Okay. Um, with the idea being that that is a, that calculation, that work that's being done is something that's kind of baked into the catch estimation process done by each of the states. But what the plan is, is once those rates are brought back, I think, do they go through SSC review? So it is, it is work that's ongoing. Um, we had hoped to have it done by June. Um, I'm hearing September, but I will tell you that the plan is to apply the new rates that are in progress to all monthly estimates for 2022. So um, I think we recognize that the state of the science is much better than when uh, the GMT, and I guess it was probably RecTech that had a look at this. Um, it's been some time that's passed, and there is new science. I can't tell you exactly what the science is on copper rockfish, but that is certainly a commitment that our staff have made in collaboration also with um, our state partners from other agencies and National Marine Fishery Service to bring all that new work together. So it's a critical part of the plan. Great. Thank, thanks very much for that response. Thank you, Good Marcy. Thank yep. you, Phil. Further discussion? Okay. Well, with that, I'll look to uh, Todd to uh, see how we're doing here. Okay. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So the council has heard, um, heard from all the groups giving reports. You have heard public testimony and had a a little bit of discussion here. I think that sets us up quite well for Monday and completing this particular agenda item. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. And with that, I'm going to pass the gavel to uh, Chair Grolick and begin to finish the day out. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Bettinger. Uh, thanks to everyone getting through a very important agenda item. And thanks to the public for coming uh, and and offering their testimony. <clears throat> that completes uh, our agenda for today. I will turn to our executive director, Merrick Burden, to see if he has any comments or pearls of wisdom for us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, nice work today, working through some uh, very large agenda items. Um, I don't have any other uh, comments for you. All right, well, unless 
anyone has anything they want to say at this point, uh, we will uh, break for the day and we'll come back tomorrow at eight o'clock and we're going to, we will shift gears to highly migratory species. So thanks everyone and have a good evening. <laughs>